open this hearing of the Senate Environment and Communications References Committee inquiry into media diversity in Australia. I begin by acknowledging the traditional owners in the land in which we meet and pay our respects to their elders past and present. On behalf of the committee, I welcome everybody here today. Today, the committee will be conducting its hearing in person and via video conference. For the benefit of all participants, I'm the chair, Senator Sarah Hanson-Young, and I'm joining the room by Senator Carr. We're also joined by Senator McMahon via video conference. And I note that there'll be other senators uh, popping in throughout the day. Uh, I think we've got Senator Antic on the line and perhaps uh, Senator Rennick as well. Welcome to you all and thank you in advance for your patience with any technical issues that we might encounter. This is a public hearing and a tran Hansard transcript of the proceedings is being made. The hearing is also being broadcast via the Australian Parliament House website. Before the committee starts taking evidence, I remind all witnesses that in giving evidence to the committee, they are protected by parliamentary privilege. It is unlawful for anyone to threaten or disadvantage a witness on account of giving evidence to a committee. And as such, uh, any such action may be treated by the Senate as contempt. It is also contempt to give false or misleading evidence to a committee. The committee generally prefers evidence to be given in public, but under the Senate's resolutions, witnesses have the right to, be, right to request to be heard in private session. If a witness objects to answering a question, the witness should state the ground upon which the objection is taken, and the committee will determine whether it will insist on an answer, having regard to the ground upon which it is claimed. If the committee de determines to insist on an answer, a witness may request the answer be given in, cam in camera. Such a request may, of course, be made at any other time. I remind um, those of us in the room, there's not many because of COVID, uh, to ensure that our mobile phones are uh, switched to silent. Uh, those participating via video conference or teleconference, just remind you to please state your full names before you start speaking and to have your devices uh, muted. Um, this is to the senators if you don't have the call. I now uh, welcome representatives from Google and YouTube appearing via video conference. Information on parliamentary privilege and protection of witnesses and evidence has been provided to you. For the Hansard record, could you please state your full names and the capacities in which you appear today? Thank you, Chair. My name is Lucinda Longcroft. I'm the Director of Government Affairs and Public Policy for Google in Australia and New Zealand. Thank you. Ms York? Thank you, Chair. My name is Samantha York. Um, I work at Google Australia, also in the Government Affairs and Public Policy team. Wonderful. Now, uh, I'd like to invite you to give a short opening statement and then we'll get on to some questions. Thank you, Chair. Good morning. Google is proud to be one of the first signatories to the Australian Code of Practice on Misinformation and Disinformation, and we continue to take additional steps to reduce the spread and the visibility of harmful misinformation. We're also committed to supporting and elevating high quality, diverse sources of information, including from local content creators and others. Today, I'd like to share more about how we protect our users and how we can work together to address harmful misinformation, particularly on health and safety issues like COVID-19. At YouTube, we're dedicated to providing access to high quality information and freedom of expression for all, but we are not an anything goes platform. Our community guidelines set out clear rules of the road, which our team regularly reviews and updates to ensure that they're current, keep our community safe, and preserve openness. The guidelines provide public guidance on content that is not allowed on our platform. Spam, scams, hate, harassment, misinformation, disinformation and more. And we apply these guidelines to all content equally on YouTube, regardless of who the creator is, whether an individual, an organisation, a news publisher or anyone else. Ultimately, we have to make difficult decisions about what is permissible and we take that responsibility seriously. With that in mind, we build our guidelines with input from a broad community of stakeholders, not just YouTube users, content creators and advertisers, but also civil society and public institutions. We consider regional differences to ensure proposed changes can be applied fairly and consistently around the world. Our COVID-19 medical misinformation policy in particular is one recent example of how we build transparent, fair and effective rules and processes for addressing harmful misinformation. 
Over the course of the last 18 months, we have worked with and relied on information from health authorities from around the world to combat false and harmful claims about the pandemic, certain treatments and public health measures, as well as misinformation about COVID-19 vaccines. We began to remove content from COVID-19 misinformation in March 2020 under our pre-existing policies against harmful and dangerous content. As the pandemic progressed, we developed a separate COVID-19 misinformation policy, which we expanded in October to include vaccine misinformation. We have vigorously enforced our COVID-19 misinformation policy to protect our users, removing more than 1 million videos worldwide and 90% of videos that YouTube removed for dangerous or misleading COVID-19 misinformation were removed with 100 views or less. Between February 2020 and March 2021, we removed over 5,000 videos that were uploaded from an IP address in Australia and were related to dangerous or misleading coronavirus information. Fighting misinformation is more than just taking down harmful content. We aim to surface videos from authoritative sources when people do searches related to COVID on YouTube. We also recognise that there are occasions when it is helpful to provide viewers with additional context about the content they're watching. For example, when a user in Australia watches a video about COVID-19, we display information panels that point to the Australian Government Department of Health, one for general COVID queries and content, and the other for vaccine-specific information. To date, our COVID-19 information panels have received more than 500 billion views globally. That's a brief summary of our efforts on COVID, but of course, the challenge of improving access to information is much more complex. I look forward to talking with you today, not only about our efforts, but also how we can work together. Combating misinformation is a whole of society challenge. We will only succeed if we all work together. As you consider these issues today, it's imperative to look holistically and include all key stakeholders, broadcasters and media companies, news organisations, internet service providers and others. Each has a responsibility to collaborate and support Australia and media diversity, as well as the quality and reliability of information provided to Australian citizens. We look forward to continuing the discussion with you here today, and we'd be happy to take any questions. Thank you. Um, obviously, uh, we've invited you here today because uh, of the actions that Google uh, has taken to um, uh, take down a number of videos that were published on the Sky News channel on YouTube. And there's been quite a lot of public um, debate about this and, and discussion about it. Uh, I just want, for the record, um, uh, that is correct, that you have removed videos uh, from the Sky News channel that uh, breached your COVID uh, uh, health policy. Yes, Chair, that is correct. Okay. Um, and you followed the uh, process that is outlined publicly in terms of your guidelines. You gave them a written warning uh, and then a strike. That's correct. Yes, Senator, that's correct. Our COVID-19 misinformation policies are applied equally to all YouTube content uh, and channel owners. Mm -hmm. And did Sky News appeal any of these decisions? No, Senator, they did not. They have complained about the process? Uh, they have communicated to us privately uh, with concerns about the process, but they have not uh, refuted the, COVID, the violation of our COVID-19 misinformation policies. Mm -hmm. So they haven't actually appealed the deletion of the videos. They've just um, raised concerns with the process that you have or the, or the overall policy. Um, that's correct. Could I ask, uh, since uh, the strike um, and the um, seven day ban, which is now finished, the videos that you removed, they've been permanently deleted from the YouTube channel. They can't be uploaded at any point. That's correct. They have been permanently deleted. Mm -hmm. And that's, uh, and there's a number of them, isn't there? That's correct, Senator. Are you able to tell us how many of those? There is a total of 23 videos that have been removed. Mm -hmm. um, th 
Thank you. And uh, they were all removed in relation to uh, breaching the guidelines in relation to COVID misinformation? Uh, the majority of those videos were removed as violations of our COVID-19 misinformation policy. Uh, two videos were removed as violations of our election integrity policy. Okay. Thank you. Um, has anybody from the government uh, communicated with you in relation uh, to uh, this action that you've taken? Chair, not prior to the action being taken. The action was taken in accordance with our normal policies and procedures. Subsequent to the uh, strike being made public, uh, we did receive a communication from the ACMA uh, asking for details about the nature of the actions we had taken, and we responded to those questions. So the ACMA, the government regulator, got in touch uh, once it was known that you'd taken this action? That's correct. Mm -hmm. Has anyone from the ministers, the communication minister's office or the prime minister's office or the health minister's office communicated with you in relation to this decision? Not specifically in relation to this decision. We are in very regular communication with all the offices that you have just mentioned, in particular with the Department of Health through the uh, promulgation of our policies in relation to COVID-19. And we have provided uh, $4.8 million worth of free ads to the Department of Health to service authoritative government information about COVID-19. However, they have not communicated with us specifically about the, the strike that we issued against SkyViews. Mm. So sorry, you're gifting free advertising space to the Department of Health uh, to um, ensure that people get the correct information? That's correct. $4.8 million worth of free ads, which resulted in 20.6 million impressions of authoritative COVID-19 information. And was that something the uh, minister asked for or did you offer that? That is part of Google's global policies to work with governments around the world to ensure that we elevate or raise authoritative information of all sorts. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, and did, uh, throughout this pandemic, um, and you've obviously globally been concerned as a company about the use of your platforms for the promotion and, and distribution of disinformation, um, <clears throat> Have you, have you worked with or had communications with any of these ministers or other representatives from the Australian government uh, about your role, your responsibility, your assistance in helping to stop the promotion of disinformation and COVID lies? Uh, thank you, Chair. In, indeed, we do work extremely closely with the Australian Government, uh, with the Safety Commissioner, with the Privacy Commissioner, with the ACMA, with the ACCC, the Federal Police, uh, Department of Home Affairs and Department of Health, uh, with regard to uh, the, the community guidelines and ensuring the uh, reduction of misinformation and disinformation across our platforms. As mentioned in, in my opening statement, we are proudly signatories of the first disinformation and misinformation code promulgated in Australia. We worked closely in the development of that disinformation code and we published our first transparency report in May of this year. Therefore, we worked very closely with the ACMA in relation to that form of misinformation and to all other regulators with regard to issues such as privacy, child safety and other. Mm. Um, I might go to you, Senator Carr, and then we'll, I, just to be clear, I know there are other senators on the call, um, and we will we will get around to you all. Um, but um, first, to Senator Carr. I'm referring to an article. Um, it was published on Friday, the sixth of August, in the Melbourne Age, that indicated that prior to your informing Sky News of the first strike back in. Uh, December 2020, there were 14 videos that had been uh, removed uh, by uh, Google. Is that correct? 
uh, Senator Carr, the information that I have to hand is that the 23 videos that were removed, uh, the first, the subject of a warning on the 20th of December. Yes. Uh, I'm not familiar with uh, the videos in the news article to which you refer, but I'd be pleased to take that question on. If you would, please. Thank you. And the, um, it's reported here that there are 2 billion monthly registered users of YouTube. Uh, is that, uh, are you familiar with that figure? I am, yes. Senator, it's correct. And that's, uh, that's uh, so from what countries does the 2 billion uh, re-users uh, come from? We operate in most countries around the world, Senator. Right, I see. So it's an international figure, um, yes. most countries. Would you, you, no point giving us a list of where that comes from? Uh, I could follow up with the uh, with unnoticed. Un I'm, I'm particularly right. yes. Okay. See, the question about inf misinformation goes beyond the pandemic because the guidelines that you've introduced in the pandemic, uh, of course, are only 18 months old. That's correct, isn't it? It is correct. Yes. So, the um, the Royal Commission, the New Zealand Royal Commission, into in 2020, and found that the Australian terrorist Brendan Tarrant had that you know had killed 51 people in the two church uh, Christchurch mosques in 2019 was radicalized by YouTube the videos of the massacres were also uploaded to YouTube in the hours after it happened uh, and I'm wondering the the question of the misuse of your platforms is not just being confined to conspiracy theorists in regard to the pandemic, is it? Not at all, Senator. Our community guidelines uh, span a, a wide range of uh, damaging or harmful content, uh, from ranging from spam to deceptive practices to extremist content, terrorism uh, and child endangerment material. In fact, is it the case that there have been complaints to Google regarding Sky News as being a breeding ground for far-right extremism in Australia. We receive uh, flags of violative content or, or notifications of material of concern from all sources, Senator, yes. as but well as our automated systems that detect this material. So, so, well, I, I want to come back to that issue. So in regard to the 23 videos that you referred to, those videos that had, were in breach of your guidelines, they were identified through your artificial intelligence monitoring, your algorithms. Is that correct? Or were they by way of specific letter of, or some form of personal complaint? Uh, we treat all videos equally, regardless of how they are notified to us. In this particular case, the material was detected by our automated systems. Yes, so, but it, it wasn't by someone contacting you and complaining about them. Uh, it was by automatic intelligence or automated intelligence. The particular videos that we referred to were detected by automated systems, but we treat all videos equally in terms of review and removal, regardless mm. of where I the see. flag originates. Can I confirm that Google and other online platforms are not subject to regulation by the ACMA? Uh, we are indeed uh, signatories to the Misinformation and Disinformation mm. Code. That was. Uh, but that's a voluntary code, isn't yes. it? That's a voluntary code. There's no formal regulatory uh, responsibility uh, in terms of the, this parliament. You are correct, but I would uh, pass the floor to my colleague, Ms York, uh, who is uh, very closely connected and has taken the lead on engagement with the ACMA. Could, yes, if you would, please. Thanks, um, Lucinda. Um, Senator Carr, um, we worked very closely with the ACMA on the development of the first Australian Code of Practice on Misinformation and Disinformation. While it is a voluntary code, it does set out a number of commitments that all of the signatories have signed on to, and the overseeing regulator for that code is the ACMA. I see. But there is no legislative response. It's all on the basis 
of a voluntary arrangement between your company and other companies like you, private companies, to actually self-regulate. Is that the case? In the context of the Australian Code of Practice on misinformation and disinformation, yes. However, there are other legislative frameworks in place here in Australia that do regulate against misleading and deceptive conduct. For instance, the Australian Consumer Laws and Google complies with those laws. Yes, I'm thinking specifically here in terms of media regulation as distinct from consumer regulations. Is there any media regulation that you are responsible for and particularly in regard to misleading and deceptive conduct, for instance, on spreading far-right terrorist extremism? Well, in the context of far-right extremism and um, other abhorrent violent material, there is a criminal code that, that legislates the, the hosting or distribution of abhorrent violent material in Australia that, of course, Google is regulated by. Um, but more broadly, in terms of media regulation, Senator, um, there, there aren't any media-specific yes. regulations that apply to Google. However, there are a range of other content regulations that do apply to Google. For instance, defamation laws, copyright laws, um, and online safety laws, privacy laws, and so on. Okay. Um, I'm pleased to hear that. Uh, the uh, Sky and its presenters claim that Google has in fact suppressed their right to freely express their opinions. I'm wondering how you respond to that claim and how do you distinguish between advocacy and reportage, uh, for instance, on the question of health regulations, um, you know, health regulations during the lockdowns, uh, how, how do you respond to the suggestions that you're acting effectively as agents for an authoritarian state? Senator Carr, I would uh, respectfully reject that characterisation. We take our responsibility to our users extremely seriously in terms of safeguarding their rights as well as safeguarding them from harm. What we do is, is balance uh, the importance of free information on the internet with that responsibility to keep our users safe. Our community guidelines, as you had reflected earlier, span a variety of, con of conduct that would cause harm to our users. And those uh, policies have been developed through close consultation with authorities globally. They are revised constantly and they are enforced by uh, highly trained trust and safety teams to ensure that they are applied robustly and agnostically regardless of whoever mm -hmm. has, uh, has uploaded the content. Thank you. And look, just finally, given that you've outlined that you're, of course, subject to the normal criminal regimes uh, that all citizens are, but you're not regulated by the media laws, the regulatory framework does not extend to online users such as yourself. Is it Google's view that there is a need for the existing regulatory framework to be reformed so that the parliament actually takes some responsibility for regulation of online platforms? Thank you, Senator Carr. The uh, laws that my colleague Ms York has outlined relating to a broad range of conduct such as copyright infringement, privacy law, defamation, online safety uh, and abhorrent and, and violent material apply equally to Google as to all other operators in Australia and we respect them and uphold them vigorously. Uh, we do work constantly and constructively with the government around areas of regulation. We welcome regulation. It is fair and transparent and, and based on evidence. And we work with the regulators that my colleague has mentioned, as have I earlier, to uh, ensure that those fair safeguards are placed around all activity in Australia to ensure that our Australian users, as our users all around the world, are kept safe and have accessible uh, rights to uh, information that is universally accessible and useful to all. So that means, yes, you would welcome further legislative reform. As mentioned, we welcome regulation that is, is balanced and fair and reasonable. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, we might go to Senator McMahon. Are you there, Senator McMahon? 
Yes, I, I am. Thank you, Chair. Um, look, thank you. And I, I do appreciate the fact that, um, that Google and YouTube are not open slather platforms and that there is um, control of of content. And I um, acknowledge your right to do that. And I, and I think generally overall it's a positive thing. Um, but I do have concerns that <clears throat> you're, you're acting not just as the platform, but as the regulator and you're setting your rules and your own parameters around how that regulation should operate. Um, you know, is do you see the, the, the concern um, around that? Is it that, that you can you can make up whatever rules you like? And I, I know you've gone through all the way that you do that to to set your your rules and your regulations, but you know, you, you can effectively um, decide on whatever you like. You can decide that you don't like the colour of my shirt, therefore you're going to ban me because I don't conform to, you know, your rules about, around wearing orange shirts. Is that is that too much um, control and regulation for one platform to have? Thank you, Senator McMahon. It is an important question and it is one and, and the responsibility to which it applies or refers is one that we take extremely seriously. We seek to balance openness of information on the internet with our responsibility to our users. As mentioned uppermost, we uphold Australian law. Beyond that, when users engage on our platform, they have the benefit of the integrity and trustworthiness of the systems that we operate. In order to ensure that integrity, we put forward community guidelines that are designed and developed in close consultation with our, our trusted stakeholders around the world to ensure that the safety of our users is uppermost. Uh, and they are consistently and transparently applied. They are transparently available on our internet. Those who engage in our platforms are aware of the community guidelines and of our systems for enforcing them. And they are applied agnostically and robustly to all equally, regardless of who the uploader is. In that way, we ensure or seek to walk the balance of making the greatest amount of information available while ensuring the safety of our users. Um, Ms. Lamproft, I, I understand that, um, and I understand you're saying about the transparency and consistently applied to all. But you know, if if one of your guidelines or your rules is is wrong, applying it consistently doesn't make that right. For example, if you say we're not going to allow people with red hair, and we're going to apply that consistently across the board, that doesn't necessarily you know make that correct, does it? It does not, Senator, and that is why our community guidelines try to take issue with issues such as the colour of people's hair or their shirts. In fact, they are very narrowly uh, referenced and directed at harms, issues such as spam or deceptive practices, child endangerment, violent extremism, hatred, uh, impersonation, hate speech and deception. These are uh, issues and behaviours that are broadly recognised across the community as harm. And therefore, they are the subject of our community guidelines, and we have that we are enforcing those with our users' best interests at heart. Said so when we are enforcing those policies, we do have the ability to take context into account. The context of the video title, audio, its description, for example, that may relate to artistic or scientific, educational, or documentary concerns that enable us if that context gives broader understanding to users to enable that material to remain up on the internet so that the greatest amount of information and diversity of views is available to our users as possible. Um, I thank you. Can we go specifically to some of your COVID sorry, guidelines? Sorry, Senator. Um, <clears throat> sorry, yeah, as I raised earlier. Sorry, Senator uh, McMahon. Just hang on a second. Um, Ms York had something to add to that. Ms York. Thank you, Chair. Senator, apologies, I didn't mean to interrupt. I just wanted to add a small point to Lucinda's comments just now. I, I think your question really speaks to accountability and the accountability of companies like ours. And as Lucinda very rightly mentioned, first and foremost, we comply with the law including anti-discrimination laws. And from there, we are accountable to a number of different 
entities when we develop our, our, our community guidelines. So we're accountable to governments, of course. We're accountable to our users who give us lots of feedback about how our policies are working and how they're impacting the content that they are seeking to distribute on the issues platform. We're also accountable to our advertisers. YouTube is an ad funded platform. It's made available to, for free to people around the world. And advertisers are also very quick to let us know if they think our policies are out of step or in some way unreasonable or um, unrealistic based on community standards and expectations. So there are a range of entities that we do feel very directly accountable to when we develop these policies. Uh, sorry, and sorry, I just did drop out momentarily there. I apologise. Um, uh, if we go to specifically to some of the COVID um, guidelines, as I mentioned earlier, someone can, can receive a strike or be suspended. Um, <clears throat> I'll have their videos taken down. <clears throat> if they uh, if they say that um, COVID is not a pandemic because that goes against your COVID guidelines, um, yet there is uh, a lot of con scientific conjecture and in fact um, scientific uh, papers published in the Lancet that do argue that COVID is not a, um, a pandemic, it is in fact a syndemic uh, and scientists arguing that it is no longer a pandemic, it should be considered endemic. So, I mean, is it fair for you to strike people out because of a policy that you decide is correct and right, but it may well be at odds um, with a lot of the uh, scientific literature and opinions around the world? Thank you, Senator McMahon. Uh, the COVID-19 misinformation policy uh, was first developed at the start of the pandemic, but is constantly evolving. Uh, throughout the pandemic, taking into account authoritative health guidelines from the World Health Organization and other governmental health authorities, as well as the scientific evidence that those government authorities take into account. As mentioned, uh, those who choose to upload content onto the YouTube platform uh, must comply with a very clear, explicit policy on COVID-19 misinformation, which includes uh, uh, striking out content that denies the existence of the pandemic. However, as mentioned earlier, we do take account of context. And if there is scientific or artistic or other forms of documentary content, for example, that surrounds a statement around the nature of the pandemic, that would qualify that material and ensure users to, to the ability to understand and contextualize that information, then we allow the material to remain up online. Uh, thank you. Another example um, that I gave earlier and I'll just bring up in the public arena is the fact that your policy um, states that uh, you breach the guidelines if you deny that, um, that masks play a, a role in um, preventing you from contracting COVID-19. Um, yet that is completely at odds with the WHO and the Australian Health Department advice and also with um, studies published in the scientific literature that say that yes, um, masks definitely help um, stop the, uh, the transmission and the spread, but there's no evidence to say that they uh, stop you from contracting COVID. Yet that is part of your policy. You have decided that um, you know better than the, the, the WHO and the Australian health um, authorities. Senator McMahon, with respect, our COVID-19 misinformation policy closely aligns to the World Health Organization's advice and is revised in accordance with that. Where there is some context that is given in, in a video or its surrounding information that contextualises that information uh, around the, the facts, for example, that you have outlined, then the material is allowed to remain online. But where it falls foul or violates our policy, we remove it in the interests of public self, health and our users' safety. And, and can I finally um, ask you about um, a comment on, on YouTube um, that was uh, made by President Joe Biden, who stated, you're not going to get COVID if you have these vaccinations. Now, was the president given a warning or, um, or was that um, video taken down because he violated um, uh, your your COVID-19 uh, regulations? 
Yes, Senator, thank you for the question. Uh, as mentioned earlier, our policies are applied regardless of the nature of the person who has uploaded the content. That applies equally to presidents as well as to you and, and to me. Uh, I wouldn't speak to that, that example in case I have not seen it. If there was contextual information in the title or the commentary, the audio or other of that video that enabled it to be placed into that broader context, uh, it would then be allowed to remain online. Um, sorry, can I just interrupt for a second? Just to be clear, we do have uh, media coming in and out of the room to take uh, photos and footage of today's hearings, which um, uh, we don't have a problem with. But just to be clear, we're, we're not going to let everybody in at the same time, try and be as COVID safe as possible. So um, please, and then we'll just rotate you as need be. All right, thank you. Um, Senator McMahon, uh, we're going to have to I, move. Get, Senator McMahon, we are going to have to move to other senators. So, um, final yes, question. Yes, just get clarity on, on that answer, please, Chair. Um, so, just to be clear, you're, you're not aware of whether um, that particular video, if it is on YouTube, has or, or has not attracted um, a warning or a sanction. Senator, I'm not aware of that with regard to that particular video, but if you have concerns about it, we would welcome your flagging it and we would then take uh, take it into consideration and review. Thank you. Uh, Senator um, Rennick. I'm not sure that he's... Oh, he's not here? I okay. got IT going. Hi. Sorry. Go ahead, Senator Rennick. Uh, uh, my question is, um, does Google's parent company, Alphabet, own 12% of Vaki Tech, uh, which has an interest in the Oxford AstraZeneca vaccine? Senator Rennick, I, I could not uh, answer that particular, uh, that particular detail, but I'd be happy to follow up on notice. Yeah, great, thank you. And just one more. In terms of when you review posts, do you have qualified medical experts who review those posts? And are those experts' details disclosed somewhere? Uh, thank you, Senator. Uh, the trust and safety teams that number about 12,000 globally are made up of trained experts, but they're trained in the application of our community guidelines. The community guideline policies themselves were developed uh, through close consultation uh, with regard in, in connection with experts uh, in that particular area. In regard to the COVID-19 misinformation policies, for example, they are developed uh, in close connection with the World Health Organization and with health authorities in governments around the world. So do you consult with the uh, Australian Health Department in, in reviewing posts here in Australia? Uh, we consult closely with the Department of Health in relation to our support for raising authoritative COVID-19 misinformation. We accept flags and, and uh, expressions of concern about material that may violate those policies all users, uh, including government departments. Uh, and in fact, we make public uh, the details of in, in our transparency guidelines. Okay, Chair. Thank you very much. Thanks, Chair. Uh, thank you, Senator Rennick. Um, Senator Antic. Um, thank you, Chair. Can you hear me? Yes, we can. Thank you. Look, I, I may cover off, and thank you both for your time this morning. I may cover off on some ground that's already been covered, but just for the sake of clarification, I've got a few uh, points to extrapolate out. I want to go back to the beginning of the Sky News video. Can you just explain to me, was it the case initially that, that Google YouTube uh, removed those videos largely on the basis that it was suggested that Sky News um, were indicating that, that, that COVID-19 uh, was not a pandemic, did not exist? Uh, thank you, Senator Antic. Uh, the material that the violative videos removed from the Sky News YouTube channel violated our COVID-19 misinformation policy by denying the existence of the pandemic. Sorry, I was having a bit of trouble hearing there. Um, is it the case then that uh, the complaint switched to, uh, um, what did this term use, medical misinformation and therefore violated the policies from there and the, the complaint changed at some point? Senator, I, I think I, I understand your question uh, as, as being whether there was some evolution in the nature of the violation. Uh, there was not. Uh, in, in 
the majority of the case, certainly the videos that were removed uh, as, and, and caused the strike against YouTube, uh, Sky YouTube channel, uh, which resulted in a seven day suspension of their privileges to upload material, uh, were all uh, violative of our COVID-19 misinformation policy. Okay, thank you. And just to touch on that policy, it's quite involved and, and as you say, it's evolving as well. But it seems to be predicated on the information provided by the World Health Organization. Now, does Google YouTube have any concerns about the information that's being provided by the World Health Organization, noting initially that um, they have made a number of uh, fairly, um, I guess, notable um, uh, mis errors of judgment themselves. Uh, Senator McMahon touched on some of them earlier with the uh, the use of masks and, the, and their effectiveness, but also they've been demonstrably wrong on many instances uh, about the transmission through the air and other such such issues. Is there concern from YouTube and Google that that medical information is being predicated on the basis of the WHO who may have ulterior purposes and motives. Thank you, Senator. Uh, the COVID-19 misinformation policy is developed by reference to a large range of stakeholders of authoritative uh, sources of information, including the World Health Organization, but also numerous government authorities and, and national health authorities around the world. The COVID-19 pandemic, is, as we all appreciate, is rapidly evolving. And scientific and medical understandings about the pandemic, about its transmission and about its cures are also evolving. And for that reason, our trust and safety teams are continually evolving policies to ensure that they reflect the most up-to-date and scientifically verifiable information. Uh, the World Health Organization continues to be a source of significant authoritative information at the global level, and we work with them as their policies evolve to ensure that users are protected by the latest scientific and medical information. And we heard um, earlier today that um, uh, there were some suggestions that there have been efforts to remove far right material and apparent material, which is absolutely reasonable. Can you direct me to some instances where Google YouTube have removed uh, video content that come from the far left? Say, for example, um, videos of Extinction Rebellion protesters uh, creating a nuisance uh, by gluing themselves to public property. Um, there would be presumably they would be the kind of instances which presumably would uh, fall afoul of your guidelines as well. Are you able to direct me to some instances where those videos from from perhaps the far left have been have been removed? Senator, our, our policies, as you as you imply, are, are applied equally across the political spectrum. Uh, we reject all forms of political bias in our systems and in the application of those policies. Uh, in fact, a, a Pew uh, research report and a New York University recent finding found that there is no evidence of political bias in our applications of our policies. Uh, therefore, they are applied against uh, incitement to violence or uh, hateful conduct. Uh, across the political spectrum. I, I wouldn't point to particular examples uh, in, in this case, and uh, and yet our transparency report and the uh, enforcement reports of our community guidelines do give a full range of information about the nature of videos that are removed. Great. Well, can I ask you to take that question on notice, because I, I put it to you that there won't be very many instances where that's happened. Can I ask you this question as well? Um, are there any instances you're aware of where the now credited uh, Wuhan lab leak thesis uh, have been, uh, which were videos which ridiculed that process originally? Are you aware of any videos which have now been deleted as a result of that being misinformation or disinformation, as you as you call it? Senator, thank you. I'm not aware of any videos uh, being deleted in relation to the Wuhan uh, lab uh, virus origins, but I'd also be prepared to take that question on notice and ensure that we can provide that. I also note that uh, YouTube is still currently featuring videos from the ABC's now discredited expose on the Lunar Park ghost train, which has been widely discredited now by an independent review. Um, why is it that those videos still remain um, currently up on your platform uh, when it is that you say disinformation and misinformation is a number one priority of your organisation? It is indeed a number one priority and we at the same time balance the uh, need to ensure for a democratic society that uh, information from diverse sources uh, and representing diverse views is allowed to remain online. Our policies are narrowly targeted to address user harms. 
and uh, with regard to specific uh, cases, and I wouldn't uh, I wouldn't uh, refer to the, the case in particular, the ABC ghost uh, train uh, issue in particular, but where in cases like that there is context that is around the material that is of a scientific or an educational or in this case a documentary nature, we ensure that that material can remain up, to ensure that users can have that information to hand and make their assessments themselves. So, so just to clarify that, on that basis, last, last um, question, Senator it, thank, thank you. Yeah, thank you yeah. On that basis, a video like the video we just discussed, the ABC's ghost train, which contains significant deficiencies, as long as it has um, perhaps one factual matter buried in amongst it, uh, your, your organisation is happy to leave those videos up, notwithstanding the fact that they're discredited. No, Senator. Uh, information is uh, videos are removed that breach our guidelines and uh, as they are assessed by our trust and safety teams. But those same teams that are highly trained to make these assessments take into account the context of the video as a whole. And that would be in the title, it could be in the audio, it could be in the description. And where that context of a scientific, educational, artistic or other nature uh, ensures that users can contextualise and and assess the material for themselves, that it would not cause the harm that our community guidelines seek to uh, address, then the material is allowed to remain online. So, so you reject the concept then that YouTube is simply muzzling political views that it disagrees with? I do reject that concept. Thank you, Senator. Uh, Thank you. I've just got a couple of follow-up questions. Um, in relation to the guidelines that you refer to and that you use that have been, uh, as you outline, uh, discussed with various and consulted with various different um, authorities, including the Australian Government Media Agency, the uh, Department of Health, um, you've talked, you, you've referenced other um, ministers within government. Um, Part of the guideline is, is not just about denying the, uh, uh, that COVID-19 is a pandemic. Um, my understanding from uh, what you've given us is that it's also in relation to the promotion of uh, uh, particular drugs that um, are uh, said to um, said to uh, you know, solve COVID or you know treat COVID. Is that correct? Could you just tell us exactly the the framing that you use in relation to what would breach um, your guidelines in relation to the discussions, the misinformation, uh, and promotion of COVID lies? Yes, Chair. Thank you. The COVID nineteen misinformation policy, which is a uh, freely available and transparently available on our website, lists a, a number of areas relating to the prevention, uh, treatment, diagnosis, transmission, social distancing, self-isolation policies, as well as the existence of COVID-19. So, for example, you had mentioned quite correctly the uh, that material that relates to cures or, or a, a asserted cures, such as hydroxychloroquine, for example, or ivermectin that have found and have been proven to be uh, false and, and unable or ineffective in treating COVID-19, where there are videos that without further context assert that those drugs are effective, we remove them because of the danger and medical harm that could be caused to users. Mm -hmm. And could I just be clear in relation to the violations of the code uh, uh, and the guidelines uh, as applied to Sky News, um, there, it, it is in the context that Sky News is the publisher of this information, um, but those within each of these videos or stories, the individuals who have promoted these COVID lies or tried to um, give weight uh, to the idea that uh, ivermectin could be used as a cure falsely. Uh, some of these people have been the hosts of Sky News and others have been uh, kind of uh, experts that have been uh, self-described uh, self experts that have been brought on air. There's a combination, is that correct? I believe that to be the case, yes, Chair. Mm -hmm. um, and when you look at the um, uh, when, when, a, when a video is flagged and is of a concern, um, 
Is there a weight put on whether uh, the person purporting uh, that a particular drug is a cure falsely or that uh, masks are not uh, important or that the pandemic uh, is in fact uh, not an issue? Uh, uh, is there a weight put on whether those views are being uh, spoken and promoted and said by the host as opposed to a guest? Uh, thank you, Chair. Uh, it's an important question in, in the sense, as mentioned, that we do take into account the context of the material that violates our policies. So, for example, content put out by a host that asserts uh, that COVID-19 is not a pandemic or asserts uh, the, the use of drugs that, uh, and, and cures that, that are, are false, uh, without any surrounding context, that material would violate our policies and be taken down. But we're in the course of a public discourse, an academic or scientific discourse, for example, where there is context uh, between uh, in, in a debate, for example, that would allow users to be able to assess that information to the, the greatest extent possible. We try to keep information of a diverse nature up on our, on our platforms to ensure users are fully informed. Um, so essentially then a, a piece of content, a video, wouldn't be in breach of your guidelines unless it missed that context, unless there was appropriate balance of the argument or it was uh, clearly out, uh, identified as unproven. I, I, I wouldn't speak to a hypothetical case, uh, Chair, but in, in general, when material is flagged to us, regardless of where that flag or, or concern is raised, and regardless of the nature of the person or the channel that has uploaded the content, our policies are applied agnostically. Once a, a violation is identified, we then do take into account any context, uh, and that is the context of that scientific, educational, uh, documentary or artistic nature. Or, for example, if it's in the form of a parody or satire, uh, these are materials that are then, or, or information that is then taken into account to, to identify whether that material can remain up without causing harm to our users. Mm -hmm. um, and just to be clear, uh, the 23 videos that have been deleted are by uh, Google on the Sky News YouTube channel. Sky News have not appealed any of those decisions. They have not. Have they confirmed in any way that they agree with your assessment or they've just been silent? Uh, when we inform Sky News, as we inform all content and channel owners uh, that a violation has been found and material has been removed, we also very clearly inform that owner of the uh, process of filing an appeal. Uh, where they do not appeal, and in this case Sky News has not appealed, uh, then the material is taken down. We would then take that as, as mm -hmm. leading to the violative nature of the videos, but I wouldn't speak to Sky News intent in mm -hmm. this case. Um, and since the, those videos were deleted and the seven day ban, has there been any uh, new content that has been flagged as a concern? Not to my knowledge, said Chair. Mm. Um, and has uh, the media regulator, the ACMA, have they uh, sought further information about uh, the concerns that you had? Uh, we, are, we are in regular contact with the ACMA around a variety of issues, including misinformation and disinformation. Uh, we did receive a communication from the ACMA after we issued the strike against Sky News and that became public uh, with a request for certain information that we provided to them. Hmm. Would we be able to get a copy of uh, that letter and the exchange uh, for this committee's deliberations, please? I would be pleased to provide it subject, of course, to the ACMA agreeing to make that information. Well, I'll be asking them anyway, so <laughs> that's fine. Um, okay, Senator Carr, have you got any final questions? No, no, I'm right, thank you. Thank All you very right. much. Um, uh, thank you. I know you've taken a number of questions on notice. Um, I appreciate that. Thank you for your time, and we will um, uh, we, we will move on. Thank you. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, Senators.
Um, thank you. Thank you. Now we're just going to take a short suspension um, before we come back to our uh, next witness, which will be uh, Mr. Paul Whitaker with representing Sky News. So we'll be back here at 10 past 10. Off again, thank you. Well, we will now uh, reconvene. Uh, I now welcome Mr. Paul Whitaker of Sky News Australia. Mr. Whitaker, I can see you there on the screen. Good morning. I understand that information on parliamentary privilege and the protection of witnesses and evidence has been provided to you. For the Hansard record, could you please state your full name and the capacity in which you appear today? Uh, thank you, Senator. Paul Whitaker. I'm the Chief Executive Officer of Sky News Australia. Wonderful. I now invite you to make a short opening statement and then we're going to go to some questions. Thank you. Thank you for the opportunity to be heard, Senator. We are here today in response to Sky News Australia's seven-day suspension on YouTube. YouTube asserted that the videos removed, some up to a year old, did not comply with its COVID-19 misinformation policy. YouTube's assertion that Sky News has denied the existence of COVID-19 is expressly rejected. That assertion is, frankly, ridiculous. From March 2020, our Sky News COVID-19 channel on Foxtel was devoted to 24-7 coronavirus coverage. It's featured live and in full press conferences and in-depth government and health announcements. It was also available for free to millions of Australians via the Sky News and News Corp website. Our audiences have benefited from the views of epidemiologists, researchers, physicians, GPs, scientists, pharmacists, leaders of medical and doctors representing organisations, as well as chief health officers, bureaucrats and politicians. There can be no doubt that our viewers would be well informed on these issues, precisely because we are committed to covering all angles of this evolving national and global public health and policy debate. Sky News Australia strongly supports vaccination. Any the country a and a blatant attempt to discredit and harm our new service. With a proven editorial understanding of the importance of vaccination, we commissioned a documentary exposing the dangers of the anti vaxxer movement, which aired multiple times and coincided with the COVID vaccine rollout program in February. All our new opinion hosts have spoken and continue to speak strongly in support of vaccination as the only way forward for the nation. We carry daily live press conferences from political and health leaders conveying critical information concerning vaccination availability, guidelines and levels, as well as case numbers and hospitalisations. It is because of our extended in-depth coverage that we can make the observation that YouTube's editorial policies concerning COVID-19 are internally inconsistent and incapable of compliance. YouTube's policies prohibit content which contradicts local health authorities or the World Health Organization medical information. But they fail to accommodate for the fact that, one, the WHO's medical information has changed in response to the data emerging throughout the course of the pandemic. Two, that the federal, state and territory government and their health authorities have implemented laws and guidance that has continuously changed. And three, that the medical information issued by the WHO and local health authorities has at times been in conflict. YouTube captions make clear that it is not a neutral platform, but a publisher selectively broadcasting content and censoring certain views while allowing videos that are patent, false, misogynistic and racist to be proliferated. Sky News videos on crucial COVID-19 issues range from important discussions about treatments to prevention measures have been removed from public view, while forgery tutorials on drug video comprising gang violence and a rich diet of crackpot conspiracy theories are freely and widely available on YouTube. Not Mr. Sorry, Mr. Mr. Whitaker, could I just? We are having some problems hearing you, and I'm not sure whether it's the audio or um, you know you are speaking very fast, and I'm sure you're probably a bit nervous. But just could you just slow it down a bit, and we'll try and get the audio fixed. Thank you. Sure. I'm, Try again. I'm not, I'm not hearing anything at my end, but okay. I'm happy to keep... Uh, that's, that's a much better pace. Thank you. Sky News' video on crucial COVID-19 issues ranging from important discussions about treatments to prevention measures have been removed from public view, while toward on drug taking, videos glamorising gang violence and a rich diet of crackpot conspiracy theories are freely and widely available on YouTube. 
Not only is YouTube's policy incapable of compliance, unlike other public policies, YouTube's process for review and removal of content lacks transparency and a clearly articulated process which affords channel operators the opportunity to address concerns or to challenge an assessment prior to a suspension occurring. Sky News requested multiple times for YouTube to confirm that historic content will not be subject to further notice from YouTube and that Sky News has afforded the opportunity to address concerns or challenge the notification in advance of any further strikes. No such reassurance was received. With no transparency provided, Sky News took the proactive approach of removing a batch of videos all published during 2020 from online platforms to ensure ongoing compliance with YouTube's arbitrary editorial guidelines. Sky News's removal of content is not an admission of failure to comply with YouTube's policies, merely an attempt to navigate its opaque policy. We acknowledge YouTube has terms of service that publishers must abide by. However, YouTube's process lacks transparency and this should be concerning for all media. It is now beyond debate that YouTube is a publisher selectively editing content for political or commercial reasons, but unlike traditional media, it does not accept any of the regulatory or legal burdens that being deemed a publisher carries with it. We welcome a vigorous debate about the new terms of service that could apply to YouTube as a public benefiting all in our society, not just the self-interested internet elite. Sky News has proudly served the nation for 25 years to deliver public journalism and a diverse range of news, opinion and investment programming. Like all live news channels, we strive to always get it right. When mistakes are made, we correct them. We operate within the same legal framework as all media are subject to, both the Commercial Television Industry Code of Practice and the Subscription Broadcast Television Code of Practice. There is no evidence that Sky News breaches existing regulations or that the current regulatory framework is failing or that further regulatory intervention is required. Indeed, it should be noted we have not been found in breach of the codes of practice for more than 10 years. This record is significant given that Sky News and Sky News Extra channels alone publish more than 17,000 hours of coverage, much of which is carried live. Strong audience growth demonstrates our news service resonates with mainstream Australia. We are genuinely pleased that Google is investing with News Corp in Australian journalism. We're truly disappointed that YouTube undermines that very journalism without cause of serious consequences for the Australian public and the principle of expression in a free press. It is evident from extensive media coverage of the pandemic that not all governments, medical health professionals, expert commentators agree on strategic policy direction or implementation. Sky News does not go away from the broad spectrum of viewpoints in relation to any number of issues which impact ordinary Australians. There is no expectation that our viewers agree with every opinion expressed by every host, guest or panelist. But it now appears commonplace to discredit any debate on contentious issues as misinformation. So the question becomes, why does tech giant YouTube and faceless nameless individuals backed by an algorithm based in California get to decide that holding governments and decision makers to account is misinformation? Why do they get to decide what is and isn't allowed to be news? When platforms such as YouTube are the town squares of the digital age, how do we ensure the protection of free speech and open debate to ensure we have more, not less, media diversity of information and views? Some would seem believe that voices you agree with should be free from criticism and that voices you disagree with should be silenced. We believe in the open debate of all issues by the wide range of people, which is not only acceptable, but is a fundamental tenet of our society that should be upheld and protected. Thank you, Senator, for your question. Thank you, Mr Whitaker. Um, could I ask you first up, um, obviously this committee had invited a number of your hosts that were uh, uh, involved in a number of the videos that had been deleted by, uh, the, by YouTube and Google and uh, subsequently um, videos taken down by yourselves. Um, why didn't they appear before the committee today? Did you stop them? No, that's their personal decision, and some of them have spoken to that publicly. But I will say that there was not a lot of confidence instilled in the process when uh, there were statements made to The Guardian and the Sydney Morning Herald that our hosts would be appearing at this hearing today, despite the fact they'd not even been given an opportunity at that stage to answer the invitations. So, um, 
Isn't it? An, it was it's their decision not to to appear. That's fine. Um, I, I just want to make it clear, though, that um, uh, witnesses ha have a right to appear without uh, intimidation, without uh, any pressure from an employer uh, about uh, evidence that they may. Uh, be able to give uh, a, a parliamentary committee. So I, I just want to put that on the record, that if this committee decides uh, at any point uh, for questions to be answered by any of your employers, you're not going to uh, uh, step in the way, are you, Mr Whitaker? Employees, are we talking about or employers? I'm saying that you have an obligation as an employer to not interfere with evidence to be gathered by a parliamentary committee or that might be helpful from uh, your employees. I'm just asking, yes, for well, a uh, I'm asking for confirmation that if this no, committee... I'm, I'm not interfering there, but what I'm saying is they have a right as individuals whether they wish to appear or not. Well, and that's their right. And, and at least one of those days has stated their views as well. Mm -hmm. um, I'm, uh, Parliamentary committees have a variety of different avenues to uh, compel evidence, to compel witnesses. Uh, I think you, know, you would, I imagine, it's not the first time that uh, Sky News or, um, uh, or, or News Corp, for that matter, have been called to appear before Senate inquiries or parliamentary inquiries. I'm just putting it on the record that uh, the committee, uh, we, haven't, we haven't had a discussion uh, we don't know what evidence we might want yet, uh, further from the evidence that you give us today. I just want an undertaking from you that you understand that intimidating witnesses um, is obviously uh, a no-go. I understand that I've done no such thing. Okay, thank and you. And I will say I'm the Chief Executive of Sky. I'm responsible for Sky as a network and it's appropriate that I'm asked questions. And I'll also, I'll also say, Senator, that um, if, if the standard is uh, that individuals or employees of a media organisation are to be called, well, then I guess the Senate would have no uh, problem with calling hosts and journalists and other commentators from the Australian Broadcasting Corporation, for example, or other committees. Look, we, we call witnesses as we uh, need in order to fulfil the, the questions and uh, to our terms of reference. Um, the subject of your appearance today uh, is primarily in relation to the YouTube ban uh, of, of, your, of your station. But of course, there are other questions I'm sure uh, that uh, senators are gonna have in terms of how you, as you've pointed out, the boss of Sky News, uh, run your business. Um, I might kick off with uh, Senator Carr. Yes, thank you. I'll, look, be, before I begin my questions in relation to the Sky News and Google matter. I'm just wondering if you could comment on the report in today's Channel 9 newspapers to say that News Corp Australia is to launch a campaign from the October 17th to run a, a advocate, be advocates for a carbon net zero target to be reached by 2050. Uh, are you familiar with the stories that appeared in the Channel 9 newspapers? I saw the story, Senator. Uh, I can only speak to it in terms of Sky News, not the publisher. Yes, the I understand market. that. I understand that. I just, first of all, are you familiar with the story? I'm familiar with the story. Thank you. And will Sky be participating in this campaign? Sky News' uh, role in terms of uh, this issue is we have been working on a documentary looking at the issue of net zero emissions and looking at the issue about the policies uh, and and the solutions potentially for net zero emissions, looking at what the available technology is and speaking to a wider range of experts about that. And that documentary uh, is timed to coincide with the Glasgow Climate Fund. So will Sky uh, see, does it see itself as part of the uh, News Corporation? We, we are part of News Corporation, but in terms of our involvement, I've just outlined what our involvement yes. is. And we are still being uh, formulated at the moment, so I, I can't really speak to that report. Yeah. Right. Uh, I'm just wanting to know whether there's been discussions with you about that campaign, uh, and specifically the reference here to a plan that uh, critics uh, of the net zero by 2050 won't be muzzled. Is that, uh, were, you, were you familiar with that aspect of the campaign? 
like I say, uh, where it's still being formulated. Our involvement is only in the terms of a documentary. I can't speak to the other masters what they're doing because that's a separate issue. And I don't, I don't believe it's as, as advanced as what it's been indicated this morning in that report. I see. Well, I'm just wondering how it fits with the proposition that uh, has often been said that the uh, Murdochs distance themselves from editorial decisions uh, on their various platforms, that there's a company-wide campaign being run uh, on a matter such as uh, carbon net zero target being reached by 2050. I wouldn't describe it as a campaign. I would describe it uh, in terms of Sky News as an exploration of what are very complex issues. For example, we know that Bill Gates, for example, believes that micronuclear may be a solution to net zero emissions based on current modern technology. So that's an issue, for example, that we might explore in a documentary. And that's an issue uh, in technology is a big issue of net zero emissions in terms of how you, how you uh, find a solution. You see, so Mr Lachlan Murdoch was quoted recently as saying, uh, on the ABC, uh, for instance, he said that back in 2018, he made the observation that uh, what I do is running a media organisation is obviously, you know, work closely with the managers of those newsrooms, is with managers of those newsrooms, and that it's important that they get uh, the positioning and the messaging right. Uh, does that uh, conversation, those uh, positioning, the messaging right, does that uh, involve Sky? news? Well, look, uh, I don't know the full context of those comments uh, and specifically what is being talked about there. I saw that excerpt of the speech that Four Corners program ran. Mm -hmm. um, what I can say about it from my experience is that positioning and messaging are around uh, our product, for example. I was editor of the Telegraph and we repositioned the newspaper to be under the banner, we are for Sydney. And in doing that messaging, we've got to be careful at the Daily Telegraph, we don't disenfranchise very large regional readership. So we got behind the fair gut for the West campaign for campaigning for infrastructure in Western Sydney, for example. So um, that's an example I can give of that. In relation to Lachlan Murdoch, he's the non-executive chairman of News Corp, and he has no role in directing Sky News or News Corp uh, here for that. I see. Uh, do you think media proprietors do have uh, a right to uh, work with newsrooms on positioning and messaging of their companies? Uh, media proprietors uh, rely on the people that run uh, paper in terms of making judgment on the issues as they pertain to our local jurisdiction. Uh, Lachlan Murdoch has been here for a period and has now returned to America, uh, but he is normally only here once or twice a year. Um, we, he, he relies on uh, on the newsrooms here or the people that lead them as being the experts in the subject matter. So you wouldn't speak to him very often. Is that the what proposition you're putting to the committee? No, I speak to him frequently. You frequently? Uh, uh, Infrequently. Oh, I see. Fre right, I see. When, when was the last time you had a conversation with him, Mr Whitaker? I had a lunch with Lachlan when he first came here. Uh, I think it was in April. And I might, I might have spoken to him once or twice since then. Mm. I see. So he has no real influence over the direction of the company here? He has no influence in terms of directing Sky News. Uh, and uh, I can only speak to Sky News in terms of the company. Uh, the company is led here, uh, as you know, by Michael Miller. Yes. I'm interested in your particular responsibilities. Uh, I just wanted to be clear as to your relationship with Mr Murdoch and given what he's made, his public statement, and given the article that appears in Channel 9 today that the company is changing its position on an on, on important matter, climate change, you're saying you have no engagement with that matter? I'm saying that from Sky's point of view, we're investigating this issue. It's one of the biggest issues in the world, obviously. Governments worldwide and corporations are moving in this direction. We're exploring the policies and the solutions to that from Scott News's point of view. Mm -hmm. um, if I don't, I think that it's different from saying that we are campaigning for. We're really, it's really a matter of educating the public about these issues. Well, but Mr. Whitaker, is there a campaign uh, being launched by News Corp in relation to climate change, or isn't there? 
I believe we're looking at the net zero issue. Uh, I think it's a question of interpretation about saying that that's a campaign to campaign. So a, 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 a messaging direction. A what? Sorry. A messaging direction. No, not at all. This is uh, this is an issue that the editors uh, have um, have, uh, have have been talking about and looking at. From my point of view, I think it's one of the biggest issues uh, facing uh, the world. Uh, and from Sky's point of view, we're seeking to explore the policies and solutions. Uh, you know, climate uh, also, by the same token, is not a costless exercise. There are going to be trade-offs, and they're going to be winners and losers uh, in terms of net zero emission. The technology, uh, there's a mix of technology, uh, and I think it's important to, to uh, try to explain to people exactly where we are in terms of the current technology and what sort of technology might be needed to get to that. So there is, uh, according to the report this morning, this plan has been devised to limit but not muzzle dissenting voices amongst News Corp's stable of conservative commentators. Do you think that's an, an accurate reflection of the situation? I'm not aware of any any aspect uh, of that nature. I see. Are you aware of a switch in the editorial position of news in regard to climate change? Well, we don't deny climate change. I accept climate change is happening. The question is, what is the solution and what is the cost? Uh, because as I explained, it's not a costless exercise. And as a media organisation, um, you know, uh, it's our role to hold governments of all persuasions to it. I see. Uh, and different political parties, because these policies and the decisions involved in them have an impact on ordinary Australians in terms of industry jobs and household finances. And just, just to clarify, when you say we, who are you referring to, Mr Whitaker, when you say we don't deny climate change? I'm referring to Sky News uh, and News Corp. Senator Carr. Mm -hmm. So can I be clear, in terms of the codes of practice that you operated on, you referred to those in your opening remarks, uh, is, um, and, and particularly in regard to the protection of community standards, uh, is the subscription and the subscription broadcasting television code of practice 2013, how are you defined? What are you registered as? Sorry, Senator, in relation to the subscription television code of yes. practice, that we, we come under the licensee uh, in terms of that Foxtel, and we're obviously a channel that appears on Foxtel. Yes, but are you registered as a news and current affairs uh, program, or are you registered under general programming? Well, we, we come across we came across both uh, both of those uh, areas. News, we obviously run straight news, and we also run opinion. So does that depend on the time of day of your programming or is it, I just want to be clear as to what the nature of your registration is. Our programming is uh, obviously we run news, con news content, uh, we run that straight and then we have obviously we have opinion content uh, that we run uh, in the evening uh, which, also, which also includes obviously many different viewpoints. I see. So that's entertainment is it? Entertainment. Yes. I think it's it's programming, opinion and commentary, programming. Right. Some people might be entertained by it, but it's obviously uh, you know, based on current events. So be clear then. So under the broadcasting television code of practice, there you're defined as a general programming. Are you? Is that how you see yourselves, or under news and current affairs programming? I just want to be clear about at what point are you, which under which classification? We come, we come under both the free-to-air in terms of commercial codes of practice, which has certain requirements, as you know, and then we come also under the subscription television code of practice, which has certain requirements uh, as well. They're slightly different. Okay, so under the news and current affairs programming classification, you're required to provide uh, fair and reasoned, reasonable news uh, balanced reporting. Uh, you're required to correct significant errors of fact, for instance. Uh, that, would you agree yes. with that? Yes, and we and we do that. We do that when we do make errors. I see. And that is. Uh, are you covered by the ACMA re uh, regulations in regard to your operations? 
Yes, our, the licensee Foxtel comes under ACMA, and we're obviously a channel on Foxtel, and people under the co-regulatory process can make complaints both to us, to the licensee, and then uh, ultimately ACMA uh, is involved in that process as well. So we register what is an online provider, though. How, how is the registration, in terms of the regulation under the public broadcasting arrangements in this country, are you subject to those regulations? For instance, the same as the, are, you, are you subject to the same regulations as the free-to-air services? We're subject to the same regulations in terms of free-to-air as it relates to uh, regional television. Subscription television, obviously the code is, uh, is slightly different. Chair, Chair I'm, I'm conscious that there are other questions to be had. I wonder if Senator Carr uh, might be close to the end. Who's that? Oh, it's Senator Anik. Oh, we've got plenty of time, Senator Th Anik. Thank you, Senator Anik. Um, I, I just be clear about. Uh, uh, I just want to be clear about the formal registration that Sky is operating on and how they see their role within the regulatory framework. You have made some complaints, Mr. Whitaker, about the way in which you know, the Google treated your uh, videos that were published on the YouTube uh, stations. Now, they're not subject to ACMA uh, registration, are they? Is that correct? What, th those, those videos were broadcast on Sky News and they therefore come under ACMA's uh, regulation. Um, and, uh, but uh, this, this, uh, this particular issue uh, with, uh, with ACMA, it wasn't a case of uh, ACMA in action. It was a case, in my view, of YouTube overreach um, because there were no complaints about any of those videos uh, that were taken down by YouTube. Is there a uh, complaint that ACMA would yeah. be acting on? But ACMA didn't, uh, have, there was no, no complaint from ACMA about them? Is that your proposition? I'm saying that there was no complaints from the public about them, and mm -hmm. ACMA relied on complaints from the general public. So, but, the public. I, I just want to, I'm, I'm, we can argue the toss about the, the nature of the videos that were taken down. I just want to be clear as to what your views were in regard to the actions by Google. You're, 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 you're concerned about that. You, is it, what's the nature of your concern? Because ACMA didn't take any action against you, are you concerned that there was no regulatory response from ACMA? Or are you concerned that Google was able to take action without ACMA's endorsement? What I'm saying, Senator, is we have a regulatory framework that every broadcaster in Australia is bound by. They are, they are the tightest regulations of the media sector in Australia. Uh, and they have to provide ACMA, for example. Uh, people can make a complaint. Uh, they have to take submissions and evidence. They have to give consideration. It's a transparent process. They have accountability. And their determinations and findings are, are published. Anyone in the public can read them. They're on their website. YouTube gives no explanation. There is no consultation, right, okay. no explanation, okay, no, no got, written justification. I just want to be clear as no to what your complaint is. Now, now given, that, complaint. given that your concern is the news and current affairs programming uh, registration that you have under the subscription broadcasting code of practice means there are certain obligations upon you, as, uh, and that is Sky News. Does that require Sky News After Dark presenters to be accurate? There are, there are provisions there regarding accuracy in relation to the code. And do you believe they were accurate? I'm saying uh, that we, uh, we, we don't accept, based on YouTube's uh, implementation of its policies, we don't accept that we breach those policies. Mm -hmm. And that's why we've sought guidance from YouTube, both orally and in writing, to explain to us how we've breached their policy guidelines. Why didn't you appeal against it, those, those actions? For, for, a simple, for a very simple reason, Senator, um, because you, you are suspended before you can appeal. There is no consultation to say, we've got a problem with these videos where you can appeal and well, seek Mr. direction. Sorry, Mr Whitaker, just to be clear, uh, we've been given evidence today from uh, Google that they gave you a uh, warning in relation to uh, videos from October 2020. That was 12 months, a, a year ago. And uh, you didn't appeal that decision. And that was before, was that, was, that was a warning. 
that was a warning uh, prior to then having the strike against you in the seven day ban in July this year. So um, why, why did you not appeal that decision? Senator, uh, it was December 2020, and a warning is a warning that says you can be subject to a strike. On July 29, we were informed that we were subject to a strike, uh, and we were given less than 30 minutes notice to be told that we couldn't upload any video. So there's no appeal at that uh, time because you are already suspended. We then sought clarification about why we had breached the guidelines, and despite having written uh, also myself personally on August 6 to the CEO of YouTube in America, not had an acknowledgement, much less even a response. We've had no communication back and no can explanation. I just, I just want to go back to the original warning for videos that were published in October, of which you got the warning for in December. Is that correct? We, we, had, we had a warning uh, in December for two videos. Yes. yes. Can I? Can uh, I yeah. what, I'll, I'll come back to you, Senator Carr. Mm. Um, did you, what, what, why didn't you appeal the warning decision or did you just cop it and accept it? What was your response? There, there's, no in, there's no information given. You don't know what you're appealing. Well, it's just very I'm sorry, Mr Whitaker. you're in charge of a huge, big uh, media channel, news channel. When you got this warning on the 23rd of December, what did you do with it? We sought clarification as to what videos, if any, were caught by this, uh, this, uh, these guidelines in terms of potential policy breaches. And then we did the same again when we had the July 29 and when, strike. And, when, and you were told, when you were told what the two videos were, did you accept that they were uh, promoting and uh, uh, supporting disinformation no, in relation to COVID? We sought explanation about why they'd made these rulings, but it's a warning. It's only the strike at the strike point, I understand it, when the appeal situation comes into effect. Isn't the warning given so that you can get your house in order? Well, Senator, we have something like uh, 50,000 videos on YouTube. What we are talking about with the YouTube videos that were removed is less than 0.01% of our content. And we wrote to YouTube and asked them to give us an explanation and guidance as to whether we had any other videos that could be in breach and as to how uh, we were deemed to have been in breach. We heard from uh, Google today in, in evidence that you heard uh, that an algorithm apparently determined uh, uh, this. Uh, but then they talked also about uh, some other team that looks at things in context. But in relate, we, we, we've got no explanation uh, or guidance on any of uh, these matters. That we Mr Whitaker, do you accept that any of the content produced by Sky News has promoted either directly or indirectly disinformation and COVID lies? What, what I'm saying, Senator, No, is, I'm uh, asking you that specific question. Do you well, accept I'm not, that? I'm not, I'm not saying that I, I do accept that. I'm asking for guidance. And so you don't accept it. So you don't accept that. I'm asking I'm for not, information. You're not, I, I'm sorry, but you are the witness, and I'm asking the questions here. Could you answer the question? Do you? I'm if, saying. That the, do sorry, you, <laughs> Do you accept that Sky News has created and published content? that is either directly or indirectly promoted disinformation about COVID and COVID lies in relation to uh, restrictions, health measures, cures? Um, I don't accept that them taking these videos down based on policy guidelines. I'm not admitting that. Look, Mr. Given what you've said, and you've said that that Google doesn't accept the regulatory obligations that you accept. Do you believe that it's, it's now appropriate that there be new regulatory framework put in place that covers Google and YouTube guidelines and other such matters that you've complained about? Um, I'm, not, I'm not calling for more regulation. I'm saying there's already regulation governing these issues, um, which where me and every other broadcaster in Australia is bound by. Obviously, it's a matter for others as to whether um, uh, mm. everyone should be regulated. So you, you, think, you think the current regulatory framework is satisfactory? Yeah, uh, yes, I do. 
Okay. Um, because we take it seriously, Senator, as, as do other broadcasters. All right. Well, can I just turn to this issue then? There's half a million signatories to uh, this parliament. Uh, the, big, the largest e petition this parliament's ever received calling for a Royal Commission into media diversity. What is the argument this committee should put back to the parliament as to why we should not have a Royal Commission, given the strength of feeling there is in this country about the issue of media diversity? Well, I, I don't think, Senator, we've ever had more media diversity in this country. There's never been more digital technology. There's never been more sources mm -hmm. of, uh, of, of information. If you look at the, at the wide uh, range of different uh, media products that are available in Australia, I think people have never had um, you know, so much choice for news. We've got new brands that have entered the market in recent years and are entering the market. The, uh, so that's your proposition, that uh, there is, because of uh, the convergence, there is in fact uh, no need for us to be concerned about the level of media concentration in this country. I'm saying that there's, I don't think the barriers have ever been lower for uh, people to become media uh, public. In fact, is it not the case that the failure of media regulation in this country has allowed the uh, sorts of commissions that you've in fact raised with this committee to be perpetuated? Um, and that the half million Australians that actually presented this petition to the Australian, uh, to this parliament, will need a lot better explanation than that as to where we repudiate well, their, 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 their demand for a Royal Commission. Senator, we're accountable like every other broadcaster in Australia. YouTube's not accountable. Google's not accountable. We're, we're accountable. They don't give us any answer, let alone anybody. I would have thought that's an argument in favour of a, another look at the way and the regulatory framework's actually working in this country, given the power well, of these, well, Senator, glo these global companies. Well, you have to understand these global companies, um, they have the power to censor effectively uh, the news, um, but yet they don't take any legal responsibility as a publisher like we do, as I've said out in my, in my statement. Um, they take no such responsibility, um, but yet they want to make decisions on what can and cannot be published. And why isn't that an argument for a Royal Commission to look at how that's being done? Well, I'm not sure we need a, a Royal Commission until there's been various inquiries uh, into the media over the years. But I do think, um, you know, we, we just we have to recognise that these media giants uh, have enormous ability to make decisions about what Australians can read. I see. And you say this on behalf of the News Corporation? No, I say it uh, on behalf of Sky News in terms of our experience uh, in dealing with YouTube in these matters. Thank the you big very difference much. between YouTube and the regulator, Senator, is that the, the, the regulator has to provide documented proof of how they arrive at their findings. I, the people have the right to be heard. There are submissions that are taken. Uh, for Ms. example... Mr Whitaker, uh, we're going to go to some questions from other senators. Senator McMahon. Um, thank you. Thank you, Chair. Um, uh, Mr Whitaker, so just let me get this straight. So um, you were you were slapped with a warning uh, no, no, yes, from 2020. And then um, this year you were given a seven day ban over those videos from 2020. Is that correct? Uh, Yes, Senator. It's from the 29th of July to August the 5th. All right. Um, could you estimate the effect of that uh, seven-day ban, what that, uh, what the cost in dollars would be to you? Do you have any idea of that, what that would be? Well, look, we, we have commercial arrangements with YouTube uh, in terms of revenue sharing. They're confidential. Um, uh, there was obviously a cost there, um, but uh, the YouTube revenue uh, represents a relatively small percentage of our overall revenue. Right. Um, <clears throat> it, it seems to me that the majority of, uh, of, of your objections and, and uh, a lot of the public's objections to what happened to Sky News uh, surround the, um, the censuring uh, of your media organisation by a foreign-owned um, media giant. 
uh, without without any real real avenue of appeal. I mean, I know you you, you could have appealed, um, but as you've described, it already happened. You had no warning. Uh, but is is the majority of uh, sentiment around the fact that a foreign owned entity can come in and just arbitrarily apply uh, their their rules and their values and effectively strike out an Australian media organisation? Uh, yes, Senator, and as you uh, mentioned in uh, one of your other questions about the President Joe Biden, uh, you know, we're not under these policies able to contradict local health advice or World Health Organisation advice. But what happens, for example, when Dr Jeanette Young, the Chief Health Officer in Queensland, says that no one under 60 should take the AstraZeneca vaccine in, con in, con in contradiction of the Chief Medical Officer of Australia, the Minister for Health, and the World Health Organization's guidelines state that anybody over 18 should take what, whatever vaccine they can get access to. Now, that was live streamed by the ABC. Uh, that video, as I understand it, remains on YouTube, as does the video on President Biden uh, that you mentioned. So they say that it's applied uh, you know, equally, but there's just two small examples uh, where that appears to be a breach of guidelines. But you don't know why, because there's no written justification for the decision making. So those those two videos appear to quite clearly breach uh, YouTube's guidelines, which they've used against Sky News. Yet those two videos um, are still up on YouTube, and no sanctions have been taken against. As far them. as I'm aware, that's the case, uh, Senator. But there's numerous <clears throat> examples where there's a conflict in this advice um, that could constitute a breach. But like I say, you don't get any written explanation, so it's very hard to discern the opaque nature of how this is applied. And do you believe that any of your programs um, at any stage have deliberately sought to mislead the public over the existence of COVID or the treatments um, or vaccinations or anything to do with the medical information surrounding COVID? Uh, no, and, uh, and our discussions have all reflected the evolving debate over many issues uh, concerning COVID. Uh, whether it be changing World Health Organisation advice, changing medical advice in this country, conflicting uh, positions between different states uh, and territories. We've covered every angle of this uh, of this crisis, as I mentioned, almost 17,000 hours a year, mostly live. And is it your understanding that advice um, that was given and, and accepted as, uh, as the latest medical advice uh, back in 2020, when uh, your programs were aired, could be totally and completely different to advice that is given today? Senator, most of those videos uh, concerning the YouTube policy uh, breaches uh, were reflecting a discussion that was taking place in the scientific and medical community worldwide and amongst health practitioners and lawmakers, both in this country and overseas. It's a scientific debate that continues to this day and concerning hydroxychloroquine and ivermectin. For example, one of the people we interviewed on a number of those shows that were found to be in breach of YouTube's guidelines was Professor Thomas Barodi. Professor Thomas Barodi is a gastroenterologist who's credited with saving thousands of lives with his treatment for peptic ulcers. Now, he was arguing and arguing to the Australian government that they should be doing more to investigate uh, the potential efficacy of ivermectin in conjunction with oxycycline and zinc. But context and time in all these matters is very important. 2020, when these matters were being discussed on our programs, there was no available vaccine for COVID. There was no effective treatment for COVID. So it was very much in the public interest that this be discussed. And as I mentioned, right now, as we speak, there are two major clinical studies going on worldwide. One in the United Kingdom by Oxford University into clinical studies into ivermectin, and another being funded by the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation in the United States. So these are these are issues that are still uh, being debated in the scientific community. Senator McMahon, there just are one other government... final question. Yep. Sorry, one final question, Chair. Uh, Mr. Whitaker, I'd assume that just because someone is pre presenting an opinion on one of your shows, that does not necessarily mean that that is the opinion of your organisation as a whole. Is that correct? Yes, and it doesn't necessarily mean there's an opinion that's agreed with by our audience, by our staff, or even among other hosts or panel. Thank you. Uh, Senator uh, Anik. Antic? Sorry. Sorry. Thank you. Thank you, Chair. Thank you. 
Um, Mr. I, Whitaker, I, thank I, you. I do apologise. That wasn't. I, no, not at sorry. all. Not at all. Thank you. Um, thank you, Mr. Whitaker, for being here and for your evidence. I, I have a couple of questions that I'd just like to ask. It, it seems to me that the overwhelming majority of Australians um, support freedom of speech and support the tenets that go with that freedom of press and others. Are you concerned that the political and cultural elites that are now pulling the strings at big tech companies like YouTube, Google, and others? Uh, are now effectively censoring the free press. And some of the things we've talked about this morning, uh, it's a big issue for the Australian democracy. We've heard that uh, a foreign company are basically pulling the strings on an Australian democracy. Does that concern you? Yeah, of course it does. And and uh, I mean, I mean if, if, if we're saying that YouTube is the model that we want our regulator to uh, abide by, that means that we are saying that the regulator should better shut down a major TV network with 30 minutes notice. No consultation, no explanation, no written justification, no procedural fairness. Um, and that to me sounds you know, more like an instrumentality in a totalitarian state rather than a liberal democracy. Well, it is an enormous uh, issue. And I guess these companies now have an enormous um, pull collectively, uh, the five major big tech companies. They also therefore control presumably a lot of um, uh, sway in terms of the interpretation of some of the guidelines that have been put in. Are you concerned that this um, interpretation of the guidelines of companies like YouTube, we've heard a bit about that uh, today, about COVID disinformation and all the others, um, that it's really not so much about media diversity, but it's more about narrowing the viewpoints that we hear in our Australian democracy. Is that a concern as well? Well, look, I, I think they say their policies are applied consistently, but relatively easily you can find lots of examples of videos that you would think would be in breach of the guidelines such as they are, because they are rather vague, um, but yet those videos remain and other videos uh, are taken down. And look, we've tried to engage with uh, YouTube on the reasons and the rationale for their decisions, and they've chosen not to engage with us on that or give us any explanation. But the difference is with the regulator, um, you are given time to put in a submission, uh, the viewpoints are held, the decisions are made, determinations are made, and there's an appeal process. That's very much a closed shop. The terms that we've heard this morning, and we hear them all the time now, terms like misinformation, disinformation. Um, is it your interpretation that those are terms now being used by political and cultural elites from the left to effectively shut down what used to be known as free speech discussion? The things you discussed this morning with uh, eminent doctors talking about these other treatments uh, in context. Um, is it concerning that those terms are now become, they've now entered the vernacular and are now becoming almost weaponised against free speech? Well, free speech and freedom of expression, uh, you know, is a vital uh, pillar of a democrat of the de democratic structure of our society. But these bodies that make these decisions, these social media giants, they are completely unaccountable. Um, and they can make these decisions uh, by sending you 15 links with not a word of explanation as to you being in breach of their policy for alleged misinformation uh, or, uh, or alleged disinformation. And when you seek to engage them, like you would with a regulator who oversees these types of matters, you hear nothing back. Not even, your, your letter's not even acknowledged, uh, let alone responded to. Can I ask you about whether you're, you're aware of any um, organised campaigns um, against Sky News, uh, you know, complaint style campaigns that have been organised and if you're aware of where they've come from? Uh, well, uh, Get Up have obviously been involved uh, in a campaign, uh, uh, which, uh, you know, but Get Up has, uh, it, uh, is involved uh, quite regularly in campaigns uh, against New York. Yeah. And one final question. Um, is it the case that um, former Prime Minister Kevin Rudd has a lawsuit against uh, Sky News at the moment? Um, Kevin Rudd uh, has uh, has written to us. Uh, it's not a lawsuit at the moment. Right. Well, can I perhaps put this question to the committee. Is it appropriate, do we think, to be um, allowing people that are involved in political action, like that, sort of legal action like this, to ventilate those claims in this forum? I mean, I, perhaps, Mr Whitbrook, I could put that to you as well. Do you, that, that strikes me as being an extraordinary thing to allow. Well, just to be just to be clear, Senator Anik, you've put, if that's a point of order to the chair, then put it in as a point of order to the chair. Um, I will uh, respond. Uh, 
by saying, um, this is the first I've heard of this, uh, that is not the reason that Mr Rudd is uh, appearing before us today. Uh, this is in relation to the terms of reference of this inquiry. Uh, if you've got um, you know, uh, questions for him when he comes, you can take them. Uh, I just think you know, that that's not a. Um, yeah, I just I think you'd re you should rephrase the question that you're asking. No, I don't think I need to rephrase it. I'm just intrigued. What is as to what why is the question, Mr. Ann? Well, the, the question is: Is it appropriate in the circumstances for Mr. Rudd to be giving evidence today in light of those? in light of that factual context. We're all about context today. Why isn't it appropriate? What's that got to do with, with anything? What, what do you mean, what's that got to do okay. with anything? All what, right. what, what, okay. What's okay. the evidence got to do with anything? Okay, okay. I don't understand. Thanks for piping up, though, Kim. Thanks. Um, Senator, if you've got uh, if you've got points you want to raise in a private session about uh, witnesses, then we can we can take that. Um, we'll go to Senator uh, Faruqi. Uh, thank you, Chair, and good morning, Mr. Whitaker. Uh, I have a few questions on a topic a little bit different from the conspiracy theories perpetrated at Sky News. Uh, Mr. Whitaker, does Sky News have a policy that relates to discrimination, racism, and hate speech? We are bound by um, all those type of laws, uh, like any uh, organisation is in this country. So, if a Sky News presenter or guest did say something racist or behave in an unacceptable manner, they would expect to face some serious consequences. Depends on the circumstances, Senator. I'm I'm relating the circumstances to you: unacceptable behaviour or saying something racist. Well, it depends on what the circumstances of what you're talking about is. Can you give me an example? Okay, Mr. Whitaker, can you confirm which Sky News presenter in July 2017 told the then Race Discrimination Commissioner on air to go back to Laos? Um, no, well, that wasn't here in 2017. I've been at this network since October 2018, so I can't... But you are a, long, yeah, you are a long-standing News Corp journalist. Surely you would remember this incident, which gathered a lot of critique. Well, I'll remind you, um, it was Rowan Dean. Right. Um, do you think those comments were inappropriate? I'm not I'm not aware of them as you mentioned them, but if they were inappropriate, there are various forums that people could go to if they believed well, that they were breached. Well, I have told you exactly what the comments were. He actually told the then Race Discrimination Commissioner on air to go back to Laos. Right. Well, what I'm saying is, if that's an issue that someone wants to raise and, and produce in various forums that cover these matters, that's open to people to do so. Mr Whitaker, you're the boss of Sky News. Uh, I wasn't. You're Sky not News. now. You're not now. But you asked Sen Senator Faruqi to put uh, an example to you. She's put an example to you. If you can't answer it here, you can take it on notice. Well, I wasn't here. I wasn't the chief executive, so I don't but, think I could be held responsible for something that was said then. But what I'd say... She's not, I, just to be, clear, I, to be clear, Senator Faruqi is not asking you to whether you're responsible for it. She's asking you whether it's an appropriate thing to say. And if it happened today, Mr Whitaker, would you cop it as the, as the boss? Well, I think I've made my position on race issues pretty clear. I've been in the job nine days and sacked a host for making inappropriate comments about Chinese people. Senator so Farouk. you think that comment is inappropriate? I don't know the full context of it. I haven't got a transcript in front of me, Senator. It's very difficult for me to respond to it. I don't actually know the exact matter you're referring to. I can tell you that Mr. Dean, obviously, you know, is still a host and yes. that hasn't faced, as far as I know, any consequences for this incident. And, you know, I'll take you to another one. Um, can you confirm that Adam Giles was the Sky News presenter who interviewed the neo-Nazi Blair Cottrell on his show in 2018? Yeah, once again, Senator, I was not here then. I wasn't the chief executive until October. Okay, well, I can confirm to you that he was. And I can also tell you, as you know, that Mr. Giles um, continues to appear on Sky News and has never made an apology for having Mr. Cottrell on that show. So now that you are with Sky News and you are the CEO of Sky News, could you rule out Sky News giving an interview and a platform to a neo-Nazi in the future? Well, the Blair Cottrell matter, um, Blair Cottrell appeared on the ABC twice 
um, uh, and was interviewed. I don't know if you're, you're saying they're racist as a result of that. He did appear on Sky News and he was interviewed by Adam Joel. And there was an ACMA um, investigation of that which found no breach of the code of practice. I'm not defending Blair Cottrell coming on the network. I would not have Blair Cottrell on this network. He will not come back on this network while I'm here. And could you also rule out that while you are there, Sky News will not give an interview to a neo-Nazi in future? Just a simple yes or no will suffice. Well, um, I don't know what you're talking about there, Senator. Are you, have you got a specific example of someone that you're referring to? You're I just gave you an example of some, a neo-Nazi who appeared on Sky News. And I'm yeah. asking you, you said if you were CEO, he would not appear. So could you just confirm that he anyone else while like him he who is a Nazi while I've been. He, he has not appeared. appear? He hasn't appeared while I've been CEO. And I'm saying that I would not have Blair Cottrell back on this network. I don't imagine the ABC will have him back either. So you won't answer me the, the question of whether you will let any other neo-Nazi appear on Sky News or not? Well, that's a very loaded expression. I don't know who you're talking about. Okay, I will move on, Mr. Whitaker. As you might expect, I receive a lot of correspondence as a senator. And I received a flurry of emails about 10.30 p.m. a few weeks ago, just minutes after a segment on Sky News, which had a go at me. And this was on Paul Murray's show. And I just want to read out one part of these emails to you. They use racial slurs and then say, and I quote, you'll get the respect of the public when you kill yourself. Because as of the moment, you're a disgrace to this country and to politics. If I ever come across you in person, expect to be verbally assaulted and don't be surprised if you're physically assaulted by a member of public, in brackets, not me. Vile trash is something you couldn't aspire to be. Does it disturb you, Mr. Whitaker, that people are feeling compelled to send me these sorts of messages after watching a regular Sky News show? Well, Senator, that's a repugnant uh, thing that you've mentioned, and it's absolutely uh, inappropriate. And uh, I imagine that you've referred that to authorities. I mean, how I engage in public debate, and from time to time, we receive uh, that sort of correspondence which is entirely inappropriate. And from time to time, we also have to refer to authorities. Um, I'm not aware of the particulars of that until you've raised that now, Senator, but it's appropriate, it sounds like, in the police book. Yeah, but what I'm saying is that the people feel, watch your shows and then feel like they can say these things about the people that you are bagging in the shows that are on Sky News. Can you recognize the harm that it does to a person who receives these sorts of messages? Well, Senator, um, we're not the author of whoever wrote that. Uh, and whoever wrote that uh, should be accountable for it. And I imagine the authorities, if they can find them, will make them accountable, as is appropriate. Thank you, Chair. Thank you. Um, Mr Whitaker. Alan Jones was recently dropped by the Daily Telegraph amid the controversy in relation to COVID uh, commentary that he's made and the promotion of uh, uh, COVID disinformation. He's been called out by a number of um, people, including, of course, uh, Mr Ray Hadley. Um, the Daily Telegraph has dumped him. Why have you kept the bloke? Uh, well, I think the Daily Telegraph uh, uh, gave reasons uh, for uh, Alan Jones weren't exactly as without one there, Senator. But in relation uh, to Alan Jones, um, if Alan Jones makes a mistake, and he did make a mistake uh, in July, and as a result of that mistake, uh, we corrected that matter online, and Alan Jones read a correction online. He's broadcasting live four nights a week. Sometimes mistakes are made. So we take action when we're made aware of these issues, and, we're, and we endeavour to correct the record in a timely fashion uh, when that occurs. Um, so uh, what I can say about Alan Jones is he has strong opinions on, on, uh, on many issues. Uh, he's uh, popular with uh, a large segment of our audience. I'm sure there are others in our audience uh, who have a different view like they do about all our hosts. Um, but uh, Alan Jones uh, is responsible for what he says uh, on air in terms of uh, uh, what, what he says, and he has to be held accountable for that if he makes an error. And like I say, as we've demonstrated, we did 
uh, we did uh, correct mm -hmm. uh, those matters most recently, which involved the interview between Alan Jones and Craig Kelly. Mm. And what was the mistake that he made, Mr Whitaker? They were discussing figures from Public Health England um, where they were looking at the Delta variant and the rate of death and comparing it to a previous uh, variant. Uh, and the segment lacked context in that, uh, that when the Alpha variant was there, uh, there was not a vaccination uh, at the same level as there was with the Delta variant. And therefore, um, that, uh, that lacked context uh, and uh, it was not a fair comparison. Mm. And as a result of that, we corrected mm. the record. And is that... It was a live interview where it was said, so... Mm -hmm. And so context is important? Yes. Okay. And uh, accuracy is important? Uh, yes, of, of course accuracy is important. Mm -hmm. um, how many mistakes does Alan Jones make? Well, uh, Alan Jones, made, there's been... Uh, one or two matters that have been corrected, uh, which uh, in in the time that uh, he's been here, um, with a small amount of mistakes, um, but equally there are mistakes made quite regularly in other programming. Uh, you can look at ABC's corrections website, for example. Mm -hmm. um, Mr Whitaker, does your company have a policy in relation to uh, the way hosts and producers um, engage, uh, present, uh, promote COVID information? We don't have a specific policy on COVID. Uh, we, we obviously, uh, as I mentioned in my opening statement, uh, we endeavour uh, to be, uh, to get things right. And on occasion with uh, the nature of live television, when mistakes are made or misstatements are made, we endeavour to correct them. And so you don't have a specific policy. Do you think that given all of the controversy uh, in relation to uh, these matters and the growing interest in, and public interest in uh, ensuring that what is promoted, what is published is accurate in relation to, to COVID and uh, keeping the community safe, do you think that perhaps you should have a policy? Uh, Senator, we publish uh, every day, uh, as you probably be aware, uh, hours and hours of live content of chief health officers giving official government and unfiltered health information, mm -hmm. premiers, state and territory leaders, the mm -hmm. prime minister, the health minister, and various other yes. officials, not to mention a wide array of experts. So anybody who watches our channel sees this matter from every angle. I would argue we've covered every angle of this pandemic yes. in a way no other broadcaster in this country has. So anyone who watches our channel is very well informed. Okay, so if you run three hours of a press conference, of press conferences from state premiers, that gives uh, Sky After Dark hosts the opportunity to wax lyrical about COVID lies and conspiracy theories. Is that the argument you're trying to make here? No, Senator, There's that's a your balance? contention. That, well, uh, no, that's what's... your contention. <laughs> I, I don't understand the, the, the point you're trying to make. Then I'm asking about whether you're, in, given all of this, given the, the, the pandemic and the emergency and the crisis that we are in, the enormous amount of public dollars that is being spent trying to deal with this virus, keep the community safe, surely it would be a responsible thing to do as the boss of one of the country's leading news channels to ensure that there is a policy that every one of your staff, presenters, producers clearly understand. The Give them some guidance. The policies, that govern, the, the policies are the policies that govern everything that we broadcast. We are bound by the regulations of this country like every other broadcaster mm. is. As I mentioned in my opening statement, we've not been found in breach of those code of practices in 10 years. Mm. That means we take our responsibility as a broadcaster mm. seriously and we adhere okay. to the regulations. So what about when uh, Sky News hosts promote uh, claims that Invermectrin is a cure for COVID? Is that appropriate? Well, that's your contention that they promote it as a cure, Senator. I mean, what they do is they discuss it uh, at length and have discussed it at length 
with various medical experts. As I mentioned, Professor Thomas Barodi had a view about ivermectin. There's still worldwide clinical studies that are going on to that right now. At the time, which and context in time is, is very important in this debate, uh, when there was no vaccine and there was no effective treatment, medical experts were saying that Australia should do, do more. But at the same time, those same hosts uh, were applying caveats. They were saying with hydroxychloroquine, for example, that while there were studies that showed that hydroxychloroquine potentially uh, could be efficacious at an early stage when it was administered, there was other studies that also showed that it was either ineffective or in some cases it could be harmful. And the same with ivermectin. There were randomised trials that showed that ivermectin had promise. Professor Barodi's argument was needed to be considered in conjunction Mr. with Whittaker, other drugs. Mr Whitaker, ivermectin as a cure has been discredited, hasn't it? I'm not saying it's a cure, Senator. I'm saying I'm that asking, there were medical. I'm asking. I'm asking you. Ivermectin is ivermectin uh, is not uh, not recommended for use in this country uh, by the Therapeutic Goods Administration in terms of treatment for COVID. That's correct. So why would it be uh, being uh, promoted uh, and discussed as a potential cure on Sky News, which prides itself on accuracy? Well, as I said, Senator, there are two worldwide studies going into ivermectin as a potential treatment for COVID. At the time that some of these issues were being discussed with medical professionals who had a different view to the regulator and had written uh, to the health department, for example, um, and they challenged uh, you know, some of the decisions. At the time that was happening, there were, for instance, uh, at the time of some of these videos in 2020 that had been removed by YouTube, there were 50 studies going on worldwide into the oxycloroquine and the potential efficacy for COVID. Mm -hmm. In the Mr. same way that was done. Mr. Studies. Whitaker, Mr. Whitaker, isn't it true that the business model for Sky News is create outrage, be controversial, and deal with the consequences later? No, not at all. Pru, explain to me why particular shows on your network. Um, pride themselves on creating such controversy and division? Well, I don't accept that proposition, Senator. We, 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 we have people uh, with many different views appear on our shows. Mm. We have many different progressive voices. We've got a, a group of ex-Labor politicians, for example, as contributors. Uh, we have Nicholas Reese, who used to be a staff for Julie Goodhart as a Deputy Labor Lord Mayor of Melbourne. Uh, you know, your own fellow senators uh, appear on our channel from time to time to I'm not, argue. Uh, I'm not. I'm not suggesting that outrage is unique to one side of politics, Mr. Whitaker. I'm asking about whether uh, it is true, a contention that's been put to us, that the Sky News business model is to create outrage and think about the consequences later. Well, no, I don't accept that. Mm -hmm. The Sky News business model is built on trust and credibility. How many have you had to counsel any of your, or have you counselled any of your hosts or producers in relation to the way COVID information is presented on any of your shows? We obviously uh, had a discussion in relation to that correction that was made on air uh, in the Alan Jones show um, in terms of the way that information was presented. And that, and that material was removed from all platforms uh, as a result of the lack of context uh, in that matter. It was quite a complex matter. We looked at it very closely and that's a decision that we made. Mm -hmm. um, you mentioned that Mr Jones was very popular with your audience. What makes him popular? He's been a broadcaster for 35 years uh, and he won a record amount of uh, you know, radio rating surveys in the period he was a radio broadcaster. So he's a well-known personality uh, and, um, and people uh, obviously enjoy his content. Some people who don't enjoy his content. Mm -hmm. um, do, you, um, do, you, do you agree that um, there is a certain uh, level of responsibility for um, those in the public eye, uh, those who are deemed to be popular uh, in relation to how they deal uh, and present and attach themselves to uh, misinformation, lack of accuracy or conspiracy theories? Senator, 
everybody in the public domain, uh, uh, be it politicians, be it broadcasters, be it any people of that nature, have a responsibility um, in terms of, uh, of what they say. In the same way, the politicians that come on our network who make claims about vaccination and other things, um, we uh, we make no apologies for uh, challenging uh, some of those. And you might have seen that recently with uh, Senator Hanson, who made certain claims about vaccination, which were uh, not supported by the facts. And our host challenged her on air about that. In the same way, Craig Kelly is an elected member of parliament um, and, uh, and people have a right uh, to hear him, especially people who might consider voting for him, but that does not mean um, that Kelly can come on our network, frankly, any other network, and make claims that are not supported by the facts. And when he did that uh, in July, uh, we corrected him on air and on, in an online correct. I, I, I think it's important for us to remember as members of parliament that we are held to a higher standard. I think that's the point that you are making, Mr Whitaker. I put it to you that uh, hosts of your channel, those involved with uh, the um, uh, discussion and presentation of said news, information, facts, also have a responsibility to be held to a higher standard, one that does not allow them to promote and attach their popularity to conspiracy theories and that harm and endanger the community. Well, Senator, I do not accept that contention that they attach themselves to conspiracy theories. All our hosts take their responsibilities very seriously. Okay. Um, do, are, you, are you aware of the recent tweet sent by uh, Corey Bernardi, one of your presenters, where he said, Invermectum will set you free. Yes, I am aware of that tweet. It was well, a personal tweet and he took it down and that's appropriate that he took it down. Hmm. So you wouldn't, you, would you uh, counsel him against presenting those types of views on your channel? Um, I, would, uh, I, I would in relation to the, to the tweet that was a private tweet, uh, certainly, uh, I didn't speak to him personally, but certainly he was uh, he was spoken to about um, about that after he'd done it, um, and he'd uh, and he'd taken it down, which was appropriate. And mm. um, you mentioned at the outset, and it has been reported that uh, Sky News has deleted uh, a number of videos yourselves from the platform. Thirty-one. And um, we heard from. Google today that they have uh, taken down 23. Um, so that's, uh, you know, that's quite a lot of videos that had um, incorrect... Senator, sorry, it's, it's 18 videos that we took down, as I understand it. The 23 are the YouTube videos. But as I mentioned earlier, Senator, that equate uh, to, uh, in terms of YouTube, less than 0.01% of the videos that mm -hmm. are on our platform. Mm -hmm. So those 18, thank you for clarifying that, uh, Mr. Whitaker, because I was wondering what the the, um, uh, the the discretion in the in the figures was. Um, those 18 videos, what was in them? They were of a similar nature. Some of them were just straight news reports about ivermectin hydroxychloroquine. The difficulty is, as I was trying to explain, Senator, is we have sought both orally and in writing from YouTube guidance about what historical videos, if any, that sit on our platform might constitute a breach of their policies. In relation to the YouTube videos, they went back before the December warning. These videos were before the December warning in the July strike, and they, they bundled 15 videos together. They could, have, they could have told us about them in uh, December, but didn't. There's no, there's no actual rhyme or reason how they operate. I think the algorithm that what it sweeps at random months later, it's just, it's just very opaque the whole uh, you know, way this thing works. Mm -hmm. And that's why we've sought explanation, Senator. But when we couldn't get an explanation, we took it upon ourselves essentially to, to if you like, self-censor in terms of videos, some of them which were fairly innocuous, about uh, reports of these particular drugs because it is so uh, uh, vague uh, how they apply these policies. And it only takes one one more video and one line, presumably, in thousands of videos for us to have 
uh, another suspension. And then if one, and if there's one other after that, uh, which is why we took the decision to take our own content down, if I, there's just one line after I, that, we are permanently cancelled from the channel. I struggle to th thank you, Mr. Whitaker. I struggle to understand why, if you've had to, this has caused so much confusion for you, so much problem, that you wouldn't then turn around and say, look, as a way of safeguarding any suggestion or any actual uh, promotion or uh, association with dangerous conspiracy theories that undermine the health of the community, that you would give some guidelines and guidance to your own staff. Of course, in relate, first of all, I don't accept, again, Senator, your contention that we're promoting what you're saying we're promoting. What I'm saying is... Well, hang, on, hang, on, hang on a second. You have just uh, told me you have uh, taken down videos because you think that they might fall uh, foul of the COVID breaches, as the, the Google breaches. What of, I'm of, putting of to the... you, well, wouldn't it be easier if you just had some guidelines internally? Well, that's... That, 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 that said you had to promote facts and accuracy and no amount of COVID lies and conspiracy theories will be copped? I'm sorry, Senator, I can't, I can't actually make it what you're saying. Mr Whitaker, I'm putting to you that as a, out of an abundance of caution. Wouldn't it be better as the boss of Sky News to ensure that all of your employees, your staff, your producers, your journalists, your presenters, understood what is appropriate when it comes to the promotion and presentation of COVID lies and conspiracy theories? Well, I don't accept your contention that it's COVID lies and conspiracy theories that we're broadcasting. What I'm saying is, like all content that we produce, we look and check that content in terms of what we say on air. And like I say, if it's pointed out to us or it's shown that we've made a, an error, uh, we correct it. Of course, we take our responsibility seriously in terms of what we say. This advice is changing all the time in relation to COVID. You have state and territories and leaders that disagree with each other. You've got health experts who disagree with each other about the best approach. It's a constantly evolving uh, set of circumstances, and we do our best to uh, keep across that, stay abreast of it, ensure that what we're doing is timely uh, and relevant. I don't understand what the problem is with sending a message to your employees to say Sky News will not tolerate the promotion of conspiracy theories that undermine the health of the community. What's the big your, deal? Your contention, Senator, that's what we've done. What I'm saying is we endeavour to ensure that what we put to air is accurate. OK. Except that it's not all accurate, is it, Mr Whitaker? We've just discovered this. Well, you I, have, I mentioned you have, to you... You have, you have articles uh, that, have been, that you've had to take down that say that ivermectin treatment caused, quote, amazing improvement, one that's been deleted, another, Statistical analysis of studies proves efficiency of hydrochloroquine. I mean, it goes on and on and on. There yeah, is no good reason to ban those... two potential, quote, COVID cures. Yeah, and that was uh, some of these videos, Senator, were 12 minutes long. You've got to put them in the full context of everything that was said. Um, Mr Whitaker, could I just go to uh, some of the questions in the relation to the way you, you manage the shows at Sky News? Um, can you explain the editorial management structure for us? Uh, some of our content uh, is scripted, uh, uh, and obviously uh, that scripted content is, uh, is checked and looked at by producers. Uh, 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 we also obviously are operating in a live environment and often, uh, you know, that obviously not scripted. Um, in relation to matters uh, of contention, uh, we obviously uh, have a, an internal legal um, a department and on occasion uh, external legal, which is the same as any other broadcaster and publisher. Um, who, who makes up the editorial team? 
Uh, we have a director of news or a head of news, I should say, and we have a head of programming. So the, the head of news uh, uh, oversees uh, the news operation and the head of programming oversees the programming operation. Mm -hmm. And how many um, members of the uh, editorial team or leaders at Sky News are women? Uh, our, our, um, uh, in terms of our executive team, it's pretty much 50-50. Mm -hmm. uh, and in terms of our staff, it's fairly close to that as well. Mm -hmm. I've got a question in relation to how you engage uh, and, and, and manage the, um, uh, the skill makeup of your uh, producing teams. Um, and I just want to say first up, you know, I think the, the staff that as politicians we engage with here in Canberra are uh, incredibly professional and um, uh, are very good journalists. Um, I know for my engagement with uh, the producers in, that have you know, been around uh, in uh, South Australia, in Adelaide, um, I've always found to be incredibly professional and very passionate about public interest journalism. Um, I have noticed, however, that a large number of your producers are very, um, or are, are younger. Is that fair to say? Well, I mean, the staff here, for example, are much younger, um, or, and probably in television generally, I, I would say, than uh, than what uh, staff were where we came from, the Australian, mm. which which is old. Um, what's the average age of your producing teams? Um, I don't know the exact number, but it'd probably be in the early 30s if you averaged out everyone's age, maybe mid 30s. Yeah. Um, and do they, uh, do, do you brief them about uh, what to do if they uh, are concerned uh, about misinformation being promoted on, on the shows that they're producing or particular guests being scheduled? Oh, I don't brief them, but we have, uh, like I say, a head of program and head of news, and we have a structure like any uh, responsible news organisation has mm -hmm. in terms of how we publish or broadcast information. What, what does a producer do at Sky News? What's the process if um, one of the presenters is asking for a particular guest to come on to promote? Um, discredited cures into COVID or in the example raised by uh, Senator Faruqi, for example, to schedule uh, a neo-Nazi uh, supporter on the show. Um, where does the producer go when they've, if after they've been asked to do something like that, if they've got concerns? Well, we don't ask producers to schedule uh, uh, people around the um, the way that you describe that, but the producer would would, uh, would be involved in research. They'd be involved in looking at who uh, a potential guest might be in their back, and depending on the topic that was going to be discussed. So, for example, do they want a professor of microbiology to talk today on some subject, or they, do they want a professor uh, of public health policy to come and talk on it? I mean, there's, I mean, it's a wide, you know, the range of of people that we interview on our program, and people who have uh, different viewpoints and across the political spectrum. Mm. Um, it strikes me that in, uh, in in a scenario where you've got a young producer who, in you know, I imagine is um, very passionate about the work they do, uh, being asked uh, to uh, schedule particular guests or to take a particular uh, angle with questions by a very popular uh, and powerful host like Alan Jones, um, there's a bit of a power imbalance there, isn't there? Um, Alan Jones has very good relations with his producers. Mm. I, I'm just using this as an example. And they're, and, they're, and, they're, and, they're, and they're very smart young people. Yeah. Do, do you accept that there might be a power imbalance sometimes between very popular uh, acclaimed hosts and uh, a young producer who has only just started to cut their teeth in the industry? Well, Alan Jones isn't necessarily just dealing with 
one young producer or one producer, there's a very experienced head of programming who oversees um, these operations, mm -hmm. who's probably spent 25 years in commercial television. Mr Whitaker, I, I just want to um, uh, try and work out whether you understand the, the concept of the power imbalance, though. Well, obviously, a junior producer uh, is a junior producer, and, and a host, uh, you know, is more senior. But it's not. It's not just a, uh, you know, uh, it's not a. It, I say there's the hosts have two or three producers. Mm -hmm. Some are more experienced than others. Uh, in the same way, we have structure, like any broadcaster and newsroom has, uh, where where matters are overseen at different levels uh, within uh, uh, within structure. Um. I just put uh, just to clear this on the record. Obviously, um, uh, I've had a, uh, two incidents in relation to, to Sky News that have uh, ended in, in legal negotiation. I think it's important to disclose that. The first one, of course, being in relation to when your news channel had uh, Senator, the former Senator Lionhelm on the Outsiders program, uh, and more recently, uh, a, a case in relation to. Um, uh, a show hosted by uh, Rita Penahay. Um, when it came to the outsiders uh, incident, who was held responsible uh, for that? Well, Senator, uh, the, pre the, the outsiders incident predated me. Mm. I think but I'm sure you've been point. briefed, Mr. Whitaker. No, I'm actually not across the detail, but I can talk to the more recent example, Senator. I'm happy to. No, I want. It's, okay, well, let me tell you. Well, it and happened in my time. Can, well. Yeah, okay. So, in relation to this, and this is this gets to the question I'm asking about the power imbalance. This is why I'm raising this. Uh, in relation to the incident on Outsiders, it was Rowan Dean's show, but it was the junior producer who was thrown under the bus. Now, I, I, you, you can take that on notice and come back to me if you, if, if, if you want to verify and correct the record. But I think that that is appalling. Yeah, Surely well, you I'm have not, to have I'm some not. structure in place to hold some of these hosts uh, uh, to account or to ensure that there is some mechanism uh, to address the power imbalance. A young producer being expected to uphold these levels of accuracy, of uh, to ensure that they're, they're not breaching these uh, codes and practices when you don't even have guidelines you, have, you are willing to outline for them. I'm just wondering who you hold responsible for the misinformation that is being promoted on your channel. Well, that's, that's your contention, Senator. Uh, and, and I think in relation, to the, uh, in relation to the most recent matter I can talk to, um, and that uh, it was a comment made by a Liberal senator on live television. We didn't have any warning of that at all. And uh, he made some very ill-advised remarks, which, frankly, we ended up uh, having to pay compensation for. And I'm not saying that wasn't appropriate. Uh, certainly what he said wasn't appropriate, but it's live television and he made remarks that we had no warning of. Mm. Um, and we, uh, we apologised uh, to you for that, uh, which is appropriate. Um, in relation to the producers, there are checks and balances in our, in our system uh, on all our programming uh, that, uh, that involves uh, a number of producers uh, and, uh, and, and, and things are elevated at different levels depending on the subject matter. Has anybody ever raised any concerns with you, Mr Whitaker, about the type of material that is broadcast on your show uh, internally, on your, on your ch on, across your shows? Have you had staff come forward at any point and say, uh, look, I don't think we should be promoting these drugs that have already been discredited. Um, well, no, I haven't had a, I haven't had any conversation of the nature you just outlined there. No. Senator Carr, have you got yeah, any other questions? Quick, very briefly, um, I'd like to uh, seek your advice, Mr. Whitaker. There's a report in the Melbourne Age on the 6th of August, 2021, that says that YouTube, uh, there were 14 videos removed prior to your the advice being tendered to you in regard to the 
the, the offending videos in December 2020. Can you confirm that there were 14 videos removed by uh, Google? No, Senator, the only videos I'm aware that were removed by Google was the original May 3 video uh, involving Alan Jones, and there was 15 other videos that were attached to that, that was in July 29. No, I see. A, so you're not aware of the pre videos. any previous, any prior uh, uh, incident? No, I'm not aware of that. Thank you. And secondly, there's a report here that says that the on-air corrections that were made by Mr Jones did not relate or include any discussion of those videos that were actually taken down. Can you confirm well, that? Well, Senator, none of the YouTube videos uh, were, uh, there was no complaints about them, as I mentioned. The, uh, the May 3rd uh, 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 video, um, uh, as I understand it, wasn't, uh, sorry, the May, the May 3rd video was the video that, uh, that, was a, that resulted in the strike. Uh, and there was another 15 videos that were attached to that, and there was five subsequent videos before we uh, restored to YouTube. So the reference here that caused the Sky's suspension from YouTube was not included or discussed, and either the on-air correction oh, is not sorry, correct. Sorry, Senator, I, sorry, I, I misunderstood what you said. The, the July 12 video, the one that we, uh, we published the correction about, and on air as well. That was never uploaded to YouTube. I just want to be clear about this. The report here is the video that caused Sky's suspension from YouTube was not included or discussed in either on air correction. Is that statement correct? Would you like to no, take that on notice? No, 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 Senator, there was no complaint about the no, It's not a question video. about complaint. It's a question about whether inaccuracy in the information provided by Mr Jones, which led to Google's actions. Well, I'm happy to talk about that video, Senator. I thought you already have been Would talking about it for over an hour, but uh, that my question... Well, no, Senator. Sorry. I, I, all I'm trying to establish is whether or not the corrections policy, which you've given some emphasis to, included a correction in regard to the Sky suspensions. Were they ever corrected? No, no, no. No, Senator, I'm happy to take you through the context and the content of that video if you'd like. No, no, I just wanted to be clear that they, they've never been corrected in your judgment. You've made no comment about correcting any of those videos in your... Well, we've so, we've sought guidance from YouTube about how to press their policies mm -hmm. and, and to give us Thank explanation you. about them. Thank you. And look, you've also emphasised today that the foreign company status of Google and others... Now, it is the case, and I just wanted you to clarify my own mind, News Corp is still a foreign-owned corporation, isn't it? YouTube uh, is... Uh, no, is, yeah, sorry, no, News Corp. News Corp, is it a foreign-owned corporation? It's on the American uh, Stock Exchange. Yes. That's right. And Sky is part of that. You are a foreign-owned corporation. You work for a foreign-owned corporation, don't you? Sky is, uh, is a subsidiary of News Corp Australia. Yes, that's right. It's a foreign-owned corporation. It's a subsidiary of News Corp Australia, which yes. is part of News Corp. Yes, I just wanted to be clear, that's all. If you made some emphasis on the issue of being foreign-owned today, I just wanted to be clear about your own status in this. Well, thank you. That concludes that. Uh, thank you, Mr Whitaker. We will uh, leave it there. Um, oh, sorry, Senator uh, Rennick, are you still on the line? Uh, yeah, I am. Do you, you have a final couple of questions? Uh, not really, no. Okay, all right. right. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Mr Whitaker. Thank you for your time. And I appreciate that we've, we've had you for a bit longer than we said we would. So I, I appreciate that. Thank you, Senator. Thank you. Uh, we just might take a short suspension, um, just for a second. So we'll, we'll reconvene. Thank you. Uh, I now welcome the Honourable Kevin Rudd, 26th Prime Minister of Australia. I understand that information on parliamentary privilege and the protection of witnesses and evidence has been provided to you. For the Hansard record, will you please state your full name and the capacity in which you appear today? 
Uh, Kevin Michael Rudd, uh, former Prime Minister of Australia. Thank you, Mr Rudd. Um, I invite you to give us a short opening statement and then we're going to go to some questions. Thank you very much, uh, Senator. And can I say to all senators uh, who are members of this inquiry, I thank you for your combined uh, effort in what I regard to be a deeply important matter for the future of our democracy. It's also the view of the more than half a million Australians who signed a petition concerned about the future of media diversity in our country and their interest in a free, fair and balanced media as the continued lifeblood of the Australian democracy. And their contention that that is being undermined by the use and abuse of the emerging and present Murdoch media monopoly. Uh, in um, the next few minutes, if I could simply touch on four or five quick points. The first is when we are dealing with the most recent development concerning uh, the reporting by Sky News of uh, the pandemic, uh, we are brought face to face with the fundamental question as to who calls the shots uh, in the Murdoch media empire. Now, from the public uh, reporting, we know that your committee has invited Lachlan Murdoch uh, to attend, and he's declined, and instead we've just heard from Mr Whitaker. Mr Whitaker's contention uh, is, and I took a note of what he said, is that um, Mr Murdoch uh, does not influence um, directly Sky News. Um, again, I would challenge that for the simple reason that Lachlan Murdoch himself, in the very year that Mr Whitaker took over as CEO of Sky News Australia, said, and Senator Carr has referred to this already, what I do, that's Lachlan Murdoch, running a media organisation, is obviously work closely with the managers of those newsrooms, that means Sky, and with the managers of those newspapers, obviously the digital platforms, and it's important that they, quote, get the positioning and the messaging right, unquote. So in other words, when you've requested Mr Lachlan Murdoch to attend this inquiry, it's not just a matter of colour and movement um, and interesting journalism and reportage. It's because it goes to the essential nature of the power uh, within the Murdoch media operation and who calls the shots and who dictates the editorial direction of Sky News. So I regard Mr Lachlan Murdoch's non attendance today as not only deeply disappointing, but frankly, utterly spineless, uh, given the, the power which he wields within the operation. And Mr Whitaker knows that Mr Murdoch wields that power. The second point relates to the most recent controversy about Sky News's coverage uh, and YouTube's response to uh, its reporting on the pandemic. As we all know, this pandemic is the most serious public health crisis we've had in Australia in 100 years. It's not a laughing matter. And when we go to the sort of disinformation that Murdoch Sky News has run uh, across uh, its various platforms in Australia, nor is it a laughing matter. In fact, when you look at just some of the commentary, uh, when we have Sky News out there uh, caught out denying that this is even a pandemic. Well, that's false. They've claimed that vaccinated people are much more likely to die from COVID than the unvaccinated. That's false. They've said that the real cures for COVID are livestock wormers and anti-malarial drugs. That's false. They've insisted these miracle cues, cures are being deliberately concealed so that the vaccine manufacturers can experiment on the public. That's false. They say you can't trust state medical authorities because they're all health fascists and that face masks do not do, masks do nothing to inhibit the spread. Well, that's both false and false. And here's the real doozy. They've said that the virus itself may well have been contrived um, by a group involving the CIA and Bill Gates possibly with the aim of demolishing capitalism. That's not just false, that's stark raving mad. And so, therefore, when you see that in terms of the reporting and the commentary, 
from Sky News, these are not insignificant claims. They actually contribute to the wider um, belief in the community by many that vaccines don't work or that the coronavirus pandemic has been overstated and exaggerated. What I found interesting just now, Senators, is that Mr Whitaker was challenged by one of you as to whether he accepted the accuracy of YouTube's decision that this constituted disinformation. He refused to agree with the proposition that it equaled disinformation. That is the Chief Executive of Sky News Australia not accepting YouTube's determination that what I have just read out equals disinformation. That goes to the heart of the problem. That's the heart of the beast saying it. He further said that, for example, on the quack cures, uh, ivermectin and hydroxychloroquine, that of course they're not out there in the business of advocacy. Well, again, that's just not true on Mr Whitaker's part. Let me just quote from Rowan Dean, who said, the jury is in on hydroxychloroquine, it saves lives, unquote. That's not discussion, that's advocacy. Whereas Mr Whitaker just told us that they, of course, do no such thing. Senators, it's not just that Sky News, Murdoch's platform in Australia, has put this out there. Part of the reason we're having this debate is that the platform itself is now massively powerful. It's not just watched by a bunch of far right wing nut jobs late in the evening. It now has a much wider dissemination. That's why Sky has gone onto, news, onto YouTube. And that's why Sky is now being broadcast on free to air television across regional Australia as of 1 August this year. So these, this disinformation is not just an academic matter. It's out there in the mainstream community. The fact that you've got 9 million views a month, that's Sky's own figure uh, through, through their various platforms, is highly significant. The fact that we have one third of those views coming from YouTube is highly significant. 1.3 billion views of Sky content uh, on YouTube over time, double the ABCs, three times that of Channel 9, four times that of Channel 7. So the overall argument we are just, uh, contending with here today is it's not only wrong, it's not only inaccurate, it's not only dangerous, it's not only the fact that the Sky CEO doesn't agree with those conclusions, but that it's going right across at least one third of Australians. And therefore Sky News and Murdoch have a case to answer in terms of their complicity, complicity in vaccine hesitancy in this country. And that is a public health concern for all of us. And what did it take for this to be exposed and dealt with? It took YouTube and Google to finally blow the whistle, not just once, but twice. Once last December, as Mr Whitaker has just admitted, and again in July, before 23 at least uh, YouTube videos had to be pulled down. And so the question again, I believe for this committee when it goes to the management of media diversity is, what was the Australian Communications and Media Authority, ACMA, doing to earn their salary to allow this to occur? They have a direct responsibility here under the law because these YouTubes are being, uh, this material is being rebroadcast on free to air television. So ACMA didn't act. I have corresponded with them as to why they haven't acted. They said that it's within their powers to initiate their own investigation to such matters, which are deeply in the public interest, but they chose not to. And they've pointed me, and I think through all of you, therefore, to the fact that it's a matter for the parliament to change the laws governing um, the Broadcasting Services Act, which establishes ACMA, to enable it to do the job for the Australian people that YouTube instead have had to do instead. I conclude on this, Senators. It's not just this controversy concerning this critical matter of the fair and balanced and factual reporting of public health information. This is one giant snapshot into a much wider cancer in our democracy. We've seen recently with the Four Corners program, the use and abuse of non-disclosure agreements in dealing with accusations of sexual harassment, 
within new news corporation around the world and the fact that uh, people like uh, Gretchen Carlson uh, have said that she can't speak about these matters because of the enforcement of NDAs. Well, the question again for News Corporation, if they're fine and upstanding citizens, is how many of these exist? And as Gretchen Carlson has asked, why can't they be lifted so that she can speak? And finally, of course, it's not just what happens in Metro Australia. It's what the News Corporation media monopoly have done across regional Australia. I've spoken already about regional television now having Sky content, but the action by News Corporation in shutting down 116 local newspapers on the cover of COVID last year was a disgrace. And the pressure and pricing pressure they've now applied to a local community newspapers trying to set up as alternative sources of news is equally obscene. And, the, and what has happened in Mackay with Mackay Regional News attempting to step into the shoes of the Mackay Mercury, which was shut down by News Corporation, having been established way back in 1866, is one of a hundred plus examples across this country where the predatory practices of News Corporation and their use of pricing policies in particular are being used to quash the emergence of even local community voices as an alternative. So my concluding submission, Senators, is these together with the other matters contained in my original submission, in my judgment, create a case as to why the Senate should recommend in favour of a Royal Commission uh, into the future of uh, media diversity in this country. The lifeblood of our democracy, I believe, is at stake. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Mr Rudd. I'll first go to Senator Carr. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Mr Rudd. Look, um, you uh, referred to the correspondence that uh, you've had with ACMAR and their flat-footed approach uh, to dealing with the Sky News After Dark incidents on YouTube. Um, I have... Uh, with your, uh, I, have, I have copies of that correspondence, which I wish to table for the committee's uh, consideration. Uh, if I could do that, yep. Madam Chair. It's, uh, I'm, uh, Mr. Rudd, look, can you just go through what's actually occurred in regard to the correspondence that you sent to uh, ACMA on the 5th of August and the response that the ACMA's Sent back to you the 31st of August, which is the two documents I've tabled uh, today. Thank you, Senator Carr. A, a very brief um, summary uh, is that um, after the news was publicised that YouTube had acted uh, to, on a second strike policy basis, that uh, Murdoch Sky News Australia was in breach of their COVID disinformation policy on multiple counts. The question occurred in my mind as well, what on earth has the regulator been doing? Why are we depending on a private company to do regulator's business? And um, that's why I wrote to ACMA. ACMA then in their correspondence, which you've just circulated, outlined their procedures for handling any complaints they receive, uh, which essentially goes to it being a co-regulation model with the private sector, with media proprietors. Secondly, voluntary codes of conduct being delivered and produced, which third, if there is a breach, then ACMA will turn it back to the individual private media outlet for them to take appropriate action. And only fourthly, if that doesn't occur, will ACMA itself intervene. And ACMA's teeth at the end of the day are very substantial including the withdrawal of a licence if necessary. Why this became relevant, Senator Carr, as you know, is that ACMA's uh, regulatory powers extend to free-to-air television. And at the point at which ACMA, a, a point at which free-to-air television began broadcasting uh, the Sky content, it was then captured within this regulatory framework. Prior to that, because Sky was a digital platform, it, was not, it did not fall directly under ACMA's powers. In fact, it existed in a no man's land between the press council on the one hand and the um, uh, Australian Communication Media Authority on the other. Their response though, to conclude Senator Carr was this. We've received some 34 complaints over time 
about uh, Sky television content. Secondly, um, we are in the process of looking at it. Thirdly, they gave us an example of where in matters of great public interest, they could have self-initiated an inquiry. And quite plainly, in this case, they chose not to. But to conclude, Senator, I find the conclusion of their letter to me most instructive. If the parliament wants us to have more powers in this matter, then the parliament needs to give us those powers. I regard that as a request for the members of parliament, and I think through the parliament to this committee, to consider whether ACMA's powers are adequate. In the absence of a change to their statute, I think ACMA is useless, and this is a case study of how it's useless and should be abolished, mm. and a royal commission should be established to recommend an alternative body. Uh, just a minor, I note there was 37 complaints that uh, referred to in the letter, but it, it doesn't change the substance of any way what you've said. So in your, in your submission that this actually supports the need for a Royal Commission. Now, you've heard from Mr Whittaker that the uh, opponents of that proposition are suggesting that the uh, fact that we now have so many uh, other providers as a result of the convergence uh, or the technology convergence has meant that we don't need a Royal Commission. There has been nine uh, media inquiries to date. What do you say to that proposition? Is that a reason to repudiate the submission from the half a million Australians that have petitioned the parliament? But Senator Khan, my own view is that the core reason we need a Royal Commission is because in Australia, and perhaps most Australians are unaware of this, we have the highest concentration of print ownership for a modern democracy in the world. It is atypical and abnormal what we have in Australia. That's the core point here. The second point is this, that because of what the Murdoch media empire is now doing through Sky, um, it has not just extended that reach into the digital domain and through a whole range of its own digital platforms. It's now rebroadcasting that uh, through major outlets like YouTube. And thirdly, through a new arrangement from 1 August this year, rebroadcasting through the existing commercial television networks across regional Australia. In other words, the media concentration in Australia is getting worse. There's one final, further point as well, Senator Carr, and that is when you look at what's happened with the closure of 116 local newspapers, which Murdoch bought with hand on heart saying they would expand when they took them over from APN back in 2016, 17, they've done exactly the reverse. They've shut them down and tried to migrate some of that on to online, uh, but ultimately killed local news. Put all this together, it actually is deeply unhealthy for the democracy. And finally, where you see the Murdoch Sky model at work, it is precisely derivative of the Murdoch Fox model in the United States in terms of creating a captured audience of, of people from the far right put them in an echo chamber, feed them raw meat, describe anything else which challenges their worldview based on the facts as a global left-wing conspiracy, to make a mozza of money out of it in the process, but then most critically, become this force in Australian politics which captures the right wing of politics, in, in our case, the Liberal and National Party, and pushes them further to the right. And in the case of the left wing of Australian politics, uh, campaigns viciously against them on a continuing basis uh, without any attempt at factual balance in the reporting. For all those reasons, it is at least worth a Royal Commission being empowered to look at the evidence of what's happened, to be in a legal position to call uh, Lachlan Murdoch to actually answer questions rather than being allowed to evade them, and then to come up with recommendations of what is a fair and robust media regulatory model for the future of Australia, given our current regulators have failed. So can I just come back to this point? The Sky has been operating on a regional basis for three years, although I note on their, on their, their, uh, their own uh, website that they claim that's only been from this year. That's their assertion. But I, my understanding is they've actually been operating much longer than that. Is that your understanding, that there's been a period of greater 
engagement with Win TV and other regional providers? My understanding, Senator, is that from 2018, there was an arrangement with one of the regional broadcasters, and as of 1 August this year, it was broadened considerably. That's right. And that just adds to the point of why, or trying to come to some understanding, why ACMA hasn't acted earlier. Now, is it your contention that there would need a further regulatory review uh, in terms of the way in which the parliament responds to the online services that are actually currently operating in this country? Very much so, um, Senator. In a democracy, all of our citizens depend on uh, a free, fair and balanced media to access the information in order to make informed political decisions. Whether you are from the left or from the centre or the right of Australian politics um, or any democracy's politics. And the truth is, given media convergence uh, across platforms from print to digital to um, uh, classical electronic, radio and the rest, what we need is an increasingly uniform set of regulatory arrangements rather than those we've inherited from the past. The Press Council regulates as a industry only regulatory body uh, the guidelines for Australian print media. Uh, and it is, I think most commentators would agree, an utterly toothless tiger. ACMA was established to regulate the Australian broadcasting media. And as demonstrated by this case, in terms of public disinformation on public health, has been demonstrated to be a toothless tiger as well. For the digital platforms, there is a voluntary digital code, as I understand it, but which News Corporation have themselves exempted themselves and said that, in fact, they will adhere to press council guidelines to govern what they should do. So there's this great, as it were, hole in the middle. Therefore, purely in terms of where the media is today, which is across all these diverse platforms, we need common principles, a common regulatory environment, which ensures fair, factual and balanced reporting so that the democracy stays alive and doesn't head down the American road, which frankly scares the living daylights out of me. So that brings me to the question about the delivery method. Uh, your government was responsible for the initial building of the NBN. Is it your view that the NBN has a well, well, what, what is the role of the NBN into the future in terms of media diversity? And whether, uh, and what is your view as to what uh, position the, the public should have in regard to the NBN into the future? The National Broadcasting Network, Senator, was established in order to um, lay out uh, the railway network of the 21st century to give all Australians connectivity, uh, whether you were rich or poor, country or city, so that you could be fully wired. That is, if you were living in Udnadatta, whether you were running a small business in the suburbs of Mackay, uh, or whether you were a small regional hospital in Burnie, that you would be able to have 100 megabits plus per second uh, through uh, fiber optic cable to the to the individual premises to be fully accessed to um, online learning, health services and information to sustain and grow your small business and Senate to have access to news. Secondly, as we know, uh, after the government changed at the end of 2013, the ABBA government killed that model and substituted fiber optic to the node for fiber optic to the premises leaving copper in the ground for the last link, which slows down the entire system. Thirdly, therefore, the NBN is incomplete, as all Australians have discovered through COVID, when suddenly they become dependent comprehensively on broadband to, to live and work and have their being, from ordering the groceries, to accessing entertainment, to online learning, and critically, health services as well. My judgment, therefore, is the NBN should remain in Australian public ownership until such time as we complete the missing link, which is fiber optic to the premises. That is critical if we're going to wire everybody and critically provide everybody with a, another source of diversity in terms of access 
to alternative media platforms on, on fact and on opinion. We've had a submission from per capita. I, I trust that has been sent to you, which basically argues that all media content will be delivered over broadband technology sooner rather than later, with the exception of shortwave radio for emergency services, and that a publicly owned wholesale broadband distribution platform could radically democratise the distribution of media content in Australia. Do you think there's a role to be played for the NBN in ensuring media diversity in this country? Uh, Senator, I think there is potential for that. One of the reasons I've called for a Royal Commission is this involves enormous complexity, given the dynamics of convergence that we've spoken about before, the centrality of the internet to all converging platforms, frankly, and thirdly, the absence of a current regulatory environment to govern free, fair um, and balanced content across the country. Therefore, the backbone to provide it, that is through the NBN, becomes critically important. But I believe a properly empowered and professionally equipped Royal Commissioner could provide a series of recommendations as to what role the NBN should provide within that framework. I go back to my answer to your previous question, however, I do believe that the NBN should now remain in public ownership uh, for a range of purposes. Thank you. And just my final question, Madam Chair, I, uh, Fairfax, uh, sorry, the Channel 9 newspapers today are covering a story about a new campaign that's being launched by News Corp and Sky uh, on climate change. What's your response to that suggestion that there'd be a campaign from on high to affect all outlets uh, for, the, for the, the News Corp uh, empire? Well, Senator, I think it's just a case of greenwashing. Um, News Corporation, the Murdochs have been out there campaigning against climate change action for more than a decade. We've seen this one election campaign after another. Leopards don't change their spots. If anyone doubts what I've just said, uh, remember what Rupert himself said when he said that climate change should be greeted with great scepticism. And when you look at his um, uh, the representatives on Sky, for example, which we've just been talking about, now, Rowan Dean saying that climate change is the biggest hoax of them all, saying again only this year there's been no net warming in the last 22 years, news to me and to the CSIRO and every credible climate scientist. And Alan Jones, the archdeacon of climate change denialism, saying they peddle the climate change hoax that apparently carbon dioxide the source of all plant life is evil, unquote. So therefore, given that's what they actually put out, we've got to greet this with enormous scepticism. I use the term greenwashing uh, deliberately. What they're trying to do, that's why they've obviously leaked the story to Fairfax, as you described them, and Fairfax as I described them, but nine as they now describe themselves, is to say to, shall we say, a certain uh, part of the media market, aren't we fine fellows? we finally decide to green ourselves up by supporting carbon neutrality by 2050, uh, while at the same time unleashing the dogs of war, some of whom I've just named, across the mass media market to continue to fuel fear in the community about any government or alternative government which proposes to take some substantive climate change policy action. That's the real nature of the game being played here, Senator. I think most people who follow these matters closely would see it in a similar light. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you, Senator Carr. Uh, Senator Faruqi. Thank you, Chair, and good afternoon, Mr Rudd. Uh, Mr Rudd, a few weeks ago, you shared an excerpt from a Guardian Australia story where I spoke about being racially abused by Sky viewers following a segment on Paul Murray's show about me. Um, and you said this. Of course, an audience that's fed toxic far-right extremist politics is more likely to send threatening racist emails. Many people who are attacked by Murdoch then receive threatening messages. It's dangerous. Um, I'm just interested in any reflections you might have on the impact of Sky's extremism on people's experiences of racism and bigotry. And do you think there's any appetite at all for News Corp to acknowledge this? And if not, why not? Senator Faruqi, thank you for the question. Um, I noticed carefully Mr Whitaker's response to this matter when you raised it just before. 
uh, which was uh, to put hand on heart and say, I'm very sorry. Uh, but secondly, if you look at their actual operationalization of their editorial policy, do nothing about it. It's analogous to the point I've just made in response to Senator Carr on their attitude to climate change. Pretend to be concerned while still unleashing the dogs of war. Senator, what I've observed in the United States where I've lived for uh, six of the last seven years is through the uh, Sky model, which is Murdoch's Fox network uh, in the United States, that what we've seen are the uh, politics and reporting of racial hatred going through the roof. And as a consequence of that, uh, we have uh, a much more difficult set of political realities on the ground in America than would otherwise be the case. It goes back to what I said before about the Murdoch Fox, Murdoch Sky news formula, which is capture a particular segment of the media market, then ensure that they are quarantined and fed raw meat from the far right, climate change denialism, um, various forms of, shall I say, um, uh, racist abuse, um, then uh, tell that group that anything they hear to the contrary is simply far left propaganda. Uh, and then once having captured them, they turn them into a business model and as a consequence, hold that in their hands as a mechanism, as a battering ram in particular to influence the center right and far right of American politics. And hence what we've seen are those views through the Trump phenomenon capture the old Republican Party and the grand old party, the, the Republican Party, was the party of Abraham Lincoln. It's now being captured by this beast. And the Fox media empire has had a deeply instrumental role in doing that. What causes me fear in Australia, Senator, is the same model that will therefore be applied here. We are simply some years behind where it will go to. But I am concerned about the legitimization of racial stereotyping and racial hatred uh, through Sky. Uh, to give one further example of this, Senator, most recently there was a cartoon uh, infamously published in Murdoch's other uh, news platform, the Australian newspaper, uh, by Leek, the cartoonist. I lodged a formal objection uh, with the press council on this, and the, and the cartoon in question uh, made a mockery of the colour of the current Vice President of the United States, uh, then Senator uh, Kamala Harris. I, surprisingly to me, the press council found in my favour and against uh, News Corporation. What was the response? A bit like their response to being repudiated by YouTube over their coverage of their disinformation uh, on the pandemic. The entire Murdoch apparatus in Australia was then thrown at, discrediting uh, the press council's finding against the leaked cartoon, despite it having been a racist cartoon just like the entire news apparatus of the Murdoch Empire in Australia has been thrown at, uh, the determination by YouTube uh, to label 23 plus of their videos as being uh, flagrant medical disinformation and dangerous to public health. And just like they unleashed the other day against the ABC, when they had the temerity to report uh, Gretchen Carlson's evidence uh, from the United States about the use and abuse of non-disclosure agreements uh, by the Murdoch uh, media empire to prevent uh, women journalists from speaking out publicly about their experience within that organisation on the receiving end of sexual harassment. It's a standard pattern of behaviour. Therefore, will they change? My argument, Senator, is I don't believe they will do so voluntarily. They'll only do so if they are compelled by the weight of Australian public opinion, but also reflected through the deliberations, the evidence, and I believe the conclusions of a Royal Commission looking at this properly and objectively. Uh, Mr. Rudd, just recently in the Saturday paper, you wrote an opinion piece. Um, in, in that opinion piece, you said that Murdoch keeps Sky News view, viewers in a far right echo chamber where they are radicalized and taught to revile their cultural enemies. Um, and I think you have spoken a little bit about this, but who in particular are these cultural enemies? 
Um, is it people like you and me? And, you know, why is it so dangerous for, to have this e echo chamber? Well, the um, let's call it in these terms, Senator, the meta-narrative underpinning this particular far-right attack in the United States, but also globally, and faithfully reported on Murdoch platforms could broadly just be described as the extinction movement. What's the extinction movement all about? Uh, its core argument is that white folks like me, if you like, are slowly being extinguished <laughs> uh, in terms of the mainstream politics of the United States, mainstream society as well. And it's been taken over by a whole range of hostile multicultural forces. And therefore, as a consequence, it's important for white folks to fight back. That's the essence of this appallingly far-right, extremist, racist view of politics. Um, but if you peel back all the layers, that's actually what's at play here. And you see it slowly but surely creeping into far-right politics in this country as well. And I fear for the future of our multicultural society as a result. I fear for our ability to accept as a mature democracy, as we've done in the past, under successive conservative and Labor governments, that, that diversity was a great thing for the future of our country. But now diversity under this particular debate is becoming a dirty word. That's where I fear it goes. And through the echo chamber, it provides more raw meat for this far right constituency. And I fear where it then goes to in the future. A question before was asked about neo-Nazis, about which I found again, uh, Mr. Whitaker's responses at best equivocal when he asked for it to be defined what a neo-Nazi was. Well, for God's sake, I think most of us would know what a Nazi and a neo-Nazi is. It's all about the essential politics of race and the supremacy of one race against another. That's what it's about. And that's why I am passionate about this question as it affects Indigenous Australians and Australians of non-Anglo-Celtic background as well, even though I'm 100% Anglo-Celt myself. Since you gave evidence to this committee in February, Mr. Rudd, a lot more has happened, not least the Sky YouTube ban and the Four Corners investigation, which you referred to earlier as well. Has New Corp's response and approach to being held accountable or not accountable for its journalism surprised you? Um, Senator, nothing has ever surprised me about News Corporation because they regard themselves as a law unto themselves. If we stand back from it all and the discussion we're having today, what's kind of the reality here? Murdoch, through News Corp, basically believe they run this country. They've got a media monopoly. They can tell the far right of Australian politics what to do. They can do their damnedest to keep uh, the centre left from ever forming a government in this country. And they are utterly unaccustomed to being held to any form of account. We've seen before through our discussion today, press councils are toothless tiger by and large, occasional exception. ACMA, they abandon the field on the question that we've been discussing on YouTube just now. And in fact, there being no effective digital governance code, which would normally capture the operations of Sky in the first place. So therefore, we find ourselves where the news corporation entity uh, believes they can just swagger through, bluster their way through discussions like this and Senate inquiries like this, because ultimately they control the shots. Further point, Senator, is this. Most politicians I know in Australia of both the left and the right live in fear of what News Corporation can do to their careers. They can literally crucify you. They run a one week long campaign against something that you've said or alleged to have said, and their objective is to destroy you if you become a person who dares challenge their standing. That's the nature of the beast we're dealing with. Therefore, I've seen no indication on their part that they intend to change their modus operandi, with one little exception. And Senator Carr asked this question before. This little exercise in greenwashing uh, that we see unfolding in terms of, aren't we a bunch of good guys? We've decided maybe, subject to Mr Whitaker's uh, dissimulation today, to embrace a bit of carbon, uh, mid-century carbon neutrality, just to show that we're no longer total climate change denialists. But that's the varnish. The core of the beast hasn't changed. It, it is essentially a protection racket. 
extended to the Liberal and National parties in particular. If you don't do what we say, we'll knock you over. Ask Malcolm Turnbull about that. Or look at the testimony of individual members of parliament, like Ted O'Brien, who says dealing with these branch members every day is like dealing with somebody who's just had a combination of Peter Credlin and um, Alan Jones in their living room. It pushes the whole agenda to the far right. They're used to that. They're comfortable with that. But guess what? The people are speaking through the petition, through other forums, and the people of Australia are saying enough's enough. And when you hear Whitaker, for example, today, blame faceless algorithms uh, operating out of California as being the root cause of our problem here, as opposed to, frankly, the well-known face of a foreign billionaire living in New York dictating our national future. Let me tell you where I think the real problem lies, and that's with the Murdochs themselves. Hence why Lachlan has chosen not to appear today. Thank you, Mr Rudd. Thanks, Chair. Thank you. I'll go to Senator McMahon. Yes, thank you, Chair, and thank you, Mr Rudd. Um, Mr Rudd, have you um, issued any show calls or commenced or in the process of commencing any legal action against Sky News or its uh, parents or any subsidiaries? Well, Senator, on a regular basis, when I'm uh, defamed or believe I've been defamed by any media outlet, I would initiate with an initial statement of legal claim. Uh, some time ago, um, the Murdoch media empire through Sky and Andrew Bolt made a series of uh, claims uh, concerning my position on the origin of the uh, COVID-19 virus from Wuhan in China. As a consequence of that, I instructed my lawyers to write to Whitaker to indicate uh, where I believe I'd been defamed and to seek their response. The matter has not gone to court. That's an accurate description of where we stand. And that's what I would do if I was defamed by any media outlet. I've done so with Fairfax before. I've done so with the ABC before. I'd do so with any news platform um, which uh, defamed my reputation. Uh, so, Mr Rudd, based on that, that you have written to them, um, uh, giving them notice that, that you may seek uh, legal action, um, is it not true then you stand to benefit legally and financially from appearing before this inquiry here today? Come on. Uh, Turn I, on. The, the point of order, mm, Madam Chair. Point yes, of point order. of order, uh, Senator uh, Carr. Just, just, hang, just hang on a second, it, Senator it, McMahon. A point it, of order has been that, raised. That's totally inappropriate to put a question like that to that's the not, witness. That's not totally. a point of order, Senator Carr. Totally well, inappropriate. It's not for you to determine what's appropriate. Uh, well, um, that's why I'm raising a point of order, uh, Senator. It's up to the chair to, to make that uh, deliberation, but that's totally inappropriate question to put that's to this. That's not witness. your call, Senator Carr. Uh, I just, Senate, Senator McMahon, um, I take Senator Carr's uh, point of order, and speak, we, we have to be careful that you're not asserting motivation. Uh, to witnesses, uh, they're, they're here under our invitation and our direction. Uh, this committee asked Mr Rudd to appear. So it is up to this committee. Yes. Uh, so you know, if, you've got a, if you've got a complaint to make about the witnesses that uh, a committee of which you are involved in <laughs> has, then we can take that offline. Mr Rudd, you don't need to answer that question. It's, not, it's out of order. And then, Mr. Rudd, I would ask: Do you believe that you have any conflict of interest in appearing here today? None whatsoever, Senator. Firstly, when I originally uh, put in my submission to this particular uh, Senate inquiry, that predated by nine, ten months, six months, a large number of months anyway. Um, the current matter, which was really only a matter of some weeks ago, in relation to Bolt and the Sky News program. So secondly, this is the point which Senator Hanson Young has just mentioned, here's the letter of invitation from you, the committee, asking me to appeal. I didn't ask to come back, you asked me to come back. Thirdly, what I find interesting, and particularly the comment made before by Senator Anik, I'm sure will be jumping on the same bandwagon soon, uh, is that the only people who have known of the uh, legal action uh, which I've initiated against uh, Sky News over the Bolt matter uh, were myself and Mr Whitaker. So Mr Whitaker, uh, I assume, or his staff have briefed Senator Anik uh, and yourself about the nature of this legal action. I find that quite interesting because I can assure you on the record here, I haven't briefed Senator Anik. 
nor yourself about this particular action at all. So that would suggest to me there's been some discussion between representatives of Sky News and Senator Anik and possibly yourself, given Senator Anik's earlier intervention on this matter. Uh, Mr. Rudd, I would just like to, to clear that imputation against myself. Uh, I raised the matter because of a question that was raised earlier by Senator Antic. So um, I have not been briefed by you. I have not been briefed by Mr. Whitaker. I merely raised it because it was raised by Senator Antic and you have in fact confirmed the information that was raised by Senator Antic. Uh, anyway, we shall move on. Um, uh, Mr. Rudd, you, you recently, a couple of days ago, replied to a tweet by Corey Bernardi. Um, Corey tweeted that uh, Ivermectin shall set you free. You replied um, <clears throat> that Murdoch host Corey Bernardi continues to undermine vaccines by advancing the far right conspiracy theory that dark forces are hiding the supposed real cures for COVID-19. Uh, Mr. Rudd, why did you reply in that manner to Corey Bernardi's tweet? Well, I have an old fashioned view, Senator, which is I actually believe in science. I also believe we have properly constituted scientific authorities. I believe that those properly constituted scientific authorities on matters of public health are A, the Commonwealth Chief Medical Officer, and B, the Chief Medical Officers of the States and Territories. I've also been quite assiduous in looking at precisely what they have said on the, uh, on the status, not just of, um, uh, of the drug you've just referred to, uh, but others, uh, which I would put in the broad category of quack medicines. I've also referred to the fact uh, quack medicines when it comes to the treatment of COVID-19. I've seen also the chief medical officers of the Commonwealth and states, in particular the states, reflect similar views. And therefore, I think it's just my responsibility as a citizen of Australia to push back against any statement by any far-right person or any other person who is challenging the science about these quack medicines on the one hand, as opposed to a proper, uh, tr a proper uh, receipt of uh, the normal series of vaccinations on the other. I think it's the responsible thing to do, Senator. Um, so, Mr Rudd, <clears throat> I'll just point out to you that uh, in uh, Mr Bernardi's tweet, he did not actually mention anything about COVID-19. Now, are you aware of the use and benefits of ivermectin? Uh, Senator, I know that we are currently in the middle of a pandemic. Secondly, it's called COVID-19. And thirdly, there is a debate about uh, these two particular drugs uh, that have just been um, referred to by yourself. And under those circumstances, therefore, as uh, night follows day, when you have an individual such as Corey Bernardi out there promoting one particular treatment, it falls within a much broader context of the uh, campaign waged by some through Sky Television in particular, advocating these as treatments for COVID-19. That forms the basis of my response to Senator Bernardi, who I don't regard as a scientist on these matters. I back uniformly the expert opinions of the chief medical officers, and therefore when people go out there directly or indirectly advocating alternative medical treatments, I will use my voice to back science against what I've described as quackery any day of the week. Well, Mr Rudd, you didn't answer the question, so clearly you're not aware of the uses and benefits of ivermectin. And I did not, in fact, mention two drugs. I only mentioned one, which was ivermectin, which was the subject of Mr Banani's tweet. And you may be uh, therefore surprised to know that um, ivermectin has been used for many years all around the world to treat many conditions horses. in livestock, You're a vet. pets it's used and for horses. humans. Excuse me, Senator Carr. I'm speaking. You'll be quiet. Yeah, order, Senator Carr, Senator, Senator McMahon. But let's also just, I just want to be clear. We do have a responsibility as elected officials not to harm the community. So let's just be clear about what questions we're putting please, forward. Please let me finish, Chair, my line of questioning is that you're obviously not aware that ivermectin has been used all around the world for many years to treat billions and billions of livestock, pets and humans. And in fact, it has treated many, many uh, billions of people 
who had conditions that were previously untreated, conditions like Onchocerca, uh, uh, elephantitis, scabies, strongyloides, leishmaniasis. These conditions are all treated by ivermectin. Many of these conditions were previously, prior to the discovery of ivermectin, considered untreatable. It led to the misery and suffering of billions of people. Therefore, in light of this, and the anniversary of the Nobel Prize being awarded for the discovery of ivermectin, Mr Bernardi's tweet that ivermectin shall set you free is in fact quite appropriate. It has been taken by yourself completely out of context. And I can tell you, sir, that it has certainly set many thousands of people in uh, my home of the Northern Territory free of the debilitating disease of scabies. So I would suggest that you have actually taken this tweet quite out of context without being aware of the many great benefits uh, throughout many years of ivermectin across many species and many diseases. COVID-19 is not one of them, but Mr Bernardi did not ascertain that in his tweet. Um, well, Senator McMahon, you know perfectly well that um, Senate, the former Senator Bernardi was referring to ivermectin in terms of setting people free in the broad context of the current debate about effective treatments of COVID-19. You know that, I know that, and this is what I describe as an exercise in semantics in order to somehow let Bernardi wriggle off the hook. He's part and parcel of a broader Sky News operation, which is constantly at the fringes of or in the centre of the promotion of quack medicines, and in this case, inferring that horse medicine could be used for humans in the current environment concerning COVID-19 is just plain irresponsible. You know that, I know that. That's why I spoke up about it. Um, I just, just, just to clarify, Mr Rudd, you may not have heard uh, the evidence from Mr Whitaker, but Mr Whitaker himself uh, accepted that it was inappropriate and asked for it to be deleted. Yes, I did not hear that, Senator. Senator McMahon. Well, my concern is that you are, you are demonising a drug. All right, you, you disagree about the context in which Corey Bernardi used it. I don't see COVID-19 anywhere in his tweet. I believe his tweet was referring, as I said, to the awarding of the Nobel Prize for the discovery of this drug. Um, I think we need to be careful that we don't get, up, get caught up in demonising a drug that has done so much good for so many billions of people around the world. Senator, what about those people who have taken ivermectin on the basis of this broad advocacy, which they've heard through Murdoch platforms in the United States, and I fear in Australia, with adverse health consequences for themselves in an attempt to treat themselves to prevent COVID-19 or to deal with it if they've already got it? There are many such reports. You know that, I know that. That's why I spoke out. Okay. Um Senator Antic. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, Mr Rudd. Um, I was interested in exploring this degeneration of uh, the relationship between yourself and News Limited. It seems to have spiralled down since 2008. Um, and I'm just interested, if you use some colourful language today, it doesn't sound like someone who's particularly happy with the treatment he's received. Um, I'm not sure if you saw an article written by David Pemberthy in The Australian on the 28th of November last year, in which he detailed some of the interactions that he'd had with you over the years and some of his journalists at the Daily Telegraph uh, had over the course of his time covering uh, politics in that part of the world. Did, were you able to read that? Um, Mr Pemberthy has written many articles about me over the years, Senator, and most of them have been colourful, not a lot of them terribly flattering. So this one doesn't really come to mind. I do note though, Senator, that consistent with what the Murdoch media normally do, rather than answer the substantive matters, which is, is there a Murdoch media monopoly? Has it been abused in terms of its powers? And what its effect is on the democracy? That like the Murdoch media operation, you now engage in questions of character assassination, your questions of me, rather than the debate about the issues themselves. Well, that's I have freedom, that's your prerogative, you're a senator, and that's, about what, and that's what you've been tasked, it seems, to do. Yeah. Well, I'm afraid not. This is actually a question of an article that was reported, which made some 
statements about the manner in which uh, that you used to interact with journalists. They, they seem to suggest that you had a very good run with the press and you've made some statements about News Corp this morning. Uh, and I think it's, it's important in order to colour the evidence that you've given. One of the particular claims you made, so I'm reading straight from the article here, is that um, you had a protracted campaign of vengeance against Julia Gillard as payback for the 2010 coup when he, that's you, would habitually refer to Australia's first female prime minister as, quote, that effing bitch, end quote, in an obscenity-filled background calls to journalists and editors tearing her down. It's a direct quote from the article. Is that an accurate representation of events? Um, well, what I'd say to you, uh, Senator, is that my own reflections on former Prime Minister Gillard are reflected fully and frankly uh, in uh, my autobiography, which deals with this period in Australian politics. You have to help secondly, me I haven't secondly read it. could I say that uh, Mr. Pemberthy, uh, formerly the editor of the Daily Telegraph, and now basically a Murdoch apparatchik writ large, um, would uh, be creative about any of his recollections of our previous conversations, because that's what he does. What I do record most clearly from my conversations, which were many with Mr. Pemberthy at the time, is when I commented to him one day why he had launched in upon a character assassination of a particular member of parliament on a particular day. No friend of mine, no colleague of mine, I can't even remember their politics. Uh, his swaggering response was, quote, because we can, unquote. The issue at stake here is uh, the use and abuse of monopoly powers uh, by uh, media operations such as News Corporation. They use it, they abuse it, not just in relation to my side of politics. Ask Malcolm Turnbull, sir, about uh, uh, his being on the receiving end of the same. So, so you haven't answered the question, though. Is it, a, is it a factually accurate representation? It does colour your evidence. Uh, well, Senator, you can um, speak about uh, conversations which Mr Pemberthy reports that I've had with he or his editors some time ago. I cannot recall the context of those conversations. I cannot recall the detail of them. I don't intend for the purposes of our conversation here to go into them. I can recall what I took out as an impression for my engagement with Mr Pemberthy was that st solid, stark warning to all politicians, which is, um, we can do this to you if you misbehave because we are who we are. And that goes to the direct uh, thrust of the uh, matters before this committee, which is media diversity, monopoly, and the abuse of monopoly power. He says that in 2006, you rang him and said, I presume you saw that in reference to an excruciating press conference Mr. Beasley had had that earlier that day about Rove McManus uh, and the death of his wife. Um, and that you spent a good five minutes telling him that Beasley clearly wasn't well. Once again, I mean, this article is lengthy and it is detailed. I haven't had the good fortune of reading your autobiography, nor do I intend to, uh, but can you clarify whether that's an accurate representation? Well, Senator, you may learn something if you read the autobiography, because it actually contains within it an account of the failings of the Howard government prior to 2007, something which someone on your side of politics would, I think, benefit from, including taking us to an unnecessary war in Iraq. But on the broader question of individual content of individual conversations between myself and individual journalists a decade ago. I don't intend in this discussion here today to comment on their accuracy or otherwise. What is at stake here is the question of uh, whether or not we have the use and abuse of monopoly power. And what we've had, sir, from you today uh, is you joining forces with News Corporation in this particular line of inquiry. Uh, your original statement, Senator Anik, questioning my bona fides to attend here because of my legal objections to a recent, uh, in my view, defamation of myself by uh, Andrew Bolt uh, concerning the origins of the coronavirus, as somehow representing a conflict of interest and why I should therefore be here. I don't seem to, seem to recall you having declared to this committee or to the people of Australia that you're a regular guest uh, on Sky News yourself and that you regularly use that as a platform to advance your own political interests. Well, good luck to you. But if we're in the business of declaring conflicts of interest, then I think it would be good if you began right there. Well, the beauty of this forum, Mr Rudd, is that uh, you as a former Prime Minister, and I make that point, a former Prime Minister, do not get to ask questions of me, a current parliamentarian. So uh, well done, but that's not the way this format works and you well know it. Is this not just a case of, uh, question, uh, of a... Order, order, to your order, order. Senator, order. That's how I'll choose to do so. Order. Um, Senator Antic, I just... Uh, another member of the government 
uh, also wants to ask questions. So just sure. you could make so this one your last, last question. one. Is this, thank you. Is this not really just uh, a classic love story, the falling out of love, one partner, one party simply becoming disgruntled and embittered uh, and taking that cause on further down the track? It seems as though there's a fairly lengthy campaign here and it'd be interesting to know why. Well, Senator, as I've said on a number of times on the public record, my experience of uh, News Corporation is that in the period after the, uh, from the 2013 election to the present, it moved from being essentially a centre-right news, uh, news organisation, uh, which would, at times of federal and state elections, usually support conservatives, uh, but um, more often than not, not uh, do so, but from time to time support either Labor oppositions or Labor governments to a case where over the course of the last decade, the Murdoch media empire in Australia has viciously campaigned for uh, the conservative side of politics in 23 of the last 23 federal and state elections. That was not the case prior to 2010. News Corporation has changed. It has moved from the centre right to the far right. And its principal vehicle for doing so has been, uh, frankly, what we now see unfolding through Sky Television. They are following the model they have used in the United States. I have seen what that has done to the American democracy. So you ask why have I joined this campaign, in fact, had some role in leading this campaign in the last year or two. It's because Murdoch in this country has changed radically. If you speak with former editors, if you speak with former news corporation journalists, many of whom have appeared before this committee during its last set of public sessions, they would agree with the same. That's the reason why I've engaged in this question. And that's why I believe whether you are a centre-right voter, a centre-left voter or a centre voter, all of us in our democracy, those of us who love the Australian democracy, want there to be fair, independent, free and balanced reporting where fact and factual reporting is not conflated with opinion. The Murdoch script for the future, sir, is for opinion to become fact, and that's why we end up with the cancer on democracy that we now see. Thank you, Chair. Thank you. Uh, Senator Rennick, you don't have much time. Okay, thanks, Chair. Um, Mr Rudd, are you familiar with Barry Marshall? Well, Senator Rennick, you asked me curious questions last time about my role in politics 30 years ago in Queensland. Um, Enlighten me, who is Barry Marshall? I've got no so idea. Barry Marshall received the Nobel Prize in 2004 for proving that stomach ulcers were caused by bacteria. Uh, and that one of the people that uh, uh, capitalised on his uh, success was a guy by Thomas, a guy by the name of Thomas Barodi, who basically came up for a cure for that bacteria that has resulted uh, in saving the lives of tens of thousands of people um, and is an extremely distinguished, uh, distinguished um, gastroenterologist in Australia. Now, he works alongside a guy by the name of Robert Clancy, who's a uh, distinguished immunologist, who in the 80s uh, invented a vaccine that reduced acute bronchitis by 90%. He established a link between uh, upper res uh, respiratory tract infections and the gut, uh, hence why he works with Thomas Barodi. Now. They also are in agreement with Wendy Hoy, who's a Queenslander, who works at the University of Queensland, who's got an Order of Australia for her research into chronic diseases. All three of those very distinguished medical scientists believe that ivermectin does actually uh, aid in reducing uh, the impact of COVID-19. I'm not saying it does. I'm just quoting what those people are saying. Um, and that is on top of the work by Kylie Wagstaff from the Monash University, who about a decade ago proved that ivermectin inhibits the RNA virus, the COVID virus, from getting into the nucleus and replicating. Just to be, now, just to be clear, Senator, those, we've got to get to the question, I mean, Senator Rennick. So, okay, so, so the question is, I, I, I think you owe those people an apology for calling them quacks as to what their views are, given that they have got lifetime careers, uh, ex extremely uh, distinguished lifetime careers in their work, um, and to call them quacks, I think, is an insult. Would you be prepared to retract your statement? Um, Senator, I have an old-fashioned view, which is I believe in the science. I also have an old-fashioned view that when we have chief medical officers who are responsible 
for reaching informed decisions on the application of the medical science to the public health of the people of Queensland, for example, where you are a senator, that we should listen carefully to what they say and uh, act accordingly. I know for a fact I am not a scientist. I know for a fact that you are not a scientist. I know for a fact that Senator Anik is not a science scientist, nor is Senator McMahon, notwithstanding her own lengthy um, uh, presentation before on the virtues of the science as she described the potential applications of horse medicine to humans. But the bottom line is this. Um, our responsibility as a public figure in Australia is to back in what the science says, whether that's on climate science, whether it's on pandemic science. And when I see the Murdoch media empire backing uh, treatments for COVID-19 for this pandemic, uh, and given the fact that our chief medical officers radically oppose that advice, I believe I've got a public responsibility, not to give it some partial tick on the way through, but to repudiate it comprehensively as a possible cure or treatment of this insidious uh, pandemic. I've done that okay. before so, by sorry, describing... Sorry to interrupt you there, but I just need to correct the record. I talk to the and Senator, I will do it again. I, 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 it is I, I, quack medicine. Order, order, uh, okay. order. Okay, sorry, Senator Rennick, yeah. Senator Rennick, have you got a follow-up question? Okay, my, my follow-up question is, is that the TGA, I talked to the TGA and I talked to a number of people in the government, in the, in the health department. Senator Rennick, have you got a question? Uh, just to be oh, clear, oh, Mr Rudd has made it absolutely clear he is not a doctor, he is not a medical expert, neither are you. So I'm just wondering what evidence you would like out of Mr Rudd. Okay, then he shouldn't be calling people who are scientific doctors and experts quacks. That, that, okay, is he prepared to retract the statement? That is my question, yes or no? Um, Senator, the, use the, the term quack is spelled Q-U-A-C-K. It's been used to describe um, medicines and potions uh, put together by um, uh, charlatans to treat a particular condition. My view, backed up by the chief medical officer of this country, is that anyone who seeks to advertise these treatments as being effective against COVID-19 is engaged in quackery, they are quacks, for which I make zero apology. So you're calling these people quacks, just to be clear? I think my most recent response, Senator, to your question just now was fully clear. I just, uh, th yeah, thank you, yeah. Mr. So, Rudd. So you've got no respect for uh, science at all. Uh, okay, Madam, that's all I need Madam, to know. Thank you. Thank Sorry, point of order, he, Senator. No, he, no he's, I think uh, our, our colleague has retracted, so we'll might as well press on. Okay. Um, Senator Rennick, just to be, is, have you finished? Uh, I'm fine, thanks, Chair, thank you. Okay, thank you. Yeah, um, point of order, Chair. Uh, yes, Senator McMahon. Point of order. Um, Mr Rudd has just said that I'm not a scientist. I would like that corrected for the record. I am in fact a scientist. And I also did not advocate using a horse medicine on humans. Ivermectin has many legitimate uses in human medical conditions. I would like that put on the record. Okay, uh, and to put on the record, COVID-19 is not one of them. Uh, Correct. Good. It is becoming a bit confusing what the government's position is on all of this, I must say. Um, uh, Sen Mr Rudd, I've got some final questions and I know we've kept you um, over time. I'd just like to uh, know you, you indeed, you've written to ACMA and uh, uh, raised your concerns about a number of the uh, stories and uh, incidents of um, disinformation. Um, you understand the process when you write to ACMA as, and put in a complaint is that they then refer that matter to uh, the broadcaster themselves. Um, have you had any response from Sky News in relation to your complaint? Not that, not that I'm aware of, um, Senator. As you describe the process contained in the correspondence between myself and ACMA, that I think is accurate. That is, A, they receive a complaint from a member of the public, in this case myself. B, they refer it to the, um, uh, the media organisation in question. C, they then act or don't act. Um, and then D, it seems to me from the letter from ACMA, 
that the ACMA then waits for the member of the public, in this case myself, to re-notify ACMA that nothing has happened mm. in order to trigger a further round of activity by ACMA, if any at all. Mm. It strikes me as a bizarre process. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, and in relation to uh, the deletion, further deletion of other uh, video content, um, we know that YouTube have uh, deleted off their platform um, a number and then uh, Sky have uh, self-censored, in Mr Whitaker's uh, words, another 18. Um, what's, do, you, do you have any uh, thoughts on to, as to why they may have done that? My experience of uh, the Murdoch media in general is that they will only act when they believe that finally the regulators are coming down against them, finally believe that the regulators are coming down against them, uh, and that they believe more broadly that their corporate reputation may then be at stake. So after the initial, as it were, finding uh, by uh, YouTube, uh, they then uh, in, must have initiated their own internal review of the rest of their product on this question of COVID disinformation. Um, given that uh, we don't have a full and frank accounting of the process which Sky News then went into, we can only speculate on that. Mm. But I think, Senator, it goes to the broader question that uh, when we have, um, frankly, regulatory ambiguity on this question, then we have ACMA saying that at best it has weak regulatory powers. To me, what the correspondence from ACMA suggests is uh, the Parliament should reflect on how uh, the Broadcasting Services Act can be amended to make those power, powers more robust and the procedures, frankly, clearer because ultimately the penalties available to ACMA are huge. They can withdraw someone's licence. It's getting from the complaint to that point, which seems to be lost in a Byzantine tunnel uh, of, um, of uh, obscurity, in which I think our friends from News Corporation seem to have become past masters at extinguish the li extinguishing the light. Mm -hmm. uh, thank you, Mr Rudd. And, and just for clarification, um, you may not have been aware, but Senator McMahon uh, is a trained vet. So that's, that's probably her, um, uh, that's why she took issue with, with your um, description. Um, I have a huge amount of respect for vets. Um, and, and I thank um, uh, you for uh, alerting me to that. Uh, but furthermore, I also know that veterinary scientists will be the last one to provide definitive judgments on whether or not a particular veterinary medicine should be used for human purposes, particularly on a virus such as the one we're dealing with, COVID-19. Mm. Uh, thank you very much for your time uh, today, Sorry, Mr. Can Rudd. I, can and I, just I point something out there that Professor Doherty, who received a Nobel Prize in 1996. Sorry, Senator uh, Rennick. Sen Senator before. Rennick. You don't. You do not have. You do not have the call. Uh, thank you. We, we're finishing up here so that we can go and have a short lunch break. Uh, Mr. Rudd, thank you for your time. And if there's other questions, if if um, if that was Senator Rennick, Rennick on the line there, if you've got follow-up questions, of course, all of our witnesses uh, can take questions on notice. Uh, thank you very much, Mr. Rudd. Thank you very much, Senator Hanson Young, and to all senators in this important committee's work. Thank you. So we will now suspend until 1.30. Recommence. Thank you. I now welcome officers of the Department of Infrastructure, Transport, Regional Development and Communications and the Australian Communications and Media Authority. Thank you for being here today and uh, thank you for uh, shuffling uh, the time of appearance for us. I understand that information on parliamentary privilege and the protection of witnesses and evidence has been provided to you. I remind all senators that the Senate has resolved that an officer of a department of the Commonwealth or of a state shall not be asked to give opinions on matters of policy and shall be given reasonable opportunity to refer questions asked of the officer to superior officers or to, or to a minister. This resolution prohibits only questions asking for opinions on matters of policy, it does not preclude questions asking for explanations of, of policies or factual questions about when and how policies were adopted. For the Hansard record, could we please get you to state your full names of the capacities in which we, you appear today? And we might start with 
the ACMA first, and then we'll go to the department. Thank you, Chair. Narita O'Loughlin, Chair, Australian Communications and Media Authority. Thank you. Thank you. Deputy Chair, Australian Communications. Thank you. Could you ask her to put some headphones Kathy Rainsford, General Manager, Content and Consumer Division, Australian Communications and Media Authority. Thank you. Just, we might just, just hang on a second. It's Ms Chapman who's feeding back. Ms Chapman. Um, you, do you have headphones in? Are you able to put some headphones in? Um, no, is that causing, causing reverberation? It was, yes. That seems to be better. That seems to be better now, so we'll, we'll see how we go. Okay, sorry, uh, continue. Uh, Chair Richard Windia, Deputy Secretary, Media and Communications, Department of Infrastructure, Transport, Regional Development and Communications. Thank you, Mr. Winyan. I think, Ms. Sullivan, you've, you're on mute, but I think from the small picture on the screen, I can see your lips moving. Yeah. Apologies, Senator. We'll get this sorted. Um, Pauline Sullivan, First Assistant Secretary, Online Safety, Media and Platforms Division in the Department of Infrastructure, Transport, Regional Development and Communications. Great. Thank you. Swift chair movements there. Um, who else have we got here? Uh, Mr Macon? Uh, Mike Macon, Assistant Secretary, uh, News and Media Industries Branch in the Department of Infrastructure, Transport, Regional Development and Communications. And Mr. Potkins. And Jason Potkins, Acting Assistant Secretary, Copyright Content Branch in the Department of Infrastructure, Transport, Regional Development and Communications. Thank you. Uh, now, um, ACMA, do you have a short opening statement? Yes, Chair, I do have a short opening statement. Okay, Thank let's you. go to you first. And uh, sorry, before I. I do that. I just ask, Mr. Windyer, are you do you does the department have a statement to make, or are you just here to ask questions if need be? Uh, no, Senator, we don't have an opening statement. Okay, great. So we'll just go to ACMA. Thank you. Thank you, Chair. News and current affairs on commercial television and radio in Australia are subject to co-regulatory arrangements legislated in the Broadcasting Services Act 1992. These arrangements replace the former model of active monitoring and direct regulation of content by the then Australian Broadcasting Tribunal. The co-regulatory scheme is designed to provide the discipline of independent oversight of compliance with codes while protecting news and current affairs from any undue influence of a government regulator. The regime puts the responsibility directly on broadcast media to meet community standards. Broadcasters must balance the important right to freedom of speech and expression while protecting audiences from harmful content. Under the co-regulatory arrangements, codes are developed by industry bodies representing broadcasting sectors. Codes cover such matters as advertising, classification, and most relevantly here, the presentation of news and current affairs. After public consultation, codes are registered by the ACMA if it considers that the code provides appropriate community standards for the matters that it covers. Licensees are required to have mechanisms in place to comply with industry codes of practice, as they are in the position to exercise control over their service, including editorial content of news content. Complaints made to the ACMA are referred to the broadcaster in the first instance to resolve and take action where they identify they may not have complied fully with their code of practice. And a complaint may come back to the ACMA if the complainant is not satisfied with the broadcaster's response. <laughs> we can also commence our own investigations into issues where we're made aware of serious allegations or significant public concern through complaints, our own intelligence, media reporting or other sources. For example, in 2019, we conducted an investigation into coverage on Australia's commercial, national and subscription television broadcast services of the Christchurch terrorist attack. Where there is a breach of the code, the ACMA negotiates with the broadcaster to take voluntary steps to address problems and avoid future breaches, or we can seek court enforceable undertakings. 
If there is a repeated or systemic breaches of the code by a licensee, the ACMA may impose a new licence condition. If the ACMA considers there is an industry-wide problem and a code is deficient, it may put in place an industry standard. Licence conditions and standards, once applied, provide us with stronger judicial responses, such as remedial directions, civil penalties and licence cancellation. The co-regulatory scheme, the codes of practice, our investigations and our findings are all made transparent to the Australian public. But we recognise that other models exist. Minimal intervention models, such as in the US, where the First Amendment rights are given primacy. Self-regulatory regimes, such as that which applies in Australia to print and online publishers and is overseen by the Australian Press Council. The former Australian Broadcasting Tribunal model, which had an active monitoring and direct regulatory powers, and the UK model, where codes are set by the regulator and cover all broadcasters, including the BBC, as well as commercial broadcasters. Changes to the current model would be a matter for government and the parliament. In the meantime, the ACMA will continue to diligently apply the co-regulatory model for which we currently have responsibility. Thank you, Chair and Senators. Thank you uh, very much, and thank you for appearing today. Uh, uh, as you know, um, this particular hearing um, ha has been generated off the back of uh, the debate in relation to the YouTube's uh, suspension of Sky News and deletion of their um, a number of their videos. Just for the record, uh, Ms O'Loughlin, has ACMA uh, received any complaint in relation to any of these videos or content? Uh, Chair, we're not aware of the content uh, that has been taken down by Google. We have not been informed of the specific pieces of content. Uh, we did um, ask Google that question. Um, and they did not provide that information to us. Um, I can say that over the last eight months, we've received uh, 37 complaints about COVID-related Sky News reports. Um, of those 37 complaints, 24 of those uh, referred to broadcast material and uh, provided contact details. And we were able to uh, refer those uh, complaints back to the broadcaster as, is, uh, as the co-regulatory model requires us to do. Uh, to date, none of those have come back to us for further investigation. We had nine additional complaints that referred to online content and were inquiries, and obviously online content is beyond our remit, uh, so we have not dealt with those. We also had three anonymous complaints, and anonymous complaints are difficult for us because it's very hard for us to refer those on to a broadcaster for resolution, so they're still um, on the uh, our deck at the moment to see what the broadcasters do with the complaints that have gone to. Mm -hmm. and, and we have one complaint uh, that is, uh, uh, which was actually from the 5th of August 2020, which we have investigated and found no breach. Uh, okay. <clears throat> um, so how many, sorry, just so that we're clear, how many active uh, complaints do you have on your books? Uh, at this point in time, we uh, uh, are waiting for 24 reports, referrals back to the broadcasters to be responded to, mm -hmm. but we don't have any active investigations at this time. Mm -hmm. um, and are those 24 um, uh, complaints uh, or referrals, we, how would you prefer us to, to refer to them so that we are all speaking on the same and Paige, do you, do you refer to them as referrals or do you refer to them as complaints? Uh, complaints that come to us uh, can be a mixture, and you're correct, uh, Chair, they can be a mixture of inquiries and complaints, but we're happy to call them complaints. Okay. Uh, what we say about referrals is when we have referred those complaints to the broadcaster, because those complaints haven't gone to the broadcaster in the first instance, uh -huh. or may not have. Yes, okay. So, well, let's call them all complaints, and um, I'm, I'm hoping in good faith that we don't we don't miss anything based on that terminology. Uh, 
Oh, you can correct me if, if you think that something falls out the scope and, when, and we should be thinking about that. So out of these 24 complaints, um, specifically in relation to content published by Sky News, just, I'm just clarifying there. Yes. Yes. Uh, were these complaints in relation to the uh, publication of uh, content that includes misinformation or disinformation uh, in relation to COVID-19? Uh, they were specifically in relation to COVID-related Sky, uh, Sky News reports. Mm -hmm. uh, and what are the nature of the, of the complaints? Uh, there's quite a variety of uh, complaints, but I might, um, if I may, uh, ask my colleague Cathy Rainsford to give some examples of the complaints that have come to us. Thank you. Um, yes, Chair, as, um, as Ms O'Loughlin mentioned, there is quite a variety in there. Um, some, uh, we've had some that um, are quite generic um, and refer to misinformation um, on the whole. Uh, we've had some which were expressing dissatisfaction um, at comments made by um, presenters, um, allegations of downplaying the danger of COVID. Um, uh, it's probably, um, uh, I mean, there, there's a list of 37 um, mm -hmm. going back to the start of 2020, but that's probably a, a mm -hmm. reasonable summary of the, the types of complaints mm -hmm. we've had. And are they referring to uh, disinformation and the promotion of COVID lies and conspiracy theories by hosts on Sky News or simply the inverted commas experts that they invite on board? I think it's a mixture chair of um, uh, opinion and commentary made on a variety of programs. Mm -hmm. um, and if someone, uh, if, if, if a Sky News uh, article that you have a before you in your pile of complaints uh, is an article that is promoting that particular uh, horse drug should be used for curing COVID-19. What, what, in what context uh, is that allowed? Uh, Senator, in terms of the subscription television code of practice, uh, the, and, and we would investigate matters that came to us against those codes. Uh, so uh, most relevantly, I think the subscription television code talks about news and current affairs programs, must present news accuracy fairly and partially, but also clearly distinguish the reporting of factual material from commentary, analysis or simulations. So in looking at what came to us, we would have to uh, consider whether firstly this was a, a, a news program or whether it was uh, factual information being put forward or whether indeed it was commentary uh, in, the, in the context of a program. So I can't really speculate on particu particular issues, but they're the types of things that we would look at when the program content, um, when we looked at the program content. But accuracy is an important consideration uh, yes, that's included in the code, mm -hmm. that um, subscription television broadcast licensees must present news accurately, fairly and impartially. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, how about um, minimising harm to the community? Um, I think that's probably implicit in the provisions in that code, Chair. Mm, implicit. So there's grey in there, is there then? Uh, no, Senator, uh, no Chair, I didn't say that. Mm -hmm. I said that um, the code sets out provisions which go to minimising harm to mm -hmm. audiences, including those provisions around mm -hmm. news and current affairs. Mm -hmm. So if a news 
uh, agency like Sky News was to promote the use of a drug that has been disproven, uh, that is not, necess not, not necessarily safe uh, for uh, uh, self-medication, that is resulting in, uh, as recently as the last few days, uh, individuals uh, appearing uh, at hospital with overdoses. Um, where does the um, li where do you draw the line? If it's not accurate information and it's harming the community, how do you determine whether there's a breach? Senator, that would be a matter of us to consider when the piece, specific piece of content came to us. And as I said earlier, there is also provisions that commentary needs to be separated from um, fact. Mm -hmm. uh, so. Uh, from sorry from news, so you've got a mixture in these programs of and on the on the Sky News platform of news and current affairs programs and of commentary and analysis mm -hmm. programs, and the code directs us to deal with those uh, both in different ways. And uh, the um, program run by uh, or the ho hosted by Alan Jones. For example, let's take that as a specific because we know that's one of the um, uh, videos that has been taken down by uh, YouTube. Um, what category does that fall into? Is that uh, chair? As I said at the outset, we we have not been made aware of the specific programs that have been taken down by YouTube. Uh, but in a general sense, uh, those programs would be considered current affairs okay. programs involving commentary analysis and quite often um, straight news at the top of the hour. Uh -huh. um, so let's take your 24 cases then. Are any of those complaints in relation to Alan Jones? Uh, I believe so. Um, I believe that we've had uh, a number of complaints uh, quite recently in regard to uh, the, of those 37 complaints, seven were about a broadcast of Alan Jones on 12 July 2021, during which Mr Jones interviewed uh, uh, Craig Kelly MP, and I think that was the circumstance referred to uh, by the Sky News CEO this morning, mm -hmm. where a correction was made both online and on air. Are there any other complaints in relation to Alan Jones? Um, I might ask my colleague, Kat. Thank you. Uh, yes, um, Chair, the, uh, of those 37 dating back to the start of 2020, in addition to the seven Ms O'Loughlin just mentioned, there are a number of others that were complaints um, about uh, Mr Jones' show. Mm -hmm. Um, could we have uh, a list of the 24 complaints currently uh, uh, in play? Do you have them um, now? Um, I expect we could provide you with a list, um, Chair. Yes, uh, that would be Obviously helpful. not of the complainant's information, but the, the, no, the no. complaints that are before I, I, us, of course. I, I think we, you've, you've told us that you don't have information as to uh, what uh, videos uh, Sky New of Sky News were taken down by YouTube? Well, we know which ones they are. Uh, so we will <laughs> uh, we want to know what yours are, so we can see whether they are the same or whether this is a systematic problem. Uh, Chair, my only uh, we will certainly look at providing that on notice. My understanding from the discussion today is that. Some of those uh, videos uh, that were taken down by YouTube date back beyond this year and go to last year. Um, I just clarified the 37 complaints that we've been talking about are from the beginning of this year to August. So we might need to go back a little further in, um, in providing that information okay. to you. That would be helpful. Thank you. And at the very least, we could have the ones that you are referring to from this year. Of um, course. And so can I just, I just want to be clear what the process is here. So you get a complaint 
you say, OK, well, we'll give that to the broadcaster. They can uh, look at it, uh, deal with the complainant, and it doesn't come back to you unless uh, the original uh, person who complained or raised issue brings it back to ACMA. Uh, that's correct, Chair. So the, the co-regulatory regime uh, uh, provides the opportunity to, for broadcasters in the first instance to address the complaints of their audiences. So many complaints would, of course, go to the broadcasters directly, um, mm -hmm. and uh, some proportion of complaints come to us, and we refer them to the broadcasters mm -hmm. so that they can deal with those. If a complainant is unsatisfied with the broadcaster's response, then that complainant may come back to us for us to consider whether the matter needs um, investigation. Mm -hmm. um, so at what point then, or there is no point, uh, of which ACMA actually takes an active role in making sure that broadcasters adhere to the code uh, and their responsibilities? Chair, we don't have we don't have a monitoring role. We have uh, a role which uh, our, our um, responsibilities are enlivened when a, a, a co when a complaint comes to us mm. in this area. And when you get the complaint, do you go, OK, well, we've got this complaint. Yes, we'll obviously have to refer it to the broadcaster, but we will take the complaint and put it alongside what the obligations are to consider whether there is even any validity in the complaint. To be disconnected uh, no, Senator. Um, our role would be uh, to provide the broadcaster the opportunity to respond to that complaint. So we would provide that complaint to the broadcaster in the first instance. <laughs> um, so, Senator, may I, um, it's Karina Chapman here, may I add to that? Um, the codes of practice do require the broadcaster on receiving that complaint to advise the complainant that if they're not happy with the response, that they have the ability to go back to the ACMA. So yes. it is, it's not completely passive. No. Uh, I understand this is the process and you're working within the regulations you have. Um, but I find it astonishing that there is such a drawn out process without any real active role for you as the media regulator uh, to even consider whether a breach has occurred. Um, and we're talking about the distribution and promotion and publishing of information that puts people's lives at risk. I just well, Chair, I, we would look at we would look at that complaint when it came back to us. But as my, I said well, at the outset, in, in, the, in the meantime in the, also in, in <laughs> I think that when it comes back to you, there's, in the meantime, thousands and thousands of people who have been fed misinformation and dangerous information in relation to their health. Senator Carr. So how many complaints have come back to you? Of the 37 we discussed earlier, uh, Senator, we have none that have come none. back to us at this stage. And, and but, but that's in... Yeah, OK. So over what length of time? That's from uh, January this year to right. August this year. So, so do you have any, uh, in public service language, KPIs on how long does it take to actually assess a complaint? Uh, we set internal uh, investigation uh, frameworks around uh, four to six months. Four to six months. Do you regard that as adequate? Senator, the um, co-regulatory regime uh, gives the broadcasters, once we have referred the complaint to them, a period of time to respond to that complainant. For example, with the ABC, All that's right. 60 days. Yeah, I think I understand. And then at I can that understand. point, I'm the sorry, complaint comes yeah. back to us. I can understand the point you're making. Um, and I've read the correspondence you sent to Mr Rudd, which we've tabled here. So I'll just be clear, no complaints have returned to you this year. How many returned last year? Oh, Senator, I'd probably have to take that on notice well, well, unless my well, colleague might be able to find oh, okay, it. OK, OK. All right. Uh, but I think it would be reasonable for me to assume that you'd have a rough idea 
how many complaints were returned to you in the last year. You, you don't have that information? Uh, let me just... Senator, if you can give me one moment, sure. I should be able to find that information for you. Thank you. Um, I ha well, sorry, I have the detailed information from 2020 to 31st of August. Yes. So, for example, with commercial television, uh, we had uh, 1,280 complaint, uh, inquiries and complaints come to us. Yes. Uh, we had around about 283 which were outside jurisdiction, so that would be for matters that are not covered by the code. Yes. We referred 813 complaints to the broadcasters. Yes. And we had 161 complaints come back to us, so that's across all of commercial television. Right. And uh, subscription, we had 81 inquiries and complaints, 25 were uh, outside our jurisdiction. 48 complaints were referred to the broadcaster and six complaints came back to us that were unsatisfied with the broadcaster's nice. response. That's a very, very small return rate, isn't it? Six out of uh, 81. So, so with national broadcasters, similarly, there were 319 inquiries and complaints, 132 were referred to the broadcaster and 103 came back to us. Mm -hmm. oh, and so, what did you do about those that did come back to you, even though they were a small would, number? Uh, so we, uh, uh, we assess uh, each and every one of those complaints that come to us. Um, in some cases, we launch formal investigations where we seek additional submissions from the broadcasters and mm -hmm. our own investigation um, uh, of uh, the context of the broadcast and also where we need to seek additional information. So, for example, with commercial television, uh, we uh, investigated uh, 22 of uh, the uh, complaints that came back to us. Um, and we assessed that around about 66 of them were not actually, would not have met the bar in the code. So after that initial assessment, uh, we uh, had decided that um, uh, the a formal investigation wasn't required. Mm -hmm. So it really depends on the matter. Okay. And so I should I should explain that um, uh, that I refer to matters and just going back to sure, definition. Sure. Sometimes the complaint may contain many number of matters. Okay. So how many breaches were there in 2020 of all the media outlets in Australia? Um, I don't believe I have that information in front of me at the moment. And I'm looking at Cathy, who's also shaking her head. Yeah, no, I'm afraid I don't have that information either, but we'd be happy to take that on notice Thank for you, you Senator. Absolutely. But would I be right in suggesting very few breaches, if any? Considering the enormous amount of content on commercial free-to-air subscription and uh, the national broadcasters, uh, you would be right Senator, in that most, the vast majority of complaints and inquiries are dealt by the broadcasters and a relatively small amount come to us uh, for further investigation. Yes. But most of those are, 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 in my experience, usually the most complex and difficult ones. Sure. So if we go through that uh, pattern then, and assuming that, uh, that all the online services are outside your remit, that'd be, I've got that correct, correct isn't it? That's so, correct. So I'm just wondering um, what you actually do. Uh, Senator, the ACMA has a very broad remit. This is mm. a small part of it. Mm. We are responsible for uh, uh, various responsibilities under the Radio Communications Act, mm. the Telecommunications Act, uh, Broadcasting Act beyond this, mm. uh, into community television, captioning, Australian content, we also have responsibility for the Interactive Gambling Act, the SPAM Act, the Do Not Call Register Act. Mm. So we have a very broad remit, and uh, this is a part of that remit. Right. Well, let me just go back to Sky, because I want to, I'll come back to that question of how well you fill, fill your statutory obligations. But if we look at Sky, now Sky's been 
operating on free to wear for what three years now in one form or another, although it, it, it has announced that it's had this new arrangement since the 1st of August this year. But it's been three years, isn't it? That's correct. Have you had any uh, problems with Sky operating on as a broadcaster and regional? Uh, so Sky is carried by, uh, has been carried by Wynn in northern New South Wales, Griffith and South Australia uh, since around 2018 mm. and by Southern Cross Austereo in Victoria, southern New South Wales and Queensland indeed since the 1st of August this year. Uh, my notes tell me that we had one complaint about mm. the Alan Jones program, uh, which where the complainant had seen the broadcast on Win News, and we investigated that matter under the Commercial Television Industry Code of Practice. And you're, so, and how did that go? That complaint go? Uh, it was uh, found to be a non-breach. But Kathy, would you just be able to outline to the senators the detail of that? Yes. Um, certainly. So the um, uh, complaint um, related to an allegation that Mr Jones had inaccurately stated that children don't spread COVID, that masks were useless, that shutdowns didn't work and insinuated that COVID was a hoax. So we looked into those matters um, under a range of provisions in the um, Commercial Television Industry Code of Practice. Um, uh, my uh, my uh, I understand we found um, uh, some of the allegations were not to be breaches. Um, we did find some um, some concern around the um, accuracy of some of the statements, but in that uh, correction had to be made. Um, the the way that code operates means oh, that nice. that um, it's not a breach. So, okay, so in that case, you said there was a correction made now. I just want to be clear then, in three years of broadcasting Sky after dark and the like, the news was presented as accurate, fair and impartial. Is that the proposition you're putting to this committee? Uh, Senator, we can only uh, uh, respond to that in terms of the investigations nice. that have come to, for, so to us. So because there was no complaints, it met the criteria. Is that what you're saying? Uh, if um, if there were complaints and they were provided to the broadcaster and the complainant was satisfied with the response when it got to the broadcaster, it wouldn't come to us. I would just also clarify that, of course, um, Sky News, uh, because it's carried on Foxtel, has been uh, uh, has uh, been covered by the subscription yes, but television this code is, of practice. But it changes news. once it. The point I'm making is. Once Sky is broadcast on a free-to-air service, circumstances change. Yes, Senator, and there is a different code for free-to-air broadcasting. That's right. And Sky News needs to comply. That's or right. Or as the licensee of carrying it, That's right. needs to comply with that, that free-to-air code of practice. And, yes, we and, agree. And the subscription standards are very different from the free-to-air standards. And therefore, as it is being carried by a free-to-air licensee, uh, they must comply now with that free-to-air code, right. and they have needed to comply with that free-to-air code since 2018 but, when okay. it was begun to be That's carried. Fair enough. And so, however, it still relies upon a complaint being received by you before you'll take any action at all. That's correct, Senator. Thank you. So let me just be clear about this then. Uh, if we go through the evidence we presented this morning, the broadcast codes of practice uh, operating the last 10 years... Um, ACMA has found there's been no breaches of Sky for 10 years. Is that right? Under the subscription television code of practice, yes, and That's more right. recently under the free okay. code. Correct. So I'll put it to you, how adequate do you believe the code is in that circumstance? Uh, well, Senator, we registered the code some time ago. If mm -hmm. there are uh, concerns about the code and the way it's operating, uh, that's a matter that would... Uh, you know, we could uh, we could consider. No, that's uh, not. But we yeah, have very few. Yeah, we have very right. few complaints that come to us, no, 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 Senator. Is, and we is, investigate yeah, those. I'm sorry if I'm not making myself clear. I'm asking you, as uh, what do you call yourself, the co-regulator? Is that what it is? Uh, you're a co-regulator. Regulator. Yeah. Um, I'm asking you, as you're a professional in this field, I'm saying I'm asking you for a professional opinion. 
uh, how adequate is the broadcast code in the light of these facts that we are uncovering? Senator, as I have said, we have received very few complaints. Yes, yes, but that's the point, isn't it? That it's, it's not, let's be very clear, um, Ms O'Loughlin. Um, we're not asking you about the number of complaints. We've heard that. What we're asking is whether uh, Sky News, free to air, uh, as opposed to just on subscription television, uh, is abiding by their obligations. We do not see evidence before us, Senator, right. uh, Chair, That's through the complaint process okay. that they are... Mm. But you don't look for it, do you? We do not have a monitoring role. No. That's right. So is it the... Uh, do you have any evidence that uh, Sky's uh, arrangements are in fact consistent with a highly responsible corporate culture? Is it uh, possible that... Uh, the arrangements are in fact working really well, that the reason you don't have any complaints is because there's nothing to complain about. Um, Senator, I can't speculate on why no. people make complaints. They no, but watch you, programming, you, yes, they complain yes, 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 but you are an experienced uh, operator in a field. I'm just wondering if there's some other explanation other than the gross no. inadequacy of the current regulations. Senator, all media companies are required to comply with a range of regulation, including these codes. They well, then, put in place okay, okay, editorial. Right they put in place editorial and other controls to ensure that they comply with the okay. code. So why is it then that YouTube? Unlike, yes, I'm, I'm coming to that. Broadcasters, unlike YouTube, are responsible for the content on their platforms and exercise editorial control over that content. So, that's so you've got a private open. company like YouTube that takes action to, to try to manage misinformation being distributed on their platforms, and you haven't done anything in terms of your obligations to manage misinformation. Senator, they're quite different regimes. Now, so, explain to me, does that not reflect okay. a gross inadequacy in the current regulatory framework? No, I do not believe it does. I believe it reflects the very different business models uh, for the, in regard to YouTube and editorial content on Sky News as a broadcaster. So, um, YouTube okay. has, through an algorithm, decided that there is uh, some content without the context around it some content that causes them concerns under their own established uh, rules for people on their platform. So They have made yeah, that decision okay. and they do not have the sort of escalated powers that we have to do anything but take that content But you down. haven't and used any of your powers, have, have you? Your pa have because we have not had complaints that have come to mm. us which have required us to exercise those powers to date. So to be clear, your view is the self-regulation model works really well um, the, you, may, you don't really need the powers because you never use them. I did not say that, Senator. I just I wanted to be... The co-regulatory... I'm just trying to be clear as the, the view of the The, the co-regulatory co regime has been in place since 1992, um, as we've indicated, that that is a matter if, if, the, if society and the parliament and government does not consider it's working effectively, then that right. is a matter for thinking about what a different okay. regime so, would be. So it's down to us. Well, that's a fair enough point. We'll, we'll need to take up your advice in the report. Now, ACMA, uh, you do have... You're responsible for the Broadcasting Services Act uh, in terms of the codes of practice. Now, I'd particularly like to draw your attention to Section 123 of the Broadcasting Services Act, which provides yes. for appropriate community safeguards. Is it your view... Is it ACMA's view, I should say, not your personal view, but ACMA's view, that the various codes that operate at the moment provide appropriate community safeguards so that we can be satisfied that Section 1234 of the Broadcast Service Act is actually being implemented? Senator, we make the call when we register those codes that those codes provide appropriate consumer safeguards for the matters that are covered in those codes. Is it not the case that YouTube's decisions on Sky's content in fact demonstrate that the codes are not providing appropriate community safeguards? 
I don't agree with that, Senator. I think YouTube has made decisions on content that we have not seen. So they have taken an approach of uh, removing content. Um, I don't know what that content is. I don't know whether that would have been caught by our codes of practice. I see. Um, and I don't have before me the complaints that would enliven us to investigate. Mm, right. So you're dependent entirely on what complaints are before you. We've got that message. Now, in regard to your considerations, though, you presumably do have the capacity to uh, look at the operations of the Act. Have you given any consideration as to whether broadcast standards on the COVID misinformation is in fact necessary under 125 of the Broadcasting Services Act? Uh, Senator, as I indicated in my opening statement, we have uh we have a power called an own uh, motion investigation where we can investigate matters of significant consumer community right. concern. Uh, we did that in 2019 when all we right. looked at yes, all the that. content um, across broadcasters uh, in regard to the Christchurch terrorist okay, attack. So on the we question... have not seen that we have not seen that level of concern nor that level of complaints uh, in, in in on this matter. Uh, at this time. So let me be clear then. The last time you initiated one of your own investigations was the terrorist attack in Christchurch by an Australian in which 51 people were killed. Is that what it takes for you to actually initiate your own inquiry? No, Senator. At that time, we wanted to make sure that all the broadcasters were dealing with that content appropriately. So oh. it was a whole of industry uh, investigation. Well, uh, is there a case? for uh, the ACMA as the lead regulator uh, to consider what is uh, important in safeguarding uh, community health in the midst of this pandemic? Well, Senator, I think that the uh, current codes, particularly where they uh, uh, go to uh, fair and accuracy in news, non-misrepresentation uh, of viewpoints can actually cover uh, those types of issues and indeed um, uh, those are the complaints that have come forward to us and those that we will investigate um, uh, as they come to us uh, after the broadcasters have the opportunity to respond. Well, and when will that be? Uh, they have, uh, uh, I'll be corrected if I get that uh, wrong, but I think they've got 30 days to respond. Um, sorry, if I can just clarify there, under the Broadcasting Services Act, the um, broadcasters generally have 60 days in which to deal with complaints before them, after which if they have either not dealt with it or the complainant has received a response but is not satisfied, they can um, come back to us. So possibly in two months down the track, after dangerous information has been distributed, uh, conspiracy theories are putting people's health at risk undermining the work of health professionals, uh, our doctors and nurses across the country. Uh, people are dying and maybe in 60 days time, you might get to look at a brief. Chair, I think that's a very unfair representation of our role. Well, you tell me, also you tell me, uh, Ms O'Loughlin. The broadcasters are responsible for the content on their, in their programs. They are given the first uh, and the responsibility for that underlines their editorial control over that, pro of that programming, and therefore they need to deal with those programs first. They come back to us if they don't uh, live up to the compact they've made through their codes of practice. Um, what's the point of having these uh, standards and obligations if you can't actually enforce any of it? Well, we can enforce, um, well, Chair. Um, we have a range of Powers, but you uh, haven't. But you haven't. Through. But you haven't. You haven't shown us any examples uh, where you have. And what we've seen is YouTube have deleted videos that they uh, have explained uh, to be dangerous, to be uh, uh, a risk to people's health, to the safety of the community. Uh, and you're saying that's because they operate under a different set of um, a, a different mechanism. Exactly. Meanwhile, Senate. the ACMA sits on its hands. Chair, we 
um, apply the co-regulatory framework that applies to broadcasting and has done since 1992. Um, the actions of YouTube reflect that they have an algorithm which monitors content, which looks into content. We do not do that. They also do not have any other powers as we do for negotiation with the broadcasters, impossible undertakings, license conditions. They have none of those administrative processes over to them. So they have taken the approach of removing content as a response to the content that their algorithm or their reviewers see. Um, and that has resulted in, uh, I don't know the numbers at the moment, but you know, 20 or so pieces of content being taken down. We, okay. yeah. So is it your view that you have adequate powers to ensure appropriate community standards, particularly in As regard I, to the online world? Uh, in terms of the online world, uh, that's a separate uh, uh, discussion, Senator. Uh, mm -hmm. We have been working with the uh, platforms, as I think Google indicated this morning, in the development of a misinformation and disinformation code of practice mm -hmm. that is currently a voluntary code of practice, mm -hmm. which has been signed up by a number of the large digital platforms. And that goes to uh, the types of things we've been discussing here about not just broadcast content, but content across the board which may mm -hmm. appear on digital platforms. And most of that will not be broadcast content. I see. There's so, so, but in terms of the current regulatory regime, content. you are working on a voluntary code, are you? Self-regulation code, are you? The, the government's response to the digital platforms inquiry um, uh, asked us to work with uh, the digital platforms to develop a voluntary code of practice, and that is what they have done and has been in place since earlier this year. I see. What's to stop you becoming completely irrelevant in this process? Well, I think, Senator, um, we will always be relevant as a content regulator. Uh, we administer the regulatory regime and that uh, results in any number of investigations getting done each year and any number of breach findings and any number of compliance actions are mm -hmm. uh, all voluntary actions by broadcasters. Right. So I think we remain extremely relevant as a content regulator and we'll do so into the future. Right. In terms of the code of practice, we put out a very comprehensive piece of work in June 2020, which went to what the regulator, what the content regulator expected of those uh, digital platforms to inc in improve in that voluntary code. So a bit encouragingly, I think they have done enormous amount to develop a code that uh, meets some of our expectations as the contract regulator. All right, let me just be clear about your view, because uh, we'll have our view, but this is your opportunity to put your view to us. Do you feel that you have the right range of powers to act on issues in a timely manner? the so-called mid-tier powers? Senator, I think we, we have been given uh, a set of powers by the parliament that reflect the co-regulatory nature of the framework. Um, I think if, if, uh, if the community or the parliament is unsatisfied with that set of regulatory powers as it pertains to a co-regulation framework, then that would be a matter for those powers to be changed. But we find that uh, while it may be sometimes frustrating uh, in terms of negotiation with broadcasters to get them to uh, respond to complaints, to change their practices, it remains the case that it makes sure that the broadcaster is the one at the centre of responding to and being compliant into the future right. uh, rather in, than it being driven by a government regulator. OK, so let's have a look then. Do you believe that you have the right toolkit to address breaches of the broadcasting codes in a timely manner? Uh, as I said, Senator, I believe that we're given the right set of powers for a co-regulatory framework. So you're satisfied with your the current regime um, never ask a regulator if it wants more powers, Senator. Why um, not? But Why not? That's, 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 that's our job. That is our job. Because I'm going to ask you a few more questions in a moment. But the powers that we, sorry, Senator, the powers that we have, I think, are appropriate. Yes. All right. Okay. Now, look, you you're, you have to work with what the Parliament gives you. Now, we have a political response to that. You know, namely, 
the powers are there to protect certain interests. Right, and that's, that'll be the nub of my concern here. I'm wondering, do you have the power, for instance, to order on-air corrections? Uh, no, we do not. Thank you. But broadcasters do do on-air corrections, and as indicated by Mr Whitaker this morning, the Sky News has indeed done that, mm -hmm. and um, on a number of occasions, as has the commercial broadcasters. Do you have the power to act on misinformation, for instance, inaccurate COVID-19 information, quickly? Uh, the codes of practice uh, contain uh, relevant clauses around accur accuracy and impartially in news and current affairs. Do you? Uh, so mm -hmm. Can you act on them I quickly? Think I think what you're asking is, can I take programming off air quickly? No. No. Now, um, I'm just wondering... That would be inconsistent with the regulatory regime mm. that applies, See, has applied it, it's been put, It's been put to this committee that, in fact, your agency should, in fact, be abolished and we should start again. What do you say to that? Senator, as I outlined earlier, we have a broad range of responsibilities across telecommunications, radio communications, spam, do not call, etc. I think when calls are made about abolishing the ACMA, I think what they're really asking for is whether or not the current regime of co-regulation works and what are the alternatives. And the alternatives, as I identified in my opening statement, vary from the model in uh, the United States, where there is actually no regulation of news and current affairs content, except in very uh, specific circumstances, to the Canadians, which is a model, a model very much like our own, based on regulation, to the United Kingdom, yeah, it's a model very much uh, uh, of our own, with the difference that the regulator actually develops the code. Mm. So we're not alone in Australia of having these types of co-regulatory arrangements being in place as a model that works for the Australian community. Um, if there was a choice to do something uh, different, and, and I might add that obviously there are codes of practice that cover the national broadcasters, which are developed by those broadcasters without the ACMA's oversight, nor do we register them. So, you know, if rather than a discussion, I think, around whether we should be abolished, I think the conversation is what is the right regulatory framework? Um, and then, as the regulator, we would apply it. Thank you. And can I ask the department, um, is the, there was a discussion at last estimates about the process in terms of uh, regulatory reform, particularly the digital platforms inquiry. Uh, what, what, where are we at with in terms of the government's commitment to proceed to implement a new platform neutral harmonised media regulatory framework so as to ensure uh, effective and, and consistent regulatory oversight of all entities involved in content production and delivery in Australia. Where are we at on that matter? Um, thanks, Senator. So I think um, I think the comment that the um, that was the government made at the time in responding to that is that there would be a staged approach taken to uh, that um, that particular recommendation. So, and I think there are um, there are a range of things that are going on or have gone on. Rest begin, which move in the direction of harmonisation or at least making sure um, there are arrangements that apply across different types of um, different types, of, even if the actual arrangements are slightly different. Um, so, uh, and for example, um, there has been work under, so we've, we've had work underway in relation to the world of classification, which has resulted in some um, uh, activity um, picked up, for example, in the new Online Safety Act with respect to online content. Um, we've got a range of other things underway, the media reform green paper. Um, there are so I suppose there are quite a lot of things going going on. We've also, um, as you'll right. be aware, a number of things, uh, or the government's done a number of things with respect to considering the content regulatory arrangements in terms of um, broader Australian content and screen content regimes. So there are a number of um, there are a number of 
uh, things underway. There is uh, with respect to harmonisation, but it's not a it's not a sort of simple one size fits all kind sure. of answer. So, would we see any specific measures being taken on the question of online service regulation? Uh, Senator, I think there have been steps taken in that regard already. Um, I would point to, for example, the quite significant uh, step taken in the most recent Online Safety Act, which expanded and extended a range of regulatory powers to capture um, online platforms with respect to a number of different types of online harm. Um, I'd also point to the, um, uh, the disinformation misinformation code that Ms O'Loughlin referred to previously as being um, a significant step into mm. getting forms to turn um, to focus and um, consider and, and in fact develop a code to deal with misinformation on that platform. So, but you've got voluntary codes in those areas, but ACT made it to remit over online services. Is there a proposal to provide that regulatory power? Is there a power in terms to provide a formal remit over disinformation to, to actually ensure compliance on the questions of disinformation? Uh, any measures in terms to give ACMA mid-tier powers? Is there any measures in terms of media literacy? Where, you know, what, what are we going to see on those specific measures as distinct from these broad, let's have a look into this uh, approach that you've outlined today? Well, Senator, I think the, the Misinformation, disinformation code, voluntary as it is, is indeed a significant, um, significant step. Um, it was, uh, I think, even the ACCC and the Digital Platforms Inquiry observed that we are taking steps into territory, into new territory, and there is a need to um, uh, step carefully. We have, at this point, got a voluntary code in that space, but if that code proves to be Effective, then obviously a different approach could be um, could be adopted, but it's early days for that voluntary code at this point. Mm. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Ms. Uh, O'Loughlin. I just want to go back um, to you for a moment. Then I know Senator McMahon has a few quick questions. Uh, we heard from uh, Mr. Whitaker from Sky News earlier today uh, that he said there were no complaints from the public in relation to uh, the videos and the content that uh, is in question. Um, you've told us that you have forwarded some 20 odd up to 37 uh, complaints uh, to Sky News. How can, how can he tell, sit here and tell us that he's received no complaints from the public? Uh, Chair, um, I don't want to verbal Mr Whitaker, but I think he was referring to complaints about the content that YouTube has uh, raised concerns over. I, as I have said, I do not know what that content is, and I do not know whether or not it's the same content, the subject of which the complaints, that, the 24 complaints that we talked about. Again, our complaints go from January this year to August. Um, I note that there's some referral to content from last year, uh, and we can provide that data, but at this stage I can't comment on whether or not the complaints we have were uh, about the content that you two took action against. Um, has Sky News replied to you in relation to any of the referrals you have uh, sent? In terms of the 24 for referrals. I don't believe um, at this stage uh, uh, we have had any complainants come back to us after Sky has considered the matter. How do you know Sky has considered the matter? Considering the matter after they've considered the matter. Um, I, all uh, broadcasters um, are required under the codes to take complaints handling seriously. Yes. I expect that the complaints that have been sent to Sky News will be taken seriously. But how do you know they We can, can also... I, I didn't say they had Senator. I said that they will be with them for consideration. Yes. And uh, how do you know whether, whether they are doing that? They have obligations on the code to do so. Hmm. 
except that you don't hear anything back unless the complainant re-complains. Uh, correct, and they can also complain about whether their complaint has been handled effectively. Yes. So you don't actually it's part know. Of the regime. You don't actually know whether Sky has taken any of this on. Uh, it's a trust us. Adds, no, Senator, no chair. It's a co regulatory framework which requires broadcasters to take complaints seriously and deal with them seriously. And we have seen no evidence to date over many years that any of the broadcasters do not take mm. complaints handling seriously. It's their audiences, after all. It's in their best interest to deal with those complaints and concerns effectively. Okay. H however, uh, one of the complaints that you have is in relation to uh, the report uh, on the 29th of July. Isn't that correct? Uh, 20... I was, uh, are you referencing the Alan Jones report on the 12th of July? Well, let's go with that one. Yes? In what regard, Chair? Sorry, yes. I missed the question. Uh, so, the Alan Jones report. So, you've referred that to Sky News, have you? Uh, yes. There, of the 37 complaints that we indicated up front, seven were about the broadcast of Alan Jones on 12 July. And have you heard back from Sky News in relation to that? Uh, no, they have, as Mr Ainsford pointed out. Um, uh, 60 days under the code to respond to those uh, complaints, and we would expect that they are uh, uh, doing that um, within that time frame. Except that Mr Whitaker tells us there's been no complaints from the public. Uh, no, Chair, as I said, I, I believe, and you need to check with Mr Whitaker, but I believe that Mr Whitaker was referring to the content that was taken down by YouTube. I am not aware whether the program that was broadcast on Sky News was indeed content that was taken down by YouTube. I do not know. I do not know what that content well, is. Paul Whitaker told us himself that Sky News had taken, that uh, YouTube had taken down a number of videos of theirs, and they've taken down an extra 18. So, um, Senator, can I, can I just intervene here? The material that um, Ms O'Loughlin is referring to um, of the interview with Craig Kelly was removed by Sky itself. Mm -hmm. And I think that was prior to the YouTube action of removing videos. Mm -hmm. um, why did Sky News take down 18 other videos that YouTube uh, that fell outside the list that YouTube have taken down? Are those 18? Sky, are those 18? Chair. Are those 18 videos in relation to complaints received via the ACMA? Uh, Chair, as I've indicated before, we do not know and have not been provided the content that was taken down by YouTube. Okay. Therefore, I can't say whether they were the subject of complaints okay. that came to us All right. of well, the same programming that was broadcast on Foxtel. Okay. Well, I'm not talking about the YouTube ones. I'm talking about the ones that Sky News took down themselves. If you can please get us the list of complaints that you have received and forwarded to Sky News, uh, because uh, then we can work out uh, how many there actually are. Thank you, Chair. We certainly will do that for you. Senator McMahon. Um, thank you. Thanks, Chair. Um, just really quickly, um, for ACMA, could you just detail really quickly what enforcement powers you do have? Um, thank you, Senator. So, as I indicated in my opening statement, uh, whether a breaches of uh, codes of practice in the first instance, uh, we voluntarily work with the broadcasters for them to improve their uh, internal practices to make sure that those uh, breaches do not uh, occur again. We can also <coughs> accept court enforceable undertakings from the broadcaster for the matters uh, uh, that um, uh, cause the, um, to ensure compliance in the future. If we then find that there are uh, systemic issues or um, ongoing issues of concern and ongoing breaches, then we can apply an additional licence condition uh, to the licensee. Um, and, uh, and if 
we see that a code across the board, across the industry, has failed, then at that point the ACMA can develop a regulated standard. It's only at that point that uh, additional powers kick in, either for a licence condition or a standard uh, where we can have administrative and judicial responses such as remedial directions to the broadcasters, civil penalties um, and indeed licence cancellation. So in the case of a, a really serious breach or repeated breaches, <clears throat> a broadcaster could actually face you having their licence cancelled, is that correct? In extreme circumstances, that is an option available to the SMA. Uh, thank you. And I just wanted to, to ask you, because I, I feel like some of my colleagues don't, don't quite understand how it works. Um, with a, a private corporation um, such as Google, they have the right to say, I don't like this content or I don't like that person um, or I don't like the way they're presenting. Therefore, as a private corporation, I will, I will cut them off, I'll ban them, I'll temporarily suspend them, I'll do whatever. Uh, but you, as a statutory body, do have a very regulated process that you need to go through and that you need to stick to that process um, as a statutory body. You, you can't just arbitrarily go, um, oh, I'm going to suspend you for a week because I don't like what you said. Is, is that a correct characterisation? Uh, Senator, um, YouTube has uh, use policies um, which it makes public to all their users. It expects their users to comply with those. Um, and it indicates that uh, it may, in circumstances, take down that content or at, at least, or indeed, suspend people from their platform. That's not the regime that we have. As you And, and it also goes to, in the, in the broadcasting space, these broadcasters exercise editorial control over their content. They are the publishers of that content. So they are responsible for making those decisions in a framework that puts the responsibility on them uh, and then gives us powers to work with them to uh, ensure compliance. We do not have any powers under law to do things like stop programming, uh, we do not. We are specifically not allowed to review programming before it goes to air, except in the case of children's programming. Uh, so, as you said, it's a it's a very different regime, and it's it's a regime that has been in place for any number of years. Thank you. That, that's all, Chair. Thank you, uh, uh, Ms. O'Loughlin. Just a final question, just to be clear: the ACMA are an independent agency. Yes, Chair. So in terms of uh, the questions that we've asked you today, you've been able to answer freely without uh, view of government direction? Yes, Chair. Mm. Uh, and so everything you've put to us today is in the view of the independent regulator? Absolutely, Chair. Mm. Okay. Uh, thank you. Thank you for your time. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Um, I now uh, welcome... Oh, we might just need to just take a, a, a short, short suspension while we get our next witness on the line. Again, okay, thank you. Uh, I now welcome Mr Peter Marshall of the United Firefighters Union. Uh, I understand that information on parliamentary privilege and the protection of witnesses and evidence has been provided to you. For the Hansard record, could you please state your full name and the capacity in which you appear today? Yes, thank you, Madam Chair. Um, my full name is Peter James Marshall, and I appear in my capacity as National and State Secretary of the United Firefighters Union. Thank you. Um, I now invite you to make a short opening statement, uh, recognising that you have been before us once before. so. Uh, we'll, we'll be able to get on to questions pretty quickly, I think. Thank you. Thank, thanks very much, um, Madam Chair. I actually circulated the introductory statement um, for the benefit of the Senators. Um, I think it's been um, distributed. Can I ask that question? Yeah, it has. Okay, thank you. I appreciate that. So you're happy to go straight to questions then, Mr. P uh, Mr. Marshall? 
Uh, if I could, uh, Madam Chair, I wouldn't mind just going over some of the content yes. of the ETF. Okay. So thanks, Madam Chair. What, what, can I start now? Yes, go ahead. Yeah, thank you. So on the 18th of uh, December 2020, uh, the U of U submitted a submission into this inquiry. And then on the uh, 12th of March 2021, uh, I attended a hearing uh, in Canberra and we tabled an additional 13 documents, Madam Chair. Uh, essentially, to uh, go over those uh, documents, uh, uh, they detailed five uh, complaints to the Australian Press Council in detail, uh, detailed the effects of uh, what we allege is uh, vilification of your few members. Um, most importantly, we detailed an independent inquiry, a final report from the Honourable Ray Finkelstein, dated 2012, into media and media regulation. We also tabled a uh, Melbourne University Law Review uh, by the Honourable R. Finkelstein um, titled Liberty, Privacy, the Media and the Press Council. Um, to just recap cap briefly, Madam Chair, um, our December submission actually had 113 articles by the Herald Sun, uh, which consisted of the following. 84 articles within a 60-day period more than 20 front page stories in a 30 day period, distribution of tens of thousands of Herald Sun stickers uh, inciting uh, the public against professional firefighters through 858 Victoria news agency outlets in the lead up to the 2016 federal election. We also um, made five complaints to the Australian Press Council between 2000, uh, sorry, December, uh, 23rd of December 2015 and July 28, 2016. Um, we talked about the Finkelstein inquiry and we brought to the attention of the, um, uh, this Senate inquiry, in particular on page 219, 90, uh, paragraph 11.44, and that's the recommendations for a statutory body to replace the Australian Press Council. Um, on page 219, um, the inquiry recommended a new council that's free of influence, in other words, the executive government. Uh, and it also talked about guaranteed funding, uh, as well as being able to enforce its recommendations. All those things were found not to be available to the Australian Press Council. Um, so we, we actually uh, highlighted our experience and then uh, put forward what we'd say would have prevented some of that um, uh, if the Finkelstein inquiry's recommendations had been put in place. More recently, since my last appearance, I'm sad to say that um, there's been further conduct by the Murdoch Press uh, it's outlined in our most uh, supplementary decision at submission on the 11th of August 2021. It gives uh, graphic examples of how um, the Herald Sun, the Murdoch Press, is continuing that vilification, grossly misrepresenting the position of the union. If I could go to paragraph 11 of my original submission and talk about um, one of the things the Herald Sun uh, tend to engage in is that they will contact you for comment after the article is already written. Um, and it will usually be late in the day and it's virtually ticking the box. Unfortunately, um, I'm not to illustrate here a graphic uh, example of even when they have contacted us and asked for written comment, we have provided for written comments as illustrated in, um, on the Friday 16th of July. I'm not sure if that's my microphone, um, uh, 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 Madam Chair, but um, am I making that noise, Madam Chair? Sorry. Uh, no, we can hear you fine. Thank you. Um, so we were kind of, the UFU office was contacted by the Herald Sun asking a, a number of written questions on 16th of July at 1.50pm. The union turned around a response in less than two hours, approximately two hours at 3.56 on the same day. And as you can see, the questions are quite inflammatory. Um, we have had it confirmed from multiple sources that as part of an IBAC investigation, several computers were seized from the UFU in recent words, weeks. Our response in writing to the Herald Sun was, no, this is not true. Further, we were told that both Peter Marshall and David Hamilton are currently on leave. Our answer was, they are both on annual leave. And then it goes on to say, we both, uh, we with Peter seen leaving Victoria from Melbourne Airport? The answer was, this is not true. Uh, and then the Herald Sun goes on to say, can I ask, when is Mr Marshall expected to resume his role? 
when his annual leave is finished, is what our written response was. Is his leave in any way connected to the Inver IDAC investigation? The answer was unequivocally no. When is Mr Hamilton uh, due to be returned from leave when his annual leave finishes? Is, is his leave in any way connected to an IDAC investigation? The answer is no. Now, despite that being given to the Herald Sun in writing, the story appeared on the 19th of July, originally at 8.30pm, which grossly misrepresents the position that was given to the Herald Sun in writing. Grossly misrepresents our position. For some reason, the Herald Sun decided to take that down from the electronic version, and then put it to a print version on July uh, the July 21, both uh, published and uh, also through the media. And if you have a look what the uh, article says, in late June, its investigators were seen attending the UFU's office in Brunswick Street, Fitzroy. Now, they were told that's not true in writing, but they print that. The IBAC activity comes as uh, FRB Commissioner Ken Block, UFU Secretary Peter Marshall, and President have all taken leave. They were explained that we were on the end of leave. They never asked us about the commission. Union members said that the sudden leave of Mr Marshall, who was last month re-elected to top job in was highly unusual. In a bulletin to members, the UFU advised that Mr Marshall was on a period of indefinite leave. It's simply not true. The bulletin didn't say it at all. This is a speculation Mr Marshall has been told to side aside, stand aside by IPAC while they, IPAC while they investigate. Now, yeah, there was no investigation. As we, we answered, their, um, we answered their, uh, uh, their question in the first one about the union office being raided the last couple of weeks. Uh, then we go on to say David Hamilton expressed to a few that he is having real trouble dealing. Now, this is all manufactured rubbish. But most importantly, even when the Herald Sun subscribe to fair and equitable uh, principles of asking for the comment from the other side, and they provide that in writing, they simply then don't repeat what is given to them in writing. And I suppose my point here in summing up, if I could, um, Madam Chair, is that there were 17 articles published since our last appearance. Only three of those articles, there was an attempt by the Herald Sun to contact us for comment. Only three out of 17. And this is why we say that given the fact that we have no recourse, absolutely no recourse with the Press Council, as, great, as illustrated in the Finkelstein inquiry, as illustrated in our experience, um, and, we, and I've already explained, uh, Madam Chair, that defamation is not open to us because um, there's a, a legal barrier for us as being an organisation. But this organisation has no accountability. And even when, out of three occasions out of 17, one of those occasions they ask for written responses, we give it to them, they grossly misrepresent the answers. They don't put our answers. Now, that's not in accordance with what they're supposed to do um, if, within the Press Council's principles. But most importantly, if the Press Council was able to make the Herald Sun accountable and abide by those guidelines and principles, then it would be, it'd be something we could do about it. Um, and I suppose I've finalised by saying, look, Apologise for saying, look, we actually uh, have had a relentless campaign by this organisation against us. Um, and we're not saying don't print stuff. What we're saying is do it in accordance with fairness and equity, and more importantly, in accordance with what the Press Council prescribes. But, but at the end of the day, this is an organisation that has no accountability because we cannot. We cannot bring them to account, as is illustrated. Now, this is after the extensive scrutiny from my previous appearance in the inquiry that you're chairing, Commissioner uh, uh, Senator, this is, has been a non scrutiny and yet this organisation behaves in this way against that background. Anyway, there might be some Th comments. Thank, thank you, Mr Chair. Marshall. I'm, I, I've got questions. Senator McMahon has some questions and Senator Carr. We'll go to Senator Carr first. Yes, uh, Mr Marshall, have you attempted to have this the particular article that you've highlighted, where your transcript of evidence presented, and I understand you distributed that material uh, membership bulletin uh, to highlight that. Have you had any response from the Herald Sun to the clear inaccuracies that are demonstrated in that report? Well, um, Senator, no, the answer is no, um, because despite us giving our answers in writing, so there was no misunderstanding. Um, they went ahead and published uh, totally uh, inaccurate information. So the answer is no. Mm -hmm. 
And you say since your last hearing there have been 17 additional articles, of which only three, and I take it one of those three was this particular matter, where there was an attempt to contact the union directly. Is there a campaign of vilification underway being run by the Herald Sun against the UFU? Um, Senator, one can only conclude that to be correct, but that vilification can only occur in a vacuum where there's no enforcement or accountability against the Herald Sun. And that's, I suppose, the main uh, point we're making through these submissions is there is, uh, they can, the Herald Sun can engage in a contact, uh, conduct of vilification, but the recourse for an organisation such as the one that I'm Secretary of, uh, there is none, and that's my point. Mm. So you'd like to see the press council replaced by a model outlined by Finkelstein back uh, in 2012. Do you, do you, I just want to be clear about this. Do you think that model still holds up, given how long ago it was that uh, Justice Finkelstein actually recommended those uh, or made those recommendations? No, thank you, Senator. Senator, we've been following this inquiry with quite some interest, obviously. Um, to see what other organisations have experienced uh, against the Murdoch press. Uh, and I find it um, absolutely breathtaking that the issues canvassed in the Finkelstein inquiry are virtually identical um, to, um, with the respect for this inquiry, for what this inquiry is actually finding uh, is taking place. And uh, if it had been put in place, and they're still open for a recommendation for a statutory body to replace the press council. Um, um, if it had been put in place, there would be recourse. So yes, we, we say very very strongly that those recommendations still stand and are still available. And we respectfully submit that that will put a balance back in what is clearly an imbalanced situation with enormous circulation of that press. There is no accountability. That's a recommendation would be fiercely resisted by the current media proprietors. Um, what do you think the prospects are of a securing a, a statutory authority such as that that's outlined uh, in your, your uh, submission? Well, I think it's very much achievable. And um, uh, my understanding is a lot of reform comes out of Senate inquiries such as this. Um, but more importantly, there's a glowing deficiency. It's been illustrated in the current structure, if you like. Um, and um, this would be resisted, of course, but I've got to ask the question, why would it be resisted if you were actually complying to what you were supposed to comply with? The only time that this would be enacted is if someone was doing something wrong. Um, so I don't see why they would actually push back other than the fact that they don't want accountability. Well, I'll let my other... Yes. I'm talking about, when I say they, I'm talking about the Metal Press. Yep. Look, I'll come back to other questions to see how we go. Thank, thank you. Oh. Senator McMahon, are you there? Uh, yes, I am, <clears throat> Chair. Um, uh, thank you, Mr Marshall. Thank you for uh, appearing here today. Um, can I just ask you, you made five complaints to the Press Council with no outcomes. Uh, what, what does that mean? Were those complaints dismissed or not investigated? What, what does no outcome mean? Um, thank you, Senator. Um, in, in my previous appearance before the Senate, I um, tried to explain, and probably not um, too well, as to what actually happened. And that is we made uh, five complaints with 113 articles. The Press Council um, ended up coming back to us over a period of time saying, look, we haven't got the resources to be able to deal with that volume of complaints. And as I explained to my previous um, appearance, the volume of complaints was not because of the union vexatiously put in complaints, it was the extended of vilification. So to answer your question, the press council said, look, give us one or two, we'll fly them up the flag and see what happens. We just end up withdrawing from the process. Okay, so you actually withdrew uh, those complaints in the end, so they weren't mm -hmm. investigated? We didn't withdrew the complaints, sorry, we didn't withdraw the complaints, we just gave up pursuing it because there's just no outcome. Okay. Um, all right. Uh, just um, onto some some questions that were raised in your submission uh, for myself. Um, would would your movement into regional fire stations? Um, would your members moving into regional fire stations? Would that displace 
any CFA volunteers from those stations? Um, uh, Senator, I'm happy to answer the question. I'm not quite sure if it's in the remit of this inquiry, but the answer is no. Okay, so it would definitely not result in any CFA volunteers um, uh, being um, cut from those stations or having hours cut or anything like that? The answer is no, Senator. Okay, yep. Um, and then going on to uh, the policy of seven on the ground, uh, does that apply to all fires? No, and I thank you for raising that uh, question because that's one of the complaints we had uh, as an article that was run by the Herald Sun during our initial complaint. And uh, the Herald Sun, um, the Herald Sun actually, the Herald Sun actually uh, printed that um, no fire could, sorry, there couldn't be a commencement of firefighting operations until seven professional firefighters were on the scene anywhere in Victoria. Now, that was just untrue. It was a lie. Uh, so the answer is no. Okay, so it, it, um, it would be still quite possible for, depending on the scope of the fire, for, say, two, three or four firefighters to attend to and control the fire. Is that the case? Um, uh, Senator, are you talking about volunteers or career staff? Uh, well, um, g give me an idea with, with both. So we have no control on what happens with the volunteer fire services, and can I say very clearly they do a great job. Uh, and, of course, it comes down to availability. But what I do understand in relation to career firefighters is that in accordance with the UK Home Office report, uh, which was a government report, it looked at the health and safety of firefighters. And what it found was to be able to do the job safely without the firefighter putting their life at risk, they needed a minimum of seven on the fire ground to commence firefighting operations. Now, uh, that is achieved, if you like, not instantaneously here uh, in fire rescue footprint. Um, usually there's two trucks or there is two trucks dispatched um, and they don't all arrive at the same time, but not long after they arrive, and therefore there's seven on the ground. But as I said, that's within Fire Rescue Victoria's area. It's not in CFA's area. We have no control over that. Senator McMahon, I am wondering how this relates to the media diversity inquiry, but I'll, I'll let you go for a little bit longer, but we do need to finish up. It, it, is, in, it is all uh, information that's in their submission, Chair. Mm -hmm. OK. Um, yeah, but Senator McMahon, this so just was a, sorry, just the, hang on a second. Just, if I could put just a bit of context. Look, there was a long-standing restructuring of the Victorian fire services, and it has been secured. A legislative change has actually gone through the Victorian Parliament. Uh, the references in the submissions went to the articles which were misrepresenting the position, not that they were actual matters of fact. Right. You have the call, Senator yes. McMahon. Yes, thank, thank you. Um, so, Mr Marshall, could you have a situation where a fire was attended by, say, uh, two professional career paid firefighters and two or three volunteers? Is that something that could happen? No, because there's a predetermined dispatch, uh, Senator. It's done by computer aid dispatch. So when a call comes in, if it's in the FRD the, the area, what happens is that the computer automatically selects two fire trucks to send. So um, it would never be the case that there would be two firefighter, career firefighters attend the fire on their own. In relation to the volunteer system, as I said, we have great admiration for the volunteers, but uh, their attendance is predicated by their availability. Uh, and sometimes uh, because of the work-life pressures that's occurred, um, in recent times and the availability of people to give the volunteer organisations, uh, sometimes they find themselves put in uh, very much in danger because they haven't got enough crew there. But as I said, that's outside Fire Rescue Victoria's the moment. And could you also tell me what um, commence operations means when you say that um, if firefighters are called to a fire, um, um, they will commence operations um, but there has to be uh, seven on the ground before they actually start fighting the fire. So what what does commence up? What sort of things would they be doing as part of so, commencing operations? Um, so the 
Adeline Fire Report uh, from the UK, which I'm happy to provide you, actually talks about the task analysis that's required by firefighters on the fire ground. And that would give context to, to community and firefighting operations. Um, uh, you talked about, I think, uh, Senator, you, pardon if I got you wrong, you talked about a ladder or something. There's a whole range of tasks, but I can provide that information to you and that'll, that'll give you a definition of commence operations. Senator McMahon, um, we're going to have to wind it up. Yep, yeah, um, just one final clarification on that. Um, can, can they actually start fighting the fire before there's seven on the ground? Or do they there's, always have to wait? No, they don't wait. They simply don't wait. That's just, I don't know who proffered that, but that's just, yeah, firefighting so is time critical. You've got 7.7 minutes. It's safe to do so. You, you, you've got 7.7 .7 minutes. Be, um, that is the very small window to be able to effect a successful rescue. Anything after that, badly, um, the chances of survival in the house fire are greatly diminished. More dangerous for the firefighters and the property damage is extreme. So um, they don't sit around waiting for it. Okay. Thank you, Senator McMahon. Uh, thank you, uh, Mr. Marshall. I think, Senator Carr, you've finished with your questions. Uh, thank you very much. Wonderful. Well, that concludes today's proceedings. Sorry to keep you waiting today, yes. Mr. Marshall. We're... Oh. Thank, Can thank I just say, Chair, I, I really appreciate the opportunity. This is just so important to us. So we appreciate the opportunity to all senators. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Senator McMahon, thank you for joining us remotely today. It's been good to have your presence. Uh, to the Secretariat and Hansard staff, thank you very much. And to all the witnesses who have given evidence to the committee today, uh, thank you. We will conclude the hearing. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Chair, and thank you to the Secretariat.